I see a lot of interested uh, folks out here, and our panel is here. So I think we're going to go ahead and start. Um, just a little um, repeat, for those of you who were here yesterday, you already heard this, but I would like to just um, thank everybody for joining in our uh, project on having a roundup of recent, of, uh, recent research on Colombia directly re uh, related to the ongoing peace talks in Havana. And what um, inspired this conference was actually sort of an internal um, USIP project, which is to review uh, our Peace Scholar program. We give several different fellowships. The Peace Scholarships are our pre-doctoral awards for students who have to be in American US universities doctoral programs, although the students can come from anywhere in the world. And it supports them for a year of doctoral uh, research and writing. A program like our senior fellowship program, which is actually a residential program, these two programs go back to the very early days of the institute. They have been flagship programs, and like many institutes, uh, institutions now, we're trying to do more uh, measuring, measuring and monitoring and analysis of what effect our work is having in the field, although some of these things it's very difficult to get metrics for, like how much the work of our peace scholars have actually influenced peace building policy and practice on peace building around the world. But we are trying, and the results actually look very good. And one thing we knew is that we've had a lot of peace scholars over the years who have worked on Latin America, and actually a very large number of those have worked on Colombia or comparative studies, including Colombia, or issues directly relevant for uh, Colombia's situation today. So when we were charged by our then new executive vice president, Kristen Lord, with finding some activities that A, showcase the work our peace scholars have done, and B, actually find a better mechanism to bring them into um, USIP's network of peace builders, because in the past they're not in residence at the Institute, and in past years they only received sort of a check from us and didn't know us very well, nor did we know them very well. Um, I immediately turned to Ginny Bouvier, who all of you know as uh, the queen of Columbia studies and Latin American studies here at the Institute and one of the most important voices on Columbia in Washington, and uh, said, I think we can uh, have a collaboration here and raise the profile again of, of Latin America here of, of the work that's being done here at the Institute through showcasing our peace scholars. And then when we started to put together the different topics and relate them to the peace talks, we realize we also have a wealth of uh, expertise that could be relevant among our former senior fellows and our grantees. So um, this, this conference is uh, friends of, is part of the USIP family is being sh sh uh, showcased here, and also the sort of friends of the USIP family. So not quite everybody was a recipient of a fellowship or grant, but almost everybody um, over these two days. So I'm going to uh, turn to our panel, but I wanted to see, Ginny, did you want to just say a few words of welcome, too? <laughs> yeah. So um, this panel this morning that we're starting off with is addressing uh, one of the outstanding questions uh, at the peace talks, which is victims. What is uh, going to happen uh, with victims and the need for redress? And as one of the themes that came out strongly yesterday was the very real problem of balancing uh, peace and justice and uh, the heritage of uh, granting amnesties and the philosophy of drawing a, a clear line um, between the past and the present, which certainly had its problems, but on the other hand, there are major challenges for justice. So um, I'm going to introduce each speaker before they speak, and we're going to turn to our first speaker today, who's going to be looking at uh, violence against civilians. And the rest of the panel will also be looking at the role of memory and uh, displacement and the demands of, of, of human rights in the Colombian context. So I'd like to introduce Michael Weintraub, who was a peace scholar at the Institute last year. He's currently a pre-doctoral fellow at Yale University in the program on order, conflict, and violence. And he's aiming to finish his PhD 
in um, political science from Georgetown uh, within the coming year. His dissertation looks at the dynamics of multi-party civil wars and patterns of competition and cooperation among violent non-state actors, including insurgent groups and paramilitaries, and what accounts for different repertoires of violence against civilians. So, thank you, Great. Michael. Well, first let me <clears throat> just thank Lily and Ginny. Uh, when I was doing field work in Bogota uh, about a year and a half ago, I spoke with Ginny on the phone. She strongly encouraged me to pursue the project that I am now finishing, so thank you to Ginny. Um, and USIP um, and the Peace Scholars Program helped me do my field work, and they helped me get to where I am, so thanks to everyone in this building for that. Um, I'm going to provide sort of a 30,000 foot view. Uh, we have lots of anthropologists in the room who do far better ethnographic research than I. Um, I'm going to present um, a 30,000 foot view um, and really see this as an opportunity to think through the peace building implications of some of my research that frankly oftentimes academics or at least in political science are discouraged from doing. Um, that's my way of making my apology for not having thought through all these things so much in advance, um, but this really is an, uh, a wonderful opportunity for me to, to meditate on the policy implications of my research. Um, we were told eight minutes. I'm really gonna do my best. Academics are not famous for being pithy. Um, so, right, away we go. Um, wartime strategies of violence against civilians and implications for peace building. So here's, here's where we're going today. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the academic literature says about the purpose of violence in civil war. Why is it that armed groups um, engage in violence? What is it that they typically want? Um, I'm then going to talk about the specific patterns of violence that we observe in Colombia uh, using uh, one particular data set, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how that compares to other data sets that we have. Um, I'm going to then focus on relationships among VNSAs is my shorthand way of talking about violent non-state actors. These are armed groups uh, in Colombia. Um, and how relationships among groups, that is between insurgent groups, between guerrilleros, between guerrillas, um, and then between insurgent groups and paramilitaries, how those relationships shape violence, uh, the kinds of violence that we see against civilians in particular. And then finally, I'm going to talk about these sort of preliminary or, or tentative conclusions uh, about this research for, for peace building. So away we go. Uh, so what, why is it that armed groups typically uh, use violence in civil war? Well, the literature has established that armed groups wish to control territory, and anybody who, who studies Colombia knows this, um, right, that armed groups are, are typically interested in controlling territory because it, it allows them to extract resources from the civilian population and get things that they want, whether that's negotiating uh, power vis-a-vis -vis the government or just simply goods. Um, violence is useful for a number of reasons. Um, it helps to eliminate supporters of rival groups, right? Um, it allows armed groups to appropriate goods, as I mentioned, um, to, provide, to provide spoils to, com to combatants who otherwise wouldn't be loyal to commanders. Basically, they can trade violence and the goods that are appropriated through violence for loyalty. And finally, this is something that I focus on in my work. Um, violence can be useful to signal to other communities nearby the danger of supporting rival groups. So basically, violence can be used against a particular community to signal to other communities uh, various things that they should or shouldn't do. Um, and finally, targeting uh, can be carried out on a number of different levels. So first, for individual behavior, that's actual or perceived collaboration with a rival uh, political actor based on group membership uh, or shared characteristics. And typically, um, targeting based on individual behavior is really difficult um, because it's hard to know who is actually collaborating with the enemy. Um, and oftentimes, uh, armed groups resort to this collective punishment against communities because they don't have the best kind of information about who is actually collaborating with the enemy. So that's sort of like the, the academic uh, scholarly framework within which I'm working. Um, and so let's, let's talk about what kinds of violence we see in Colombia, okay? First, I want to talk about statistics on the types of victimization that we see in Colombia. Um, then who the presumed actors are that are responsible for these kinds of victimizations. And then uh, th all of these data come from La Unidad de Victimas, and they're, uh, these are data through April of 2013. And I'm going to talk about how this data set differs from other data sets that are out there. Th the one wonderful thing about Colombia is the richness of data. Uh, for, a, for a data geek like I am, uh, and somebody who's interested in patterns of violence, uh, Colombia is a, is a wonderful place to work. Um, for those who don't, who work in other parts of the world, they're envious of, uh, of the quality of the data that we have. So we can at least celebrate that. Um, okay, so 
this is just a, a simple uh, frequency plot, a histogram, as we say, of the different kinds of violence that are present in, in Colombia from the Unidad de Víctimas data set. Now, the Unidad de Víctimas, uh, this data set is a, a registro único de víctimas, and these are basically claims that are made by victims or victims' families um, to receive benefits from the state, to receive reparations. Uh, those reparations can either be symbolic, they can be material, um, but it's obvious, and we know this, anybody who studies violence in Colombia, that displacement, IDPs, uh, are the core uh, constituency that are applying for reparations in Colombia, over five million uh, instances, and homicides is a distant second. Now, we can barely see any variation down here. I'm going to now get rid of the IDPs so we can look at the, um, so we can look at the variation here. So, beyond displacement, we see that homicides are the next largest category. This is a little bit misleading because um, multiple beneficiaries, uh, multiple family members, for instance, can claim um, for a single homicide. So this is actually inflated, um, and that isn't the case for, for some of the other kinds of victimization. But basically, this, this just suffices to show that homicides is the second largest uh, type of victimization, at least for which victims are seeking reparations. And um, their, you know, kidnapping is actually surprisingly low for those who, for those who think that kidnapping is a, is a major source of violence in Colombia, at least for those who seek reparations, um, kidnapping is not particularly high. So who, who is doing these things, right? Who is, who, who is responsible um, for, for initiating these violent acts against civilians? Uh, here we see that the Grupos Guerrilleros are by far uh, the most responsible for uh, displacement when compared to the paramilitaries, almost twice as often. Um, this category is an interesting one. <laughs> this is unidentified. Um, so basically when victims seek reparations from the state, they are asked to identify the, the parties that they think were responsible for the victimization. And so this unidentified category is really heterogeneous. It could mean that the victims actually don't know who was responsible for the victimization, or they could be too afraid to provide information about the armed actor that was responsible for their victimization. So we want to treat this, this presumed author um, data very, very carefully and think through, are there systematic reasons why individuals might be systematically underreporting who the author was or the kind of victimization that they encountered? So um, again, this is the homicides breakdown. The same pattern persists. Guerilla, uh, La guerrilla is, is responsible for far more than the paramilitaries. And again, we have a big sort of residual category of the unidentified victims, or the unidentified uh, authors, excuse me. So. We need reliable data. Why do we need reliable data? Well, peace building um, requires access to truth for victims, right? Um, and public policy typically needs to be uh, informed by evidence about the who, what, where, and when of, of conflict. And if we don't have reliable data, we'll have trouble implementing policies that are appropriate uh, given the circumstances. So when you compare the victim's data um, with two other data sets, the CERAC data, um, the CERAC is an NGO based in Bogota, and the vice presidency data from the Observatorio de Derechos Humanos um, de la Presidencia, they show remarkably different patterns of victimization. In particular, um, the CERAC data shows much, much higher levels of paramilitary homicides, particularly commit, uh, the commission of massacres, than uh, the victim's data. So what does this tell us? This tells us that when individuals are going to the state, they're still concerned about ongoing violence against them from paramilitary groups. They're afraid to, uh, to accuse groups that are still controlling territory close to them <laughs> of having been responsible for their victimization. So it's something we definitely want to keep in mind when we, when we compare data. Um, and again, the systematic underreporting and overreporting of, of, of particular kinds of crimes should give us pause about you know, what is, the, what is the real incidence of particular kinds of victimization? It's really hard to know in conflict. Um, so again, we do, you know, we want an official version. We want a true version um, of accounting of victimization, but it's really hard. Um, we know that, like I said, sustainable peace probably requires truth, but it's also a truth that needs to be accepted by belligerents. And if not, we talked a lot yesterday about spoilers. Uh, if, it, if there's a truth that, that is settled upon by uh, major actors in the conflict based on data or perceptions, uh, what happens if that version of truth is not the version that, that spoilers would accept? Um, this, is a, this is a key challenge for peace building um, in Colombia and everywhere, really. Um, the open question is whether we should tailor peace-building efforts subnationally. Uh, I think some of the, 
some of the speakers yesterday talked about sort of local level dynamics as being important for, for DDR. Um, and the argument that I sort of am, am, am going to make in a second here is that subnational patterns of violence differ uh, tremendously. Uh, and the patterns of, co of competition between armed groups um, should determine the, the kinds of, yikes, <laughs> the, the, kinds of, um, the kinds of peace building efforts that we should uh, see locally. So relationships among armed groups. Um, basically, the literature on victimization, at least in the political science literature, typically focuses on insurgents and governments. And as everyone in Colombia knows, those are two important belligerents, but they're not the only ones. Uh, and so in my dissertation, I look at these, this, this broader set of multi-party civil wars where there are lots of insurgent groups and paramilitaries um, and look at the relationships among them. And the three that I look at are patterns of competition for territorial control, cooperation among insurgent groups um, and among insur insurgent groups with paramilitaries, and then the poaching of combatants. When do paramilitaries attempt to lure um, uh, guerrilleros away from the guerrilla uh, to fight with them and to provide information on, on guerrilla tactics? So, geez, I don't have a ton of time, clearly. Um, so competition, I'm not going to totally go into this argument, but basically what I find using statistical evidence from Colombia from 1988 to 2005, where the FARC and the ELN compete, we actually see pretty low levels of violence. Um, and that's not due to cooperation among them. Even though there was an alliance in the 1980s, we know that the FARC and the ELN engage in clashes all the time. They fight one another. Uh, hundreds of Gidija have been killed in these clashes, so it's not like they're, they're best buddies. Um, but the logic of violence when these two uh, groups compete for territory is quite different from where the FARC and, or the ELN compete with paramilitaries, where we see very, very high levels of violence against civilians. Typically, paramilitaries use indiscriminate violence. They target whole communities. And then insurgents respond in kind and target those same communities because they're looking to signal to others in the region that they shouldn't engage in similar anti-rebel uh, mobilization. So, that's a ridiculously short summary of my argument uh, and part of the dissertation. I just want to show you a couple of maps, I think, is sort of um, just, just to give you a sense of where this intense paramilitary guerrilla competition is happening. Ooh, resolution, not so great. Um, so these are number of years in which the FARC and the, and the paramilitaries competed for territorial control in a given municipality. And so um, the, the dark, dark red are the most years from 1988 to 2005. And so we see heavy concentration of competition in La Guajira, um, in Santander, we see here in, in Valle, um, sort of Magdalena Cesar, um, and the similar patterns, but slightly different, occur when you look at the FARC and the, uh, excuse me, when you look at the ELN and paramilitaries. And not surprisingly, right, <laughs> in Santander, there's tremendous competition. We have a bunch in, in Amazonas. Um, so basically the question is, should peace building efforts in these areas where you see high levels of indiscriminate violence that suggest a different kind of political uh, competition, different kinds of dynamics of conflict, should we have different peace building activities in these areas? And the argument that I would make is yes, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Mm -hmm. um, and we really need to think through um, you know, the, the value of nationally, level, nationally led peace building activities when the patterns of, of, of violence against civilians differ so dramatically subnationally. Um, I think Lily's gonna cut me off in a second. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just want to raise a couple of questions that I don't have the answer to. Um, maybe some of you all do. I hope that you do. Um, so what happens if FARC demobilizes? Um, the consequences for civilian targeting by the ELN uh, are of concern to me, um, particularly because I, I've wit witnessed this dynamic where the ELN and the FARC, where they compete, we actually see lower levels of violence. So where FARC, if FARC disappears off the scene, um, what's going to happen to this beneficial effective competition? Um, it may be that the ELN actually engages in higher levels of violence against civilians. So that's really, really worrying. Um, are we going to see continued civilian targeting by neo-paramilitaries? I don't love the term Bakrim. Um, I think they're neo-paramilitaries. Um, are we likely to see reduced levels of violence against civilian by the FARC if, if these paramilitary groups are no longer active? Um, based on my research, it says the answer is yes. Um, we're, we may see uh, lower levels of paramilitary targeting. Um, and then there's this huge issue of fragmentation. Uh, Jeremy McDermott at Insight Crime has this awesome piece on fragmentation of the FARC after, after a potential peace agreement. I highly recommend it. But um, basically, it's logical that the more radical elements 
wouldn't agree to the to whatever peace is negotiated and would stay uh, in the field, and that's particularly worrying for civilian targeting. Uh, we know from the literature that splintering uh, in general of armed groups increases violence against civilians. That's another worrying thing, and, and we need to think about different protection strategies. So after all that doom and gloom, I actually think that there is some good news here because the literature on uh, the political effects of victimization actually suggests that there are some positive benefits of victimization. It's like worrying me to say things like that um, because people's livelihoods and lives have been lost and those are tragic things. Um, but I do want to point to a couple of potentially positive things. So forced recruitment um, of child soldiers um, has increased their, their voting and their participation uh, in communities, in their own communities. That, this is a good thing, right? If we think that political participation in the post-conflict space by victims is a good thing, um, and I do. <laughs> um, we know that victimization in crime um, increases political participation. Again, if we think that that's a good thing, then we should be somewhat optimistic about a post-conflict Colombia. Um, and we know that individuals whose households, uh, in, in Sierra Leone anyway, individuals whose households directly experienced more intense war violence were more likely to attend community meetings, to join local political and community groups, and to vote. Uh, and these are all actually pretty good things um, if victims, um, if we want victims to participate in the political process. Of course, the concern is if the post-conflict in Colombia still includes neo-paramilitary groups that are going to be targeting those who are politically active, <laughs> who are... Um, who are not so keen uh, on the on the paramilitary agenda, you know, it's it's possible that these benefits that are witnessed in other in other conflict zones won't actually extend to the Colombia case. So we have a sort of a mixed bag of good stuff and bad stuff. Um, I I probably have to stop there. Um, thanks so much. I look forward to Q and A. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Sure. Uh, I think um, the uh, data is uh, very important and often very underlooked to really understand and to uh, increase our um, particularly ability to prevent further violence, as well as to tailor methods of justice. So I'm going to turn to Diana Marcela Gomez Correal, who is a graduate student in anthropology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and already has a, um, a rich um, professional experience in working in gender and human rights and the peace movement um, inside Colombia. Um, she's actually writing her thesis on uh, looking at emotions in collective action and the role of caring um, within uh, the, the situation of, um, in, in the context of violence, caring and c conceptions of belonging. Um, she's also a member of the Sons and Daughters for Memory and Against Impunity, and for her work with that, she's, um, she's had a, held a, a USIP um, grant, and she's going to speak today on um, Beyond the Category of Victims, Challenges of the Current Peace Negotiations. Good morning. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Ginny, for the invitation and to the Institute of Peace. I'm going to read my presentation. From our perspective, as sons and daughters for memory and against impunity, a peace negotiation process such as the one taking place in Havana is one of the first steps for peace building. It is also an attempt to achieve an ethical path based on real respect for life, freedom, dignity, and solidarity as minimum pillars of social life. Not dupe, a peace process also provides an opportunity to dream of and design another society. This paper discusses the challenges facing the current peace process and exam examines the category of victims. Challenges of peace building are defined in the short, medium, and long term. Peace here is understood as a result of a process in which conflicts are addressed without the use of violence and in which people can live with dign dignity. Thus, the main goal of any peace process in Colombia should be to contribute to peace building and to a stable and lasting peace. What kind of victims are we and what purpose do we serve? Categories that are efforts to understand and give meaning to reality. They not only imply differentiation, but also generalize, resulting in a less nuanced appreciation of complex realities. Categories are also a contentious space. They have an enormous power of enunciation. They create, transform, and deny realities. 
how they arise and how they are used result from a specific interest, making it necessary to permanently review them, especially when they impact identity and subjectivity. As a category, the notion of victims is not static. During Uribe's term, although the internal armed conflict wasn't recognized, the justice and peace law gave legal existence to the victims of paramilitary groups. At the same time, the government continued the state's policy of the denial of some victimized subjects, those the state produces, articulating an asymmetrical treatment of victims where the guerrillas movement victims have greater visibility. During the current peace process, this policy of denial continues under a W logic an asymmetrical treatment of victims that includes asymmetrical conception of the nature of the armed actors and a politically correct visibility of victims. Hence, the hegemonic notion of victims doesn't recognize the existence of the victims of a state crime, the state as an actor in the conflict that produced victims, or the logic and politics of the current war in which the state itself is a key actor. At the same time, this category strips victims of their political nature. In other words, the state is neutralizing the political capacity of victims. The Victims and Lands Restitution Law, law is part of that effort through its disempowering welfare type policy, as well as the uses of the category of victims. The current government, recognizing the very definition of victim as a point of contention, is making an effort to universalize all victims, undermining their particularities, maintaining the invisibility of some, overlapping their specificities, and constructing the idea of post-conflict. On April 9, 2013, President Santos asserted that the members of the military forces are victims of the internal conflict. This statement suggests a crucial question. To what extent it is possible to erase the division between combatants and civilians in the Colombian case? What does it mean to be a victim? These are not only ontological questions, but also pose an inquiry with serious consequences. More significant than using a hegemonic category of victims, we consider it more accurate to talk about victim, victimized subjects. This alternative notion recognizes the existence of a state of violence that includes grave abuses of human dignity. It also highlights the agency of those who have been conceptualized as victims, looking into their condition as subjects, their rights and their actions, all of which are politically invested. As a space for political confrontation and ethical enunciation, the category of victimized subjects continue to be necessary only if this recognition and self-recognition becomes a driving force in the struggles against impunity and for truth and justice. These struggles must also articulate with the demands of other social movements with the intention of building a fair country where dignity can have a place. Although the six items of the negotiation agenda are all complex and important, the item addressing victims is of particular importance. Colombia has experienced a prolonged and degraded sociopolitical violence in which the state has been one of the main actors violating human dignity. Hence, we must pose and rework not only economic and political arrangements, but also to adopt ethical agreements that are a foundation for social life. These ethical agreements should be based on an understanding that victims' rights to true justice and reparation are not an obstacle to peace. Rather, they contribute, they contribute to democracy and to a better transition towards a real peace. Thus, we have to de-victimize the rights to true and justice because they are also the rights of the entire society. Challenges to the peace process always depend on what kind of society we want to have. The peace process faces complex challenges as in the past, such, a, such as fears maintaining the negotiation with a coherent agenda in spite of several opponents. Second, reaching agreements toward a lasting peace, dignity and respect of rights, and third, ratifying the peace accords with Colombian society. These challenges are situated in a specific context that has to be addressed. 
presidential and congressional elections that will take place in the first months of 2014. In addition, the process has to overcome the constant, constant attacks by the ultra-right on the very idea of a political solution to the internal armed conflict. Moreover, the peace process also has to consider the interests of the armed forces, political sectors linked with paramilitarism, paramilitarism itself, and business persons who may be hurt by the peace accords. Among other short-term challenges is the participation with the capacity to have an impact of Colombian society, especially those who have been victimized, in addition to the many groups who have been hit by systematic violence, such a, such such as women, indigenous people, Afro-descending communities, and peasants. Despite the important contribution of women to peace building in Colombia, there is no one representing the interests of them in the negotiation. Addressing these short-term challenges and proceeding with peace building requires tackling the following Vaseline issues. First, the right to justice for victims, which is not included in the talks. Second, the right to truth for victims and for all Colombians. Third, guarantees for political participation, not only for guerrillas, but also for those collective subjects who have been subjected to violent annihilation and other strategies of exclusion. Four, genuine restitution of land and respect for the territory. Fifth, reviewing the current economical model, especially the free trade agreements and extractive industries. As has been shown with the recent agrarian strike, changes in the current economic policy are necessary if we want to address the conception of peace embraced by significant sectors of Colombian society. The medium term challenges have to do mainly with making a reality of victims' rights and of Colombian rights to truth and justice. In order to build a different society, Colombians have to know to the full truth of what has happened. Truth, memory, and history should contribute to better understand what has occurred in Colombia, the reasons, the key actors, as well as their responsibilities. Narratives of Colombian past and present need to be appropriated in a critical way by Colombians to better understand our society and how to change it. Therefore, the truth should help transform Colombia's chronic social and political problems, beginning with inequality and impunity. Finding out the truth is part of the negotiation agenda. However, there is a dispute related to the type of truth, the reason we have for knowing what happened, and the ways of constructing accounts of the past. As historians argue, true memory and history constitute a battlefield. At this point, more than partial accounts or assumption of different versions, we need a complex narrative that explains the deep roots of the conflict, identifies the structural conditions linked to its onset, and decodes the generalized use of violence as a way to deal with difference and inequalities. We need, as Nietzsche says, history for life, a history that impacts the arrangements of the present and allows us to imagine another type of society. Presently, memory is in vogue in Colombia, yet it is losing its potential. Sons and others conceive of memory as a political bear, a vehicle for social transformation. This conception of memory includes long-term memory situating our reality in the profound historical antecedents that have led up to the present moment, a memory of struggles of all those who have imagined another Colombia, and a critical memory that questions its own roots, discourses, and practices. As regards justice, the country is a major crossroads. Under international law, crimes against humanity as well as war crimes are not just subject to amnesty. The Constitutional Court recently voiced the need to respect victims' right to justice. Independent of legal consideration, there is a pressing need for justice in the face of the serious crimes committed in the past and present in Colombia. Yet, the peace process is based on transitional justice mechanism insufficient to guarantee justice. The status known as the Legal Framework for Peace, Marco Jurídico para la Paz, and the Law on the Military Criminal Jurisdiction, Fuero Penal Militar, maintain impunity for state crimes. Trying to give privilege to and protect members of the military from justice doesn't contribute to peace. Military forces are part of the state, an institution responsible for protecting and taking care of the citizens. The legitimacy of the state derives precisely from this premise 
Without dupes, the state has to recognize state criminality, not only through its discourse, but also in practice. As a society, we have to explore how justice can be achieved. For instance, some victims don't equate justice with incarceration. For others, addressing state criminality requires applying exemplary penalties in line with the obligation military or social rank of victimizers. Access to justice implies dismantling impunity and the unequal access that victims, depending on the victimizers, receive. How can any society move toward peace and more equitable social arrangements if there is not a moral and ethical condemnation of the atrocities that have been committed? Justice is precisely the mechanism for moral and ethical censure. It is mandatory that justice be meted out to the different actors that have caused so much suffering in Colombia. Following Nietzsche's reflection on history, it becomes imperative to talk about justice for life. There are other medium-term challenges I will not be able to discuss in depth that have to do with reparation and the process of disarmament, the mobilization and reinsertion. Uh, reparation will contribute to peace to the extent that it addresses the structural conditions that have generated the conflict. In other words, land has to be returned under conditions that make possible its enjoyment and with assurance that it will be fairly distributed. Therefore, reparation cannot be used to implement the new phase of capitalism neo-extractivism as is currently happening. It is essential that not only guerrillas, but also paramilitaries and the state demobilize. A state criminality has to be eliminated. If not, we will have a fictional peace in which the war comes to an end officially by law, but not in daily life. A peace process of this type will allow the use of transitional justice as a mechanism to legitimate a state that is illegitimate and that affirms and encourages its patriarchal character. The illegal armies in the countryside, towns and cities should be dismantled, as well as the logic that has gained ground in Colombia according to which conflicts are resolved through the illegitimate use of violence. For that reason, a long-term challenge is constructing a culture of peace capable of respecting difference and knowledge acknowledging conflict as part of society and according priority to dialogue. Changes in subjectivities and identities are essential. Peace, as, underst as understood in this paper, will presuppose that all political options have the same opportunities. With such plurality, the vast majority of Colombians will gain an opportunity to strengthen democracy and to rethink what kind of society we want to live in. In other contexts, transitional justice has been a way to make the transition to a similar state of, of affairs, yet with another name post-conflict and reconciliation. In those cases, the structural causes of the conflict weren't addressed. Why should we legitimize the model on Western modern society in Colombia when that model is clearly in crisis? In Colombia, a significant portion of the population is recognizing or, and or thinking about the current negotiation process as a turning point. As Foucault argues, what is the driving force behind institutions and order? Peace is itself a war code. From my point of view, only a peace that allows building another type of society is capable of overcoming the world code. Nevertheless, to do it is <coughs> essential to recognize how war works, who the main actors are, what, what acts they have been responsible for, and the deeply rooted conflicts that have given birth to the Colombian of the present. Okay, thank you, Diana. Uh, so our third speaker is Carlos Quesada. Um, he is currently the um, Program Director for Racial and Ethnic Equality at Global Rights, and he's both a journalist and lawyer. And his focus is um, combating racial discrimination against Latinos of African descent in Latin America and working to increase their participation in both national and international institutions. So he's um, based in Costa Rica at the moment? Here. Uh, here. Oh, based here, right. OK. But has worked um, across Central America as well as Colombia, went to, um, did his studies in Costa Rica, and has worked on Guatemala, and I understand is also working um, on issues as well in Honduras. So Carlos is going to speak today on the Afro-Colombian movement, human rights, and the peace process. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, I, have, I would like to apologize because I'm not an academic. So 
I think my, my presentation will be basically on, you know, from a lawyer's perspective, exclusively on human rights and as an activist um, too. Anyways, we wanted to um, kind of prove in the year 2003 uh, that there was a racial discrimination component in, in, in Colombia, um, especially, you know, how the war or this, uh, the internal conflict was affecting the, the Afro-descendant communities. So we started to work with some organizations there, and I would like just to share with you our example with the National Association of Internally Displaced Afro-Colombians, AFRODES. We started to work with AFRODES in the year 2003, and um, basically because we started to see kind of a disproportionate impact of the internal conflict within the, within the, the Afro-Colombian communities, especially um, those who, who were being affected by the internal displacement. And we wanted to see the link between racial discrimination, poverty, and internal displacement. And uh, you know, in 2003, not even the, the Afro-Colombian groups were talking about racial discrimination and the link between racial discrimination and the armed conflict. Um, and obviously not the government at that time. So we wanted to prove that there was a racial discrimination component, but at the same time, we wanted the Afro-Colombians, in this case afro to be the subjects and not objects of their investigations and reports. So our first um, approach was, we want Afro-Colombians, and in this case afro to write their own reports on the situation of human rights. So we didn't want, with all due respect, um, traditional human rights or mainstream human rights groups to write about Afro-Colombians. We, want, we wanted Afro-Colombians to write about their own reality. And so we provided capacity building. Um, so they hired a consultant, an Afro-Colombian consultant, to write the, the report. And I think the first report, and, and USIP played a key role at, at that time, because we actually had a, a grant from USIP in 2004, was to produce this report on the situation of, of human rights of the Afro-Colombian communities in to, back in 2005. This was the first report produced by Afrodes. And why it was important for us to produce these kind of reports. One, we wanted, to, uh, we wanted them to systematize the human rights situation. Two, we wanted them to um, develop or come out with some recommendations. We wanted the report to be also, we wanted the report to be advocacy tools so they can use the reports to change policies at the national, regional, and inter at the international level. But to us, the most important thing was to feel like um, they were, like they were, they, they owned the report, like it w they produced the report. Um, so that's how we started, and, um, and I think it, it, has, it has paid off, and I'm gonna take, uh, talk about it a little bit later, but what we did basically, these reports started to be um, kind of uh, um, statements or, or advocacy tools so they, can be, so they started to negotiate with the government, but also at the international level. And what we did also was in the year 2005 to um, start requesting thematic hearings before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on the situation of Afro-descendants. And also before the, um, uh, we started to send reports, this report in particular, to the uh, UN treaty bodies, including the, the UN committee that oversees the International Convention on the Elimination of All, all Forms of Racial Discrimination. Sorry, sir, uh, third. Um, because, you know, it was not the same, and, and this is kind of a strategy that we used, it was not the same, uh, you know, if global rights or Afrolis could say something about the situation in Colombia than having uh, an international um, treaty body saying the same thing. So we, we, we sent the reports and we, you know, we provided technical assistance, so they actually went to Geneva and they came here to Washington, D.C. to uh, ask for, for thematic hearings. I'm not saying that before the year 2005, some of the Afro-Colombian leaders were not being granted, let's say, precautionary measures. But what I'm saying is that there wasn't an, an, a racial discrimination component at that time uh, in the way they were requesting either the thematic hearings or uh, doing the reports and sending the reports out. The other interesting thing that we, that we did is like, uh, well, even though I'm, I'm talking about Afrodes, but also we were working with other Afro-Colombian groups like the Proceso de Comunidades Negras and the Conferencia Nacional Afro-Colombiana and Cimarron, who was like, at that time Cimarron was the only one trying to, to work on racial discrimination, but from a, from a different perspective, not, from the, not taking into account the, the, the uh, consequences of the armed conflict. What they were able to prove, one, 
that there was a disproportionate impact within the Afro-Colombian com with, with, Afro communities uh, by the armed conflict. Two, that uh, there was like a historical neglect by the government you know, in terms of providing basic services to Afro-Colombian communities. Not only the Pacific Basin, though, even though Afro is, is been working in the, you know, in the Pacific Basin, but, but also, you know, in other places. And three, that there was a structural discrimination in the country. And I'm not saying that it was like, it was on purpose, like it was X government or, or Z government, but there was a structural discrimination and the state institutions were like following that path, you know. So we wanted the government to recognize the existence of racial discrimination. And, uh, and for us, because this problem is not only, we, we don't f only face this problem in Colombia, we face it every, every, you know, everywhere I work in Latin America, is this the historical denial of the existence of racial discrimination. Why? Because if you accept that, you, that, that, that there is racial discrimination, you have to do something. And you know, either you know, um, uh, introduce affirmative action policies or, or do something. And so it's very easy, with all due respect for governments, and not only in Colombia, again, in, in other places in Latin America, to deny the existence of racial discrimination. The good thing, though, is like um, with Afrodes and other groups, uh, we started to work and try to change policy in places like the United States. And uh, um, so we started to work with our organizations like WOLA, like what the Washington office in Latin America and other organizations, try to engage and improve and, um, change policies, like to say, okay, this is what the situation of Afro-Colombian communities, you, the United States, need to do something. Because as we know, uh, Colombia is, right now, is I think the, the, the most important ally of the United States in the Western Hemisphere, uh, in Latin America, basically. <laughs> so we started to, to try to do advocacy also at the, at the international level. And the government started to recognize that they needed to do something uh, about this. And there were some some compass, you know, about the situation of Afro Colombians, etc. Uh, the problem, though, was that even though there were a lot of recommendations, most of those recommendations were not being implemented. Uh, I think a, a, a key point for Afrolis and other and other uh, Afro Colombian groups was uh, the Auto 005 from the, in 2009, and from the Constitutional Court that basically. Um, it was like on, uh, based on this, you know, the on situation of Afro-Colombians affected by the, by the armed conflict and internal displacement, and and I'm just you know summarizing because of the time. But basically, you know, in you know the recommendations, is it requested or asked the government, you need to design public policies w with a differentiated approach. But not only that, but you have to take into account Afro-Colombian groups, and actually mention Afrodes, PCN, and other groups. When you implement and design public policies to address the, issue, the issues of Afro-Colombians, Afro you have to consult with, this community, with, this, uh, with these communities. I think that was very important, and, and during kind of the, you know, the, the, the same period, period I, I would say, we started to see that Afrodes and other organizations in Colombia started to be kind of a political players in Colombia. And I'm very happy to say that now Afro-Colombian groups, not only Afrodes, but other groups, are, are playing a key role in, in, in terms of trying to change policies at a national level in, in Colombia. And the government has recognized that. And the government has introduced some, some you know, there, there are some steps that the government is, is 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 doing, or you know, or some 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 things that the government um, of Colombia is doing in order to address the issues of Afro Colombians. But um, at the same time, so it's hard, and I'm not going to mention about about the peace process. It's like, even though Afro Colombians have become a, pol a key political player in the country, uh, it's hard not to see them as as subjects and as, as, key element, as key representatives within the peace process. I think they have to be, because they have been disproportionate, Im disproportionate impacted by the civil war, but also because of, you know, because of the current situation. We're talking about a peace process in which a lot of Afro-Colombian leaders are still being threatened, and um, I have two minutes, uh, uh, being threatened by, by Either paramilitary groups, guerrillas, and and the and the and I know and other groups, 
uh, Afro-Colombian leaders in a selective way. They're being um, they're being um, either killed or 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 yeah or or or, or threatened. I would just like to, because I wanna, uh, I just wanted to finish with two ideas before I, 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 I close here. One is that is there is the need to, um, you know, the peace will not be possible without the participation of the Afro-Colombian movement, and I think the government needs to understand that. And I think it's it's still, um, I think it's still like in negotiation, so to speak, you know, like the role of the Afro-Colombian community within the, the peace process. And the other thing is uh, that I would like to, to close uh, with uh, is that um, there are other victims, and, and I would just like to mention about the aggravated forms of discrimination that are, that are not even mentioned within the peace process. And that is the whole issue of uh, how the LGBT movement and the Afro-descendant LGBT movement has been affected by, by the armed conflict. Uh, you know, like um, some Afro-Colombian Afro transgender women have been killed. Some of them have been asking for protection because they have been threatened by the, by the paramilitaries or the guerrillas. And then, um, then we find out that they were killed. Like there was a recent case uh, from a woman, in, in, in a transgender woman who was killed. She went and asked for protection in, in Sucre and um, and, and then um, she was killed. And this is something like nobody's writing about. So it's like, it's like this, like this, this the, there is this hole, you know, in, in the armed conflict. A lot of, um, they would call a lot of peluqueros are being killed in, in Buenaventura by the back rings. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of stigma around, around, around them, um, her dressers. And, and yeah, this is kind of a, the things that actually we're starting to work right now with groups like Caribe Afirmativa, Santa Maria Fundacion in, in, in the Caribbean part of Colombia and in the Pacific, and the Pacific Basin too. I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I think this is a fascinating progression from starting with looking at um, the basic numbers of perpetrators and victims to um, the sort of um, conceptions of victimhood and then on to actually the experience of specific groups and their history of claiming their rights. And uh, it was very interesting to hear about this sort of widening circle, not of victims per se, but of um, groups recognized as victims as, as right holders, which gives us some hope that the conception of, of citizenship and of being part of the Colombian community will broaden as part of the peace talks. But I believe specifically to give us a stronger sense of um, the role of um, this minority group in the peace talks, we're going to move on to Diego Grueso, who is a legal scholar, a lawyer in international human rights law from Externado University in, um, in Bogota. Um, he is uh, currently a visiting fellow here in Washington with WOLA and, um, and with AFRADES. And he has also worked on the rights of victims and minority groups, and particularly displaced Afro-Colombian communities. And um, he's going to speak to us about Afro-Colombian perspectives on the peace process and equality and its importance um, in the path to peace. OK, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank Jeannie and the United States Institute of Peace for the invitation. I think these kind of talks are very important to um, encourage and uh, promote the process of peace in Colombia or the building of peace in Colombia. And first of all, I don't, I'm not a, a scholar. Uh, I'm not identify myself as an, as an activist. I came to work with Afro-Colombian issues uh, and as a lawyer. I get my degree as a lawyer and I didn't want to work in the legal field, but I uh, felt compelled to do that because of the situation of my people. So that is the place when, uh, where I'm gonna talk about. So I'm gonna talk from the perspective of my people and I, which I would represent um, them 
uh, in this brief um, comment on the peace process and the peace talks in Havana. Jeannie uh, pointed out um, yesterday about the lack of women in this table. And I have to say that we got better in the, after, in, in the <laughs> afternoon and we got better today too. And not only because of the composition, but the quality of the presentation. I think my colleagues and the audience uh, will agree with me that the, better, the best presentations uh, so far have been uh, from women. But <laughs> I have to point out the <laughs> I, I'm not going to be the exception, I swear. <laughs> but I have to point out that the lack of participation of black people and indigenous people in this table, not in this table, I'm not, I, I don't going to blame nobody for discrimination. You can't do that anymore. It seems like it's so hard. It's, be, it's becoming harder and harder to blame someone for discrimination here in U.S. or where, where, uh, wherever. Uh, but the lack of black participation in the peace talks. So I'm going to characterize in a very simplistic way what is going on in Havana. So you're going to, um, uh, I'm going to, so I'm going to apologize in advance for this simplistic way, but it's pretty much a bunch of white or otherwise mestizo, all men uh, from elites talking about the future of Colombia and thinking that they represent Colombia better than the other. Mm, that is the simplistic way I want to portray that. And there is no, uh, there is not only a lack of participation of black people and indigenous people in the talks, but uh, there is a lack of uh, interest and commitment in the uh, situation of black peoples and indigenous peoples in those talks. And yeah, because you don't have to be black to talk about what is the situation of black communities. You, know, you don't have to be women to talk about the, the gender-based discrimination but one of the signs that are really a uh, uh, wor uh, worrying side, side that uh, there is not interest in our pro problematic is the first set of agreements that were about um, agriculture and development and um, uh, the distribution, uh, otherwise the, 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 um, the reform agraria they are thinking uh, 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 about for the future of Colombia. So one of the best or, or one of the uh, most important interests of black people and indigenous people is the control of their own land. And f the false from FARC and the government uh, have had a lot of problems, have been struggling with that uh, recognition of authority during all the time, during all the time of the war. So they know very well that there, there is an issue with the authority of black communities and indigenous communities in their own land. And there is not even a word of that in the first set of agreements. That is a very bad signal that what is going on with, with us and indigenous people in the, in the talks. And we have also a previous experience and some statements made in, 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 in peace dialogues in, in the past. For instance, uh, during the peace dialogues with the M19, the M19 guerrilla movement, uh, which led us to the new constitution, when the black communities were uh, claiming for their rights or for their rights to uh, be in the, in the constitutional process or at least to be in the constitution uh, um, or that the constitution protect their, their, their rights. Some folks uh, and some that are portrayed as progressive people, they said, but black people haven't uh, been in the conflict, 
having two deaths <laughs> in the conflict, so they, uh, they don't have like, the right to be here, to be discussing about political participation. They are not an armed group, so they are not in this conflict. So what is, what is the, 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 what's up with them? So what, what they want to uh, take advantage of this opening uh, for, for, to move forward their agenda. And this is a problem, problem of invisibilization. Uh, uh, discrimination can be explained in two ways, or you can use uh, two concepts, two simple concepts to show or to prove discrimination, and it's vulner vulnerability and invisibilization. And invisibilization in the, um, in the context of the conflict in Colombia against black communities is huge. Um, and not only by the, as a victims, but as an actors. If I tell you that make an image, a quick image of a guerrilla member or, or making your mind a quick image of, a, a, of um, a, any uh, um, uh, military, you don't gonna have a black folk with a uniform and a, and a gun, right? And what is worried me is that the participation of uh, black folks in the conflict has increased a lot. And that is one of the things that uh, is uh, very sad of this development of the conflict. Because in the past, and we don't have numbers, data is one of the biggest problems of uh, discrimination. And I was talking about invisibilization, the lack of uh, discriminated data by the race uh, uh, in Colombia is, is, um, is alarming. Uh, so in the past, for instance, as we don't have data about the participation of black people in the army or in the guerrillas, uh, I did a very quick exercise and I did the same with some of my friends, my, clo my closest friend, my black closest friend. For instance, I, I, I asked my father if um, his brothers or his siblings or his cousins are engaged in the military or otherwise guerrilla or paramilitaries. And uh, he went, no, no one of them uh, uh, are engaged in the, in, in, the in the military or in the war. And I asked to myself the same, uh, my brothers and me, we are uh, city cats, so that <laughs> we are not engaged in war, but my cousins down there in the Pacific Coast, my father is from Wapikauka, uh, one of the hottest spots of the, uh, spots of the conflict right now. All of my cousins, pretty much all of them, are engaged in the conflict. In the army, in the guerrillas, in the paramilitaries, in all the offers they have. So that is very, very alarming. And invisibilization against is, you, black people are not participating the same in, uh, in the conflict. So I want to characterize the conflict in, in another way. And again, please uh, forgive my simplistic way to characterize things. But the conflict in Colombia have been portrayed in many or characterized in many ways as a conflict of land, as a, a political conflict, as a social conflict, as a clash of classes or elite ver versus marginalized people, or someone, a, a former president whose name I don't want to recall, don't, uh, didn't even recognize the conflict. He just said uh, it's a um, general threat of uh, terrorism or something like that. But never have been characterized as a racial and ethnic conflict. And I'm gonna characterize the conflict in Colombia is a racial and ethnic conflict. When I say that, many people blow up. That's impossible. That you are kidding me. You have studied so much with those black guys in the United States. You are crazy about race. <laughs> I'm not crazy about race. I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> and there is 
some ways to prove discrimination. There is just two ways to prove discrimination, and it's intent or effect. <coughs> and you know, if, if you are a lawyer, that is a huge discussion, uh, how to prove discrimination. But I would like to say that I can prove the, that the Colombian conflict is a racial and ethnic conflict, a uh, true intent and true effect. The effects are easy to prove, uh, as uh, many have pointed out. Um, the conflict in Colombia overall during the last two decades uh, have been increased in the regions where most populated by black people and indigenous communities. And that is not uh, by, uh, by coincidence. There is a reason for that. And the reason is that, uh, and there is also a reason for them to live there and not in other regions. So region and race in Colombia, it's a perfect marriage. So pretty much nobody, not even in the university, not in the college, nobody uh, uh, talks about what, what is the, uh, the distribution, or why the distribution, the racial distribution of Colombia is like that. Uh, Colombia is deeply segregated, a, a deeply segregated society, and as we call the de facto apartheid was ruled Colombia or is ruling Colombia during the last 200 years. So that people live there, and the conflict to, is taking place there because now uh, uh, that region that was marginalized and was seen as um, Westland. Uh, uh, is seen now as um, as a uh, as a place of opportunities, full of resources, and the people who live there don't deserve those resources. So for that reason, the displacement is so huge and is massive in black communities. In 2012, just to 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 throw one example, if you compare the the data of massive displacement between 2011 and 2012, the massive displacement increased 100%. So we, are we, we went, uh, so the numbers in 2012 uh, of massive displacements, it's like, uh, 48,000 people were displaced through massive displacement in the Pacific Coast, just in the Pacific Coast. Uh, and in 2011, the number was 29,000 people. So right now, the conflict in, in those areas is increasing rapidly. The, um, uh, uh, the, the operation of FARC have increased also, and the operation of the Army has increased a lot. I have uh, I, I want to confirm that data, but somebody tell me that Buenaventura is perhaps the most, the, the place with more effectives in the, in, in the entire hemisphere. Buenaventura could, could be the, uh, the most uh, armed place in the, in, the, uh, in the West Hemisphere. And as you know, Buenaventura is not only a, a, a mostly black city, but it's the most important port in Colombia. So it is the place where uh, all this model of uh, exploitation or all this new model of free trade agreements is going to develop the most. Uh, so what is the recommendation? So I was thinking to be bold and throw a lot of recommendation and really sophisticated ones, but I just have one. And I think the work we, we could do with the Constitutional Court in the uh, 005 order, the Auto 005, was um, really great to uh, get to the point of what is uh, or, or how to solve the problem of displacement and victimization of the, pe of the, of the black people. But, uh, for the new law, pretty much for the for the new victims law, the the uh, the 
the decision of the Constitutional Court regarding displacement have been uh, left behind. And that, uh, the, um, the Order 005 is a key element to overcome the situation of victimization of that people. Because the Constitutional Court understood uh, that displacement is not just an effect of the war. It's a, a piece of the structural discrimination that is uh, ruling uh, our, our beloved country. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, this is a very interesting presentation of the problem that um, if you don't have a transformation of the way the conflict is seen by the time you get to peace talks, apparently you can have a reversion to a very sort of conservative and status quo um, presence in the, uh, of, of people in the talks and of topics. So it's a real challenge that if you wait to the post-conflict period to try to have a transformation of how the conflict is seen, it's already too late. It's a very moving um, presentation. But so last but not least, I'd like to turn to Jo Marie Burt, who is uh, nearby at George Mason University. Um, she's going to be giving us a comparative um, uh, viewpoint from the region. She's the co-director of the Center for Global Studies and the director of Latin American Studies. Um, and she's in the Department of Public and International Affairs at George Mason. And uh, she's very well known, I think, in Washington for her work um, observing trials, domestic trials of human rights violators in, uh, in Peru and more recently in um, the, the, the Rios Mont trial in Guatemala. And she's worked to draw together a network of observers of um, domestic trials in the Southern Cone in Latin America. So she is going to, I think, turn us towards um, more legal approaches for accountability and human rights and um, speak more broadly about the region. Thank you, Lily, and thank you, Ginny, for the invitation to be here um, at the United States Institute of Peace. I was one of those peace scholars back mm -hmm. in the 90s and the early generation, so it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, so yesterday and again, oh, sorry. Right, yesterday and again today, um, the issue of um, how justice fits into the search for peace, I think, is an enduring theme. Um, and the question was raised with, I think, particular poignance yesterday as to whether or not in Colombia um, there will need to be a trade off between peace and justice, or whether Colombia. Um, maybe we'll be able to, or maybe forced to, think of new ways to try to integrate the search for justice as it seeks to build peace. Um, I suspect the latter is going to be the case, though what that will end up looking like and whether it will satisfy um, stakeholders uh, uh, who obviously have different interests and perspectives, I think will remain to be seen. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, efforts to achieve justice in Latin America for grave violations of human rights. And then I may not have time to do it in my presentation, but certainly in the Q&A, maybe we can develop some more how this might relate to Colombia. Um, as we all know, um, after World War II, there was a, the creation of a series of very important human rights instruments, including the UN Declaration on Human Rights, the Geneva Conventions, et cetera, um, that established a series of um, norms about accountability in the case of crimes against humanity and gross violations of human rights. But after the trials at Nuremberg and Tokyo, in the post-Cold War era, sorry, in the Cold War era, the overriding principle has been, as we all know, national sovereignty. Human rights had been lar were largely considered an internal affair. 
This began to change, as we all know, in the 70s with the emergence of an international human rights movement and the work of key organizations such as Amnesty International, Article 19, the Human Rights Watch, et cetera, um, that developed different strategies to shine a light on human rights abuses occurring across the world. Um, that print, that the initial strategy, the name and shame strategy, sought basically to draw attention to human rights abuses when they occurred and shame governments into changing their practices. The end of the Cold War created new opportunities um, for rethinking these strategies, and as we all know, um, the post-Cold War terror in the former Yugoslavia and the genocide in Rwanda further galvanized the effort at the international community to seek new mechanisms of accountability for international crimes. So you had the creation of the International Tribunals for, the, for Yugoslavia and Rwanda, you had the signing of the Rome Treaty, the creation of the ICC, the affirmation of universal jurisdiction with the arrest of Pinochet in London in 1998, the strengthening of uh, regional systems of human rights protection, most notably the European Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American System of Human Rights Protection. All of this comes together, and there's a whole other set of mechanisms and treaties and, and so forth, obviously, but this all comes together um, for uh, establishing a fairly robust set of norms, conventions, and institutions that establish two key things. One is that states have a duty to investigate, prosecute, and punish crimes against humanity and gross violations of human rights. You can call that the justice cascade. You can call it the global justice system. You can call it whatever you want, but it exists. It's there. The second thing is these things establish is that victims have um, inalienable rights to truth, justice, reparation and of course, guarantees of non-repetition. Um, we know that there are a series of international tribunals and hybrid tribunals working um, to achieve these kinds of things in certain parts of the world. We also know that impunity is massive. Um, what I think has fallen through the cracks a little bit in our understanding of these things is the role, the unique role, I think, that Latin America is playing in recent years in trying to um, address these two very real things, these states' duty to investigate, prosecute, and punish, and the rights of vic victims to truth, justice, and reparation in domestic courts. It's a fairly new thing, um, and it's fairly relatively understudied. Um, and that's one of the things that I do, um, is try to study these things and try to understand the conditions under which these things take place and how effective they are, because they're not always, unfortunately, as effective as we might like to be, we, we might like them to be. But just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, yesterday as we were having dinner, some of us from the conference, in Peru, a court convicted a, 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 an active uh, brigadier general to 15 years for the forced disappearance of a professor, uh, which occurred in, in March of 1990. In Guatemala last week, uh, a court convicted a former police chief to 40 years for the forced disappearance of, I believe it was a union activist. So these things are happening and they're completely flying. I don't think, have any, did any of you read about that in a US newspaper? No, right. Um, and these are not small things in my humble opinion. Um, I'm gonna skip over the, the Latin America violent past spiel that I was gonna give because I have only 10 minutes, I'm told. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to just fast forward. We all know about Latin America's violent past and the massive human rights abuses that were committed, both in the context of military dictatorships um, governed by the Nat National Security Doctrine, as well as countries like in Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, as well as Peru that suffered through internal armed conflicts. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit is the transitional moments and then the post-transitional moments in Latin America. Um, because I think that the lessons for Colombia could be very interesting, even while we have to acknowledge that the scenario in Colombia, as has been clearly outlined yesterday and today, is, is quite different. Um, in the first wave of transitions in Latin America that began to take place in the 1980s, only in Argentina, where the military regime collapsed as a result of its own incompetence, and a new civilian government embraced the human rights demands of a well-organized human rights movement, was there a state-led effort to prosecute those responsible for human rights abuses during the military government. And as we all probably know, in, 95, in 1985, nine members of the military juntas that ruled that country were put on trial Five of them were sentenced to long prison terms. 
as we all also probably know, military unrest gave way to a series of government amnesty laws that ended the prosecutorial efforts in Argentina, and in 1989 and 1990 pardons set the five junta leaders free and established what in essence was a general amnesty. In other cases in Latin America during this first transitional wave, Uruguay and Brazil, for example, nothing at all was done. Um, the argument of the governments that took power in those transitional uh, systems was it's better not to have eyes in the back of our heads, and they promoted a policy that was a direct quote from former President Sanguinetti, um, and to promote a, a policy of forgive and forget what, what Mark Chernick yesterday called bor borrón y cuenta nueva. Amnesty laws sealed the deal in these cases, preventing criminal prosecutions from moving forward. Um, and in fact, mil Argentina became sort of a counterexample. The military unrest there was cited as proof that criminal investigations were foolhardy, criminal prosecutions rather, were foolhardy, threaten stability, and undermine fragile new democracies. Then there was a, a sort of a, a shift in which truth commissions became possible, but not alongside prosecutions. Um, truth commissions became seen as a way of constructing new narratives about what happened in the past, but without threatening the, the fragile new arrangements that these transitional governments had put in place. Um, so with the military still powerful, countries such as Chile, El Salvador, and Guatemala uh, carried out transitions. Um, had truth commissions, but dared not engage in criminal prosecutions for fear of inciting new military conspiracies. These arrangements, however, and this brings me to the sort of, I don't know if I should call it the post-transitional moment or what, but these arrangements were often, not always, disrupted, sometimes many years later. Um, and without getting into too much detail, um, the fact of the matter is, is in nearly all of those countries, those amnesty laws have either been overturned or ignored, and criminal prosecutions have moved forward. Um, I think it's important just to state that the Inter-American Commission and court has played an absolutely fundamental role in this, as has victims groups and human rights organizations whose determination and perseverance in obtaining justice, truth, and reparation for victims has made this possible. Um, one of the key decisions of the Inter-American Court in this regard is the 2001 Barrios Altos massacre sentence, in which the court for the first time declares not only that the Peruvian, in, the, in this case it was Peru, that the Peruvian state was responsible for this massacre and was obliged to investigate, prosecute, and punish. That had been determined in numerous other sentences. But the court also said that the amnesty law, which had, the amnesty laws that had been passed in 1995 in Peru, violated the American Convention and lacked legal effect. This opened the doors for prosecutions in Peru, and it was seized upon by activists across Latin America as a way to argue that the amnesty laws in their countries could no longer be held um, as, as valid and legal. Not always successfully, as we know, in Brazil and in El Salvador, amnesty laws um, still are in place. Um, uh, last week, I believe it was, a, a, a Salvadoran court accepted a case in which it will hear a challenge to the constitutionality of the amnesty law, which is a radical thing for El Salvador. Um, we'll see how that turns out. Um, Brazil, uh, we'll see. Um, but as a result, you've had a, a, a number of criminal prosecutions in Latin America. Um, Argentina, Uruguay, Peru, and Guatemala have all prosecuted former heads of state successfully. Uh, Guatemala successfully prosecuted uh, Rios Montt very recently. Of course, as we all know, the Constitutional Court stuck its nose in in quite an illegal fashion and overturned that. We could talk about that later. Pin uh, our, uh, uh, Chile would have prosecuted Pinochet had he not died um, before. Uh, that's a whole other story. Um, but beyond the heads of, of state level, there have been a number of other criminal prosecutions in Latin America um, of military, uh, mid-ranking, lower-ranking rebel. And there, there's a lot of questions that are raised about the different ranks and levels that we could talk about, um, as well as civilians. It's very rare for civilians to be prosecuted for human rights abuses, but it has happened. In Argentina, there have been trials of former priests, former judges who've been involved in, for example, baby kidnapping um, in Argentina. Um, it, uh, in Peru, there have been a couple of, of civilian, one, one civilian in particular, um, Vladimir Montesinos, although he was a former military officer. Um, 
I think it's important to note that these processes are powerfully mediated by politics. Um, certain political arrangements and balances of power have allowed these prosecutions to move forward in every single case that we look at. And I'm certain that that will be the case in Colombia as well. Likewise, um, political arrangements may often come in the way of criminal prosecution. Some of the things that we're seeing in places like Peru and Uruguay now is, and, and I think in Guatemala as well, is sort of a backlash in which those who want to ensure impunity for themselves and their colleagues are regrouping and figuring out, figuring out new ways to ensure that impunity remains uh, uh, the reality um, in the face of these prosecutions. Um, I had a few quick conclusions, so let me just work through those very, very quickly. Um, the transitions literature shows that in general, as a general rule, only when an old regime collapses are there political conditions in the immediate post-transition period for criminal prosecutions. The configuration of power, as I've suggested in these post-authoritarian or post-conflict settings, is a key variable in understanding whether post-conflict justice will be allowed to advance. However, as for Colombia, the international scenario is quite different when these original, these transitions that I'm talking about in Latin America occurred. The international architecture favoring accountability is quite different today, and Colombia will have to take this into account, as I think uh, Professor Chernick uh, alluded to quite clearly yesterday. Um, amnesties have been used as a tool in the past to facilitate transitions or peace agreements, but blanket amnesties such as those that were used in Chile or El Salvador are, for this very reason, no longer viable. I think here Guatemala is a really interesting example to raise. The 1996 amnesty law that was passed in Guatemala as part of the peace agreement um, was granted for certain political crimes, but it specifically excluded crimes against humanity, genocide, and torture, the key international crimes that victims are seeking redress for. Um, and so in the recent years, when there's been a new opportunities for prosecutions in Guatemala, the amnesty law has not been a barrier to prosecution, even though there are those in Guatemala who argue that the amnesty law means that no one can be prosecuted, which is an absolutely fallacious argument. Um, the days or trade-offs are, in my opinion, over. Justice cannot be elided to favor peace. Um, no one is advocating that criminal prosecutions for grave violations of human rights are sufficient repair for victims or a guarantee of non-repetition. However, truth, uh, in that sense, truth, the search for the missing, individual and collect collective reparations and institutional forms are absolutely essential. But without prosecutions, we're missing a key piece of the puzzle, the rights of victims, number one, Number two, the rule of law and the principle of equality before the law, which is a fundamental tenet of democracy. And three, it means that impunity remains unchallenged. And I think this is perhaps one of the key examples of Central America that, that Winifred Tate alluded to yesterday in her presentation, um, especially in places like El Salvador and Guatemala, where in the post-transition period, there was no prosecutions for human rights abuses. The structures of impunity that existed during those wars were not challenged, remained in place, and morphed into the new criminal networks that we see today engaged in all kinds of criminal activity in those par that part of the world. And as we know, this is a part of the world where violence today uh, exceeds the violence of the Civil War period, especially in El Salvador. Um, I will leave it at that because I know I'm probably over time, um, and I thank you for, uh, again, the invitation. Thank you very much. I think this was a, a great panel and um, raising very difficult questions, I think, as every, everyone has made clear here. So I want to open it up to our audience. And what I think we're going to do is collect a couple of questions. If you have a question for a particular panelist, uh, just mention it. Otherwise, you know, we'll be treated um, generally. And please identify yourself and your institution briefly when you, um, when you give us your question. So I want to take first, I see one over here, uh, right in the, in the front, and then move, try to move back and forth and take a couple, two or three, maybe. Um, Santiago Llaves, I'm an independent consultant. Um, it's not a question, but I, I want to make a connection between two presentations and, and sort of suggest something to, to Michael. 
Uh, I want to connect the presentation of Diego with Michael's uh, uh, presentation for one, one key reason. Um, Diego, Diego mentioned the role of families and how families can be dispersed into belonging to different either perpetrators of, of, of violence or indeed uh, victims. Um, and I suspect very much that when you look at your, um, um, the category that you have in victimizations, which you don't know who they are, I suspect that a lot of that is between family and friends. So it would be very, very interesting to look deeper at the statistics and try to figure out, of course, besides the obvious of it would be interesting also to, you know, to, to, to do the race and gender uh, differentiation. But I think it would be incredibly interesting if you can come, out, uh, come up with numbers to see how much of victimization occurs between very closely knit networks of family and friends. Because this gives a very different uh, perspective, a very different lens of the encroachment and the depth of the conflict in the, in, in, in the, in the country. Very interesting, thank you. So why don't we take a, I think there's a mic right behind you. Thanks. Uh, Tom Bamett, Catholic Relief Services. Uh, there was a focus, in what the title was about moving from being a victim, which is a, a difficult term, particularly in this country, um, to becoming citizens. And the citizenship component involves rights, uh, which uh, Joe Marie was referring to very explicitly, but also to being engaged citizens, sujetos, uh, doesn't translate very well either, but active sujetos is, is a very important term in, in, in Latin America. And I wanted to ask any of the panelists about what they see as the most important kinds of roles that victims can have uh, as sujetos, uh, both in the current uh, uh, victim's law and in future accords uh, going forward. What are the most important kinds of things that victims and victims associations and organizations can do uh, to move forward and to be uh, proponents of their own rights? Great, thanks. I think, why don't we take uh, another one? I see uh, here. Uh, Jim Jones. I'm uh, also an independent consultant. Uh, I. The big question I have is how is Colombia going to uh, deal with victims given the large number of victims? I mean, the number is just staggering. Thank you. Okay, why don't we take those and we'll take another round. So I guess why don't we start from this side and sure. just go down. Yes, Santiago. Santiago, thank you for your question. I think it's a nice way of thinking about the, the interconnection between what Diego is talking about and what I'm talking about. Um, so the interrelation or the familial networks, kin networks, um, are key in understanding patterns of victimization. Uh, using these data, I actually don't unfortunately think it's possible, um, but I can look and see if, it's, if it would be possible. Um, we know, at least in the case of, I, mean, I mostly study armed group behavior, and we know that in the case of recruitment into armed groups, these kin networks, these fit, either families or groups of friends typically join up together. Um, and it would be sort of a, a nice if perverse symmetry that, um, that victims would be victimized as part of you know, families or friend networks. Um, I will have to look into this with the data that I have. Um, <laughs> Victims, should I, how many of these should I, should I touch on, really? Um, well, <laughs> I guess give it a minute or two. Okay, so we can uh, 30 more enough. seconds, how about yeah. that? Um, maybe just to Jim's question about the, the number, of, the large number of victims, it's absolutely overwhelming, I think, um, both just from humanity perspective <laughs> and from an sort of administrative, how to deal with reparations for such a large population. Um, I'm a big fan of, of what La Unidad is doing. Um, there was some questions yesterday as to how land restitution efforts are going. I know much less about that than I do about the reparations program, which seems to be proceeding um, pretty well. Um, it's gonna take a long time. I mean, President Santos has always said that. La Unidad de Victimas has always said that, that the scale of the problem is, is massive, as you suggest. Um, and new victims are being created every day. And this is actually, in a way, the biggest challenge. It's not just that there's a backlog of you know, six million 
almost six million uh, displaced, uh, you know, many, many other beneficiaries of, of uh, hechos victimizantes de, of, of homicides and kidnap and torture or whatever. Um, it's gonna take time. Um, and that's not something that we're particularly good at, you know, waiting, uh, being patient. Um, Colombia has an important victim movement that is working since the 90s. Uh, and I think that victims have many important roles to play in Colombian society. One of them is to claim their rights, their rights to truth and justice, and I think that it is like a ethical claim that is important for the society. Uh, but also they are making proposals, for example, the, the Movimiento de Victimas de Estado, the crime state victims. Uh, did uh, proposals for the peace negotiation process that is taking place in Havana, and other uh, associations and groups of movement are participating in the forums that the peace negotiation is open in Colombia, like we had several forums, meetings. Uh, the last one was in, I think that today they are, we have a meeting in Colombia that is discussing the drugs uh, eaten. But in July, uh, we had a meeting that talked about victims' rights, and many victims attend that meeting. Uh, and I think that victims are straining democracy with their demands like they are con helping to consolidate democracy in Colombia or build democracy, I think that is better to say. And many victims' organizations are articulating their uh, struggles with other social movements, and I think that is also an important role to play in Colombian society. Great, very interesting. Two quick comments about, well, one on the family and friends. Um, if you ask a lot of Afro-Colombian uh, people, especially in the Pacific Basin, they, you, find that you will find out that a lot of them have relatives in b on both sides, or in three sides, because I mean, we, we, we didn't talk about the, the, the trafficking here, like the drug trafficking here, but um, it would be good actually to start like a kind of a, uh, conduct a census on, you know, and ask, ask people, because I, you know, I've been, we've been asking, you know, some, some of the leaders from the Pacific Basin, and they always say, oh, I have a cousin that is like in this side, and you know, and, and those kind of things. And but, but yeah, it's. I think it's a, a big a good in terms of having um, data on, on this. I think, in terms of, of the role of victims as, as sujetos, I think they are already. Uh, they're claiming to be subjects or sujetos right now. And, and as, as Diana was mentioning, there this has been a huge movement. I think the question here is how the government is 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 uh, looking at those sujetos. You know, are they looking at peers like let's, okay, let's talk, let's talk, let's negotiate, or they they haven't been taken seriously yet. And I think that's that's the question. I not a question actually. I think that that's what I think that they're not being taken seriously. And, and again, and, and also we are bringing more victims um, you know, almost every day um, in the conflict. And then how the government is gonna lead with, the, uh, I mean, we're gonna deal with this large number of victims. I mean, it's a lot of political will, but it has to, the, the interesting thing in Colombia is that even though it's not a federal country, so to speak, but the gov you know, like the role of the governors, like in, like las, las gobernaciones or the departments, it's it's very um, autonomous compared to other places. So I think the the not only to look at the, at the what the national government would do, but actually what the departments would do, you know, and and the role of the governors there and and what they can do, um, you know, to, in order to improve the situation. Great, Diego. Okay, picking on the the question or the comment about family ties and victimization, um, I think it's important to understand that in the cases of indigenous and black population that those community ties that are based on um, families or large uh, conception of families are the, the core of their, their identity as a group. So it's the, uh, 
is their strength, but it's also the most vulnerable thing. And that is what the conflict is destroying so rapidly. So it's, and if those ties are destroying, we are facing what we like to call ethnocide. Mm. Because it's not the possibility that all black people or of, of indigenous people are going to be assassinated. But the possibility that, that their, their lives as a community is being destroyed. And the role of, of victims, I think the, the, the victims organization is um, a really good um, characteristic of our uh, society. I think there is not other place in the world with that uh, such a commitment for the people who have been victimis victimized to get together and build organizations and produce so much information. But the government, and I have to say that the, 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 the guerrillas or the, 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 the armed groups are not taking that seriously. And the accusations uh, of belong to one group of another go, going uh, one, one side and the other side accuse the organizations to work for the government or work against one or, or another one. So I think uh, we have to open the door to uh, allow the, the, the organizations to participate in the, in the organization of their own reparation or integration. Integration is the key point. Integration of the communities that have been marginalized for so long and respect also for their authorities. So I think that could be a good role. Um, I just want to bring in a little bit of different perspective on the issue of victims of subjects. Um, I think it's important. I, in my research, I always talk about the role of victims in advocating um, and being activists for their rights. And that role is absolutely essential in Latin America, and it's essential in Colombia. But for every activist victim, there's an activist who's dead, or there's an activist whose social world has been destroyed, and they can't gather the moral energy to be activists. I've seen this very deeply in Peru, and, and I think it's often we often forget how devastating and traumatic these experiences are for people, even when they're activists engaging in their own advocacy for truth and justice. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to the table. Um, I think the suggestions here about involving victims in the discussion is absolutely essential. Um, strategic litigation in, strateg in, in leadership cases is fundamentally important, trying to bring as many cases together, even though that might seem unwieldy, is actually the best way to go, as we, we see in the case of Argentina. Argentina has been very good at learning from the initial cases, which were literally one or two victims and one or two um, perpetrators, to much bigger cases involving large number of perpetrators and, and sometimes seven or 800 victims. Um, Sometimes that's easier in certain cases. So when you're talking about a clandestine detention center like ESMA or Orleti, that makes it a little bit easier than maybe perhaps in, is the case in, in a conflict like the Colombian. So it would be interesting to think about how, what a leadership case would look like in Colombia. Um, but I think aside from the litigation, I think what I've seen in other parts of Latin America is that truth and especially the search for the missing is fundamentally important. Um, people want justice, but they want the bodies of their loved ones. And I think it's important for us to remember that this is a key missing part of the, the missing piece that we talk about is that. Um, I know numbers of cases in Latin America um, where there have actually been prosecutions um, in cases of forced disappearances, and the body has still not been found. And there are people who know where the bodies are. They know where the bodies are, but they're not talking. How can we get around that? That is impunity in its purest form, and that remains an enduring problem in Latin America. I think we should add, too, that um, for many of the victims who are activists, 
or their families, there continues to be very grave danger. Um, and certainly where there's an ongoing conflict, but for decades after, even in places like Argentina, people have been threatened or worse for, for coming forward to, um, yeah, for coming forward not that long ago to be, um, to, to testify, not to mention to, to organize. Uh, I think we will um, cut in, uh, take the, the privilege of cutting a little to your coffee break. We will give you time, but I think we should take another round of questions, as I think this is very engaging. Um, why don't I give a privilege here to our organizer, Ginny Bouvier, but then I'll take several others. Thanks again for a wonderful panel. I have so many questions. Um, I guess the first, just to follow up on the most recent discussion, is a very basic one. What more can we do to provide protection uh, to these people who are standing up and putting their lives on the line as this process goes forward? We're likely to see it escalate um, as the victim's law is trying to be implemented. And then a kind of secondary and slightly different take on it. Diana, you mentioned something about the victim's law as being disempowering, and I wanted you to talk a little bit more about that and talk about what might be done to change that paradigm. Um, uh, Joe Marie, you mentioned that the days of trade-offs are over. Ojalá. <laughs> but I wonder if you could um, say just a couple of words about kind of the transformation of what, when I entered this field, was a really broad um, and very clear division between the human rights world and the conflict resolution world. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about where you see that having come. Um, and another question has to do with the new ICG report that came out yesterday. Uh, Mark Schneider mentioned it. It's a report that recognizes that given the large numbers of victims um, and the difficulties of administering justice, basically, uh, that a potential roadmap might be embracing prosecution for the most responsible for the most serious crimes. And I wondered what your evaluation of that kind of proposal is. And maybe more than your own personal evalu evaluation, whether victims groups have begun discussing this. I know it's a relatively recent report, but if this seems like a, a plausible avenue forward. Um, I think I had one final question. Uh, uh, finally, for, for Diego and Carlos, um, the question about recommendation, what are the recommendations coming out of the Afro-Colombian communities for the peace table? Are they asking to be heard at the peace table directly through an audience? Are they participating in the social forums and trying to have their have their ideas heard in that way, um, and what more can be done to have their voices heard. Okay. Great, thank you. And I think I'm going to try to take someone towards the back on that side. I see um, right here in the middle. Hello, I'm Dorli Castaneda. I'm a researcher on peace building, and I'm currently a consultant at the World Bank. And I have a point question for all of you, and it is about what do you think about the park proposal on doing like a neutral commission for analyzing the conflict. Is this an opportunity for looking at victims and Afro-Colombians and indigenous communities and having a new way of reading the conflict? Or is it just, what, which are the risks of doing this commission right now? And who are the people you think should be part of it? Thank you. Great, thank you. And one uh, about on the edge here. Uh, Donny Mertens, um, Javeriana University, Bogota, and now fellow at Wilson Center. Um, I want to talk about women's rights and women victims. I didn't hear uh, anything about it. Uh, and I think um, it's very important, uh, if you're talking about forms of victimization, to take into account gender. And this may uh, bring us to several um, Tensions, I think, in our um, notion of victimization of victims and of the search for justice. Um, and I want to point out some of these tensions. First of all, most of uh, women's organizations and victims' organizations, um, when they talk about uh, the, the women victims, they are talking about um, sexual violence, and there has been a, done a, a lot of work on, on the theme. Um, but I think beyond this terrible question of sexual violence against women in the context of conflict, conflict there are other issues that has to do, first of all, 
with um, um, historical inequalities. So I want to pose this question. How are we dealing with, um, if you're, we're, we're looking for justice, how are we dealing with, um, with this historical inequalities? Um, a second question that has to do with these historical inequalities is um, how uh, deal, can we deal with the tensions between um, collective rights and individual rights? This is, for instance, a question in the um, struggles for um, collective territories. Of the, so I want to, to pose this question uh, to the uh, um, well, both Carlos and, and Diego. Um, and third, um, how do we deal with uh, women searching for, for justice in the context of local communities? And um, this is maybe a, a theme we will talking about in, in the next session, about local peace activities and local peace um, uh, movements. Uh, but I think the Colombian reality uh, shows us that um, at the local level, um, many times victims and perpetrators are still uh, living together, are still part of the same communities. So you have to, and this is especially the case for women and for women that have been victims of, of sexual violence. And so I want to pose the three questions to all of the panel. Okay, I think we'll have answers to these questions or discussion and then we'll break for coffee. And we do have a session at the end that's really gonna be open, I think, that we, or we can bring up some more of these issues. I know a lot of people had burning questions they wanted to present. So, Michael? <laughs> Take a quick stab. Oh boy. Um, there are so many good and wonderful and very, very difficult questions here. Um, so maybe I'll just deal with one. So this question about women's, uh, about victimization of women. Um, as, I w as you began to ask this question, obviously the first thought that occurred to me was sexual violence. And then I started thinking, well, this, you know, victims, uh, women are victims of, of many different types of victimization, certainly not just sexual violence, um, and I think the, the current process of reparations in Colombia attempts to deal with this um, through the enfoque diferencial, um, but I'm sure there's more that could be done. <laughs> um, the, yeah, um, in terms of tensions between collective and individual rights, um, <sighs> I don't, I don't know that I have, good question, I have good answers for any of these. They're really, really hard questions. Um, and probably my co-panelists have better answers than I do. Let's see, Diana. I apologize, but I'm going to answer in Spanish because uh, it's uh, difficult to articulate in English <laughs> these answers for me. <laughs> Sorry for the people that don't understand Spanish. <laughs> in relation with the victims and land restitution law, uh, I have to say something. Eh, primero, que la ley de víctimas y restitución de tierras eh, pone en el centro una visión economicista de la reparación a las víctimas. Y al poner el centro en lo económico, y se dan reparaciones de orden económico, eh, reparaciones que no compensan igual eh, la pérdida que han sufrido las y los colombianos, también genera una lógica asistencialista que hemos podido ver en Colombia en el último año a un poco, eh, no sabría cómo decirlo, como desarticulado un poco el accionar del movimiento de víctimas, de las víctimas. Creo que están perdiendo fuerza política las víctimas eh, y sus demandas en ese sentido, pero además esta ley de, de víctimas y restitución de tierra tiene otros dos problemas centrales que quisiera señalar, uno es que no… Ok. Sí, I'll try to translate briefly just the, the gist of what she's saying, is that the victim's law uh, has a problem in that it, put, it, 
it proposes a very economic view of victims where economic reparations are supposed to compensate for the human loss that the victims have suffered. And Diana, you can correct me and, and adjust my translation. Um, and that also the victim's law tends to generate a kind of logic that is assistencialista, which is kind of, it's assisting, it's a kind of a, sub, a clientelistic um, <laughs> approach. Um, and paternalistic, paternalistic approach. Um, and furthermore, it, the victim's law process delinks the victims from the victim's movement, which actually takes away the political clout of the movement itself. And there are other two problems with the law. The first is that this law doesn't recognize some of the victims, especially state crimes victims. And the other problem is what I said in my paper, is that uh, the, reparation, the restitution of land is connected with uh, with the way that capitalism is taking place now in Colombia with the neo-extractivism. Some, some people has to, if, if, if land is returned to people, they have to give it in concession to the people that is exploiting it. Uh, if, okay, in Spanish, I'm, I cannot articulate. Eh, la, las víctimas tienen que dar en concesión o arrendar su tierra cuando esta tierra está siendo usada para fines eh, económicos y generalmente está siendo usada para extractivismo. Entonces, digamos que esto no está garantizando una real restitución de la tierra. Y por otra parte, tampoco hay condiciones reales para que la gente retorne, porque no hay seguridad, porque la guerra continúa en el campo. Esas serían como las dos cosas… I would just add then that um, another problem is that it doesn't recognize the victims of state crimes um, and that land restitution is actually connected with the capitalist policies that are in effect whereby there's an exception made that when land is returned, um, some people are required to give their land in concession or to rent it out to industries that come in primarily for extractive industries so, that are there already. And in relation with women's situation, I want to highlight that uh, there is like uh, se sexual assault has been part of the manners that uh, the world uh, take place in Colombia. Like the women's body has been conceived as a botín de guerra. Uh, I don't remember the word booty. Yes, we're booty, um, but women are also, and we have a problem with that because, uh, for example, the, the la ley de justicia y paz, the law and peace. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> how do you say that? Justice and peace. Justice and peace law. <laughs> uh, I know. Sorry, in Spanish, la ley de justicia y paz aunque eh, la violencia sexual ha sido muy común en Colombia contra las mujeres, eh, esta ley no ha judicializado casos, si lo ha hecho, lo ha hecho en un porcentaje muy, muy bajo de judicializar casos de violencia sexual contra las mujeres. Y, por ejemplo, el modelo fue que eh, los paramilitares que contaban lo que quisieran contar para contribuir a la verdad y nunca dijeron, a excepción de un paramilitar, que utilizaron la violencia sexual como arma de guerra. She's saying that un, under the justice and peace law, although sexual violence has been very common in the Colombian conflict, um, there's only one case of sexual violence that has been processed under the justice and peace law. The model that was used was that paramilitaries would tell the truth, um, but none of the paramilitaries chose to tell about sexual violence, except for one. I have more to say about Yeah, um, well, I, I think we need to, I mean, I'm pretty sure we understand the, the, how complex the situation is in Colombia. And I, 
I have to just mention this because it's not, it's not easy. Colombia is not Argentina or Guatemala. I mean, there's so many actors in Colombia and I think, you know, it's gonna be, it's, gonna, it's, it's the government and also the, the victims um, have a huge challenge in order to try to seek justice and try to seek for reparations, et cetera. But having said that, I would say that, that also within the victims movement, and I have to, I have to tell the truth, I think within the Afro-Colombian movement, there, I mean, it's, it's not mono, monolithic. It's not, uh, it's, it's not homogeneous. Homo homogeneous. Uh, so you know, like, if the Afro-descendant movement would like to participate as, as you know, as a group, then they will have to take, they will have to kind of um, uh, agree on on specific issues. And that will take time, too. So I mean, having said that, probably you know, within the indigenous movement. You know, it's gonna it's, it's gonna be the same, even within the women's movement too, because, um, you know, like with all due respect, you know, the traditional women's uh, uh, rights, uh, like the women's movement in Colombia, um, they didn't take into account situation of Afro descendant indigenous women for a long time. I mean, and I will act actually uh, until right now. I mean, there's gonna be Colombia is gonna be reviewed under CEDAW uh, next month, and the Afro Colombian organizations are the one drafting shadow reports because the traditional women's movement were not taking into account situation of Afro-descendant women. So it's very complex. And I think, um, but, but, but that doesn't mean that they don't have the right to participate. And, and I think, um, and Diego can expl explain a little bit more about how, I mean, what kind of recommendations the Afro-Colombians have been discussing in the, in the locally uh, peace process um, um, dialogues. But I just wanna mention about um, in terms of going back again on, on, on the women's rights, is the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights uh, came out with a report on the situation of women affected by an internal conflict in Colombia back in 2007, I think. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights went to Colombia last year, in December last year, and they actually also met with the women's movement. And the report is yet to be released, but it's gonna be, have a section on situation of, of, uh, of women. But at the same time, it'll be interesting because also we, you know, with we meaning like the, those of us working on Afro-descendant issues, we actually had a separate uh, meeting with the, the commission talking about the situation of Afro-descendant women. Because the level of, not only the level of violence, but also the, the, the stigma and other factors that, um, <laughs> that um, are linked with Afro-Colombian women, especially when they, when they migrate to big cities like Bogota, Medellin, or basically Bogota or Medellin, it's, 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 well, it's very complicated. And finally, I would like to just mention a little bit about the, you know, like the importance of, of the territory for the Afro-Colombian community, especially in the Pacific Basin, and how this, uh, how the, how the peace process and also how the, the new laws, the victims law, et cetera, this is not a guarantee of redress what, what, they, what they're facing right now. I mean, uh, Diana was mentioning, a lot of people cannot go back to their communities yet. And, uh, and so a lot of people who have collective titles from the collective, uh, based on law 70, they cannot go back and, and, and claim their, their land yet. And uh, so, Again, it's, this, it's a lot of, I mean, it's the, the government and, and the Colombian society will face a lot of challenges, but I'm very optimistic. So I think that, that we're gonna move forward in Colombia. Uh, okay, I'm gonna briefly respond to some of the questions. Uh, regarding protection, I think the best tool of protection is to find the responsibles of the threats. So for instance, Afrodes and other organizations have received pretty much the same threat from the same um, uh, email account, and we don't have any uh, results of the investigation whatsoever in seven years or so. So it's such a disregard for the for to the finding of the responsibles, and they are even um, when they have meetings with other, with with people from uh, international visitors or something like that. The responsible for the protection says, like, oh no, you know. Uh, some organizations they put their names in the in the in the um, letter threat in the yeah in the letter uh, in the threatening letters, uh, and it's so hard to to follow 
who is actually being treated and who is not because we don't, we don't have that certainty. So protection is, means find the responsibles and do your work. So because they are so reluctant to uh, even release their own, uh, uh, um, yeah, to, to uh, perform their own duties. Um, about the, the victim's law, I have to say in a simplistic way, the, it's, it's kind of, a, was an strategy for two things. One, this is this encourage the victim's mobilization, and two, uh, bring or provide legal, legal, say, uh, legal certainty to investors, to foreign investors. Uh, that's pretty much the objectives of the, of the victim law. About the ICG proposal of the most or to pro, pro, um, prosecute the most responsible for the most serious crimes. Mm, uh, I don't know, what are the most serious crime, crimes? We don't even know what is going on in the Pacific Coast. We don't have any official information of some of the most horrific crimes you, can, you could ever heard about. Uh, for instance, in, in the situation in Tumaco, in Buenaventura is so, so there. Uh, we, uh, we have been told about um, um, massacres, the daily base, um, like they, they open what they call a ch um, chop house, when they, so one people, one whole people get in and one bag of uh, body pieces going out all days and it's in, in, in during the daylight so people in the entire neighborhood uh, listen the screams of the people. So we don't have any any uh, report on that. Just the information we get from the from the primary sources of what is the most serious crimes. Sexual violence is, is one of those. Sexual violence in in the entire Pacific Coast is like a factory of of uh, of sexual violence. Some, some people say that the Congo is the capital of the sexual violence. I think we have to, to check on, on what's going on in our, in our country. Uh, about the, the recommendation from the, from the uh, Afro-Colombian movement to the peace talks, the thing is that in the regions, the people are in really, really bad conditions. So, for instance, in the in the agrarian movement, you could see uh, like a lot of mobilization in many regions in the in the in the in Colombia, but in the Pacific Coast, the situation was pretty quiet because the level of control and the level of uh, confinement of the people there is so huge. So even talk with police or with anybody is a risk, a, a life risk. So I think we need to, to start a campaign to open up what is, what's happening in the Pacific Coast. Uh, and about the collective rights v individual rights, those are not uh, mutually exclusive. So those two, uh, those two set of, of duties of the states are uh, mutually inclusive and our state duty, so uh, they have to provide solution for both. And what, uh, what is really um, alarming for, uh, for us is that, for instance, the government has been so negligent in recognize and protect the, the rights of the, the territory rights of Black Falls, but it has been so diligent to provide license to, uh, to mining and other uh, projects in, in our own land. So we need that to be the opposite. So be diligent to, pro, uh, to protect our rights and be more careful to um, guarantee the rights for uh, foreign investors to come <coughs> and explode our land. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, feel free to 
Um, thanks. Um, regarding the protection of victims, I think it's important to recognize that this goes from the gamut, right? So it can go from actual violence against witnesses. In the case of Julio Lopez, who was disappeared in 2000 after having testified in one of the first trials, um, is sort of the emblematic example of that. But it also includes intimidation against witnesses and efforts to pay off witnesses to get them to recant their testimonies or simply not participate in trials. Um, Witness protection programs are essential. They need to be funded. The international community needs to step up um, because this is a real problem. And we see it across Latin America where, where these are real problems. And in the case of the Dos Erres, you had two military officers, uh, sorry, two soldiers, who were eyewitnesses to what happened, the, the murder of uh, 200 people in the village of Dos Erres. And their testimony was crucial to the initial um, and then subsequent prosecutions in the Dos Erres case. And they were sent to Mexico. Um, I think I'm OK to say that, um, where they live in under, under a witness protection program. Um, but it's very expensive to do that. Um, uh, so that's not always a possibility. Um, Trade-offs, yeah. Um, I think conceptually and legally and ethically, the days of trade-offs are over. It's not to say necessarily that in the practice they're over. Um, and in the human rights fields and the conflict resolution fields, we always comment with my friends when we go to ISA, for example, that the girl, and I'm sorry to gender this, but it's really true. Like 90% of the people talking on in the human rights and transitional justice field are women. And 90%, this is just an, not an, an empirically sustained argument, but 90% of the, of the people in the conflict res meetings across the hall are men. I don't know what that's about, but it's an observation that we've made repeatedly over the course of our ISA engagement over the last like, five or so years. So I don't know what that means, but um, anyway, sorry. Um, last but not least, I want to talk about the issue of um, women and sexual violence in particular um, as regards to criminal investigations and prosecutions. I think that sexual violence is one of the most difficult crimes to be prosecuted in war or in peace. Um, in Peru, there were over 500 cases that were um, denounced before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Over 2,000 were denounced before the um, uh, Reparations Council. And guess how many have gone to trial? Zero. None. Zero. Zero. Um, Guatemala, however, is a really interesting counterexample. The Rios Montt trial included um, sexual violence as a part of the broader um, case that was being made against Rios Montt to for demonstrate genocide. And the court found, the court that was the trial court found that in fact the sexual violence against women and the efforts to destroy babies and infants in particular was was proof that genocide had been committed. So so their sexual violence was a key part of the case. And women came forth and quite bravely, you know, reca recounted their their horror stories before the court and before the world, because it was all transmitted, you know, live streamed. Um, uh, and again, bringing it full circle, witness protection is a huge issue. These are people who now face, you know, real problems going back into their communities. And there's very little, by the way, of protection. Um, so I think that the issue of sexual violence is something that, that really needs um, thinking through about how, how we address it um, at that level. Thanks. Great. Thank you. I think um, this was a large panel, so it made sense to, and a very compelling topic. So we've gone, we've gone over time, and I think we have our panel coming up next is a much smaller panel with only three people. So Ginny, what do you think if we um, try to meet back here at 1130 and make it one hour, one hour and 10 minutes? It's 1125 now. I yeah. So we go to, okay, we'll meet back here at quarter of 12. Well, I'd like to welcome the new panel um, to the table and Chris Mitchell, who's our moderator, will be introducing the other panelists. Um, so I'll introduce him first. This is a panel looking at the intersection of local peace building and national peace processes. Um, 
Chris is currently Emeritus Professor of Conflict Research at the School of Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University, Virginia. Um, prior to this, he's held teaching and research appointments at the University College London, London School of Economics, University of Southampton, University of Surrey, and City University London. He's written extensively about the analysis of protracted and intractable social conflicts and about the practice of conflict resolution. Initially, he focused on the study of international mediation, uh, but later switched his interest to studying the practice of track two uh, facilitation and unofficial, the practices of unofficial intermediaries. Uh, he's in, been involved in many conflicts around the world, including Cyprus, Spain, Northern Ireland, former Soviet Union, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, for the last decade, he's been part of a Zones of Peace working group at ICAR and has spent over a decade researching local peace initiatives in Philip the Philippines and Colombia. Um, he's a ter tremendous mentor for many of us. Um, he participated in a book project that I organized on Colombia, Building Peace in a Time of War, looking at the conflicts, looking at local zones of conflict um, and local peace committees and peace communities that have sprung up throughout Colombia. Some fascinating research, and I think it's really uh, pioneered a whole new territory for students who are interested in peace movements and trying to see uh, how peace is generated and built from below. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Chris Mitchell and welcome our other panelists um, and turn it over to you. Thank you. Right. Never write your own blurb. <laughs> and above all, never let anybody else read it. Uh, <laughs> you should, you should be. Uh, I'd like to start actually on behalf of the panel by, by saying a, a very big word of thanks to Ginny Bouvier uh, for several things, really. I, one of them is, I think, her long campaign to get Latin American issues as a focus at USIP. I, we know how long that's taken, and uh, Ginny has been very persistent in, in pushing that. So we thank you for that, and we thank you for arranging this particular event, a particular timely event. Uh, and um, uh, I guess last of all, I really have to sort of thank you for dragging me out of my comfortable retirement and making me part of this event. So the um, thing that has struck me listening to the very many interesting presentations over the last couple of days, uh, really two things. Um, one is the number of occasions on which speakers have talked about the necessity for uh, local efforts uh, in becoming involved in this whole process of building any peace which may or may not emerge from Havana. Uh, you know, people have talked about um, uh, you know, victims and reparations and reinsertion, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things are going to have to be done locally in Colombia. They're all going to be dumped on regional and local authorities. Um, and as, as Mark mentioned the other day, almost without preparation. Uh, that's one thing that I, I've heard. And um, the other thing makes me slightly concerned about this project because um, Many of the many of the sort of political imbalances that are currently reflected in organisations in Bogota, including you know, including the Senate downwards, um, seem to me to I'm not sure what the right word is have been captured, represent, uh, are under the influence of. Forces in Colombia which are basically anti-change. Uh, in other words, there are a lot of places where, you know, the, the old conflicts are going to go on. I mean, Colombia after Havana is not going to be a post-conflict society. It's a post-agreement society, and that's a very different thing. Now, the con conglomeration of forces is still very much between those who want change, who want a new Colombia, and those who don't. And what worries me is that, in fact, in a lot of local institutions, in the departamentos and the municipalities, there's still a struggle to be waged that, in fact, is going to be 
you know, involved in the implementation of agreements that come out of Havana. So the focus of this particular panel is uh, really on this whole business about you know, the localization of peacemaking and um, how what comes out of Havana is going to be translated into reality on the ground. And we, we've got three eminently appropriate speakers to talk about this. Um, uh, and I'm going to ask, um, I, I, I'm going to ask Casey if she was, so, losing my notes again, <laughs> concomitant of age. Um, uh, I'm going to ask Casey Ehrlich if she will lead off uh, and um, talk to us about uh, her own work and her own experience of looking at local grassroots um, institutions that may have to help in this process of implementing the, uh, the peace that comes out at the elite level that we all hope for and that we've all talked about for the last couple of days. How is it going to work? Is it going to work? What are some of the problems of making it work in, at the local village level, at the level of the municipality, at the level of the departamento? Um, Casey is, is, is working at the moment down in, in Bogota and is planning to move up to Medellin and to uh, Antioquia to have a look at some of the local institutions in eastern Antioquia. Uh, and um, Casey, thank you very much. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you for having me. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank both Lily and Ginny for it. Um, inviting me and for all of you for being here and willing to listen to um, our presentations. So just to give a little bit of context, I'm actually a current grantee, so I'm at the beginning stages of my data collection for my field work, although I have been working on this topic for three years in the PhD program and also did some work on Columbia in my master's thesis before. So. Also to preface this, I am a political scientist and as some of the anthropologists said yesterday, um, they have a tendency to make things more complex. Political scientists have a tendency to oversimplify and to do that in order to determine causality or generalizability. So I will um, try not to oversimplify and also will attempt to bring in some of the comments that people have been making throughout the past two days because I think they're relevant to some of the points I'm going to make. Um, and as Christopher Mitchell said, um, a lot of people mentioned that it's extremely important that whatever happens at the peace accords, the agreements are implemented on a local level and supported at a local level and a lot of these processes need to happen from the bottom up. So my dissertation is actually looking at a bottom up reconstruction process that's happening in a particular area of Colombia, which is an exceptional case, but can still give lessons for us about how that might work and what might affect that. So um, I'm gonna start broadly and then go more specific. Um, the question that I'm trying to answer in my dissertation research is how do the local dynamics of armed conflict, specifically violence and displacement, impact subsequent grassroots peace building efforts? So I'm looking at the village level. Um, do I have a thing? Okay, so before I talk about my empirical research, I wanna give a little background about the theory and also orient us about what we mean by peace. And I think this is, although it seems a little bit esoteric, I think it's really relevant to what we've been talking about because the peace accords in Havana are discussing both components, but people are really focusing on negative peace. What does negative peace mean? It means the cessation of violence, the, the absence of physical violence. So this is, a concept that's based on conventional warfare when two nation states decide that they're gonna stop fighting and you oversee the agreement to lay down arms, you have negative violence um, or negative peace. But 
positive piece refers not only to the cessation of physical violence, but also addresses the structural conditions at the heart of a conflict, both its onset and its endurance. And I think this is really important, an important point, both for what a lot of different panelists have been talking about, structural inequality, unequal access to mechanisms of political power, and the posited binary between human rights and conflict resolution. Um, conflict resolution focuses more on negative peace, whereas human rights focuses more on positive peace because you're looking at how do we address inequality? How do we address the fact that Afro-descendants or women have unequal access to economic and political power? So in an irregular conflict, which I'm going to talk about and which is what we have in Colombia, it's important that we address both <coughs> negative and positive peace. So this is a little bit academic, but I think it's important. Um, a lot of what we think about in terms of peace is premised on conventional warfare, which is based on interstate conflict when you have symmetry of power and you have front lines and rear guards, which means combatants and civilians are separate from one another. And this often means the way we understand women's roles is as victims because they're in the rear guard. In the case of Colombia, which is a paradigmatic example of irregular warfare, as you all know, you have multiple guerrilla groups, multiple armed groups who are paramilitaries or emerging um, bandas criminales, and they have a daily interaction with and dependence on civilians. And this means that women and other civilians are not separate from combat areas. And it's often different, difficult to distinguish between combat and non-combat areas, and it can change very quickly. So when we're thinking about peace, we can't be thinking in the paradigm of conventional warfare. We need to think about the type of conflict that this is and the fact that, as, Jin, um, as Donnie Mirton said, a lot of these people have to live in the same community as the perpetrators of this violence. So it's not two nation states signing a treaty and then they go their separate ways, right? So what am I doing? <laughs> my dissertation research, um, I'm looking at an empirical example of a body of municipalities in the Oriente Antioqueño that were on the front lines of five different armed actors, the FARC, the ELN, and three paramilitary blocs between 1998 and 2006. The dynamics of the conflict have since moved. So I wouldn't say that this is necessarily a post-conflict area, but it's an area in which the paramilitaries were demobilized slash urbanized, went to cities, Medellin, and the FARC and the ELN left this area. And this is an area where you had about 75 to 80% of the people were displaced. Um, you had some people who lived under occupation or were killed, and then in 2006, and to the present, you have people returning to their land and doing small things to rebuild. So for example, agricultural workers have come back to their abandoned land and demined on their own as civilians. Or people have removed dirt from or mudslides from the roads, which is not the same as paving a road, but it's an activity that mirrors infrastructure development, right? So in this, in this process since 2006, the victim's law was passed in 2011. The state, especially the gover government of Antioquia, sees that people are doing this. They start giving resources. So, but they also do this on a village level. So there's a lot of variation across the villages, which is what I'm looking at. So. I'm looking at the process of grassroots peace building. What do I mean by that? I talked about some of the indicators of civilians demining land, perhaps a women's group who are commemorating victims. Someone mentioned the importance of searching for misplaced or displaced or disappeared loved ones. Groups of women have done this in the case of San Carlos specifically. 
So the question is, when do you see when do you see villages and communities engaging in this activity and why? And is it impacted by the village's history with conflict or is it not? And so using the frameworks that we have for top-down initiatives of peace building, I'm studying the, imp the indicators on a grassroots level. So if you have like, if you have basic infrastructure development by the UN, you might see roads paved or buildings rebuilt, but how would that manifest on a local level among communities? So um, my, I have two testable hypotheses, which are two of many, but um, the first idea, and this relates a lot to Michael's work, um, and a lot of the literature on political violence, that the degrees of territorial control over land, regardless, this is different than Michael, <laughs> regardless of the ideology of armed group, has an impact on the way that combatants treat civilians, which affects the way that they relate to one another, which I think has an impact on their potential for working together to rebuild after the violence subsides. I also think that women play a key role in this process, and I can talk a, more, a lot more about that um, in the question and answer session if you want, because I have a gender component in my dissertation. So how do I plan to do this very ambitious project that I'm proposing? <laughs> um, I'm currently in Bogota and have collected um, press archives from 1994 until the present on the 22 municipalities on, in the Oriente Antioqueño from all the different main newspapers. And I'm going through each one and looking at where, which vereda incidences of violence happened and patterns of territorial control between the five groups. And I will soon be moving to the Oriente Antioqueño where potentially I will move beyond the municipality of San Carlos, but my first part will focus on one municipality and look at variation across 76 veredas. And so there is not public information data on vereda level variation. You have a lot of information online from multiple sources on municipal and departmental level data. So um, I hope that this will be a unique contribution that statisticians <laughs> who are better than me can use. Um, I'll do some myself, but Michael can take over from there, <laughs> or other political scientists. Um, and so my expected contributions are, I hope to find an indication of whether or not there's a relationship between village level experiences with conflict and their propensity to rebuild, which I think is really relevant for where we implement, where where a government decides to implement and fund um, small, like more local level administrations in terms of peace building. Because from what I've seen, it seems like when they invest in the low hanging fruit, like Sa San Carlos, it had, has been more successful. Um, of course, this varies dramatically across regions of Colombia, and I'm not trying to generalize to the entire country. Um, Another contribution that I hope to make is develop a framework of grassroots peace building that people working on peace operations from either a national or international level should at least consider before implementing a program because scholarship has shown that one of the reasons many peace building initiatives have failed has been because of a lack of understanding of the local context. And so giving a tool for policymakers to use in order to look at that. Um, and I will leave it at that. Thank you. OK, thanks, Casey. Um, our second speaker, um, when I was uh, told that he was coming in from a foreign country. Uh, I thought that thought they actually meant California, um, but it, uh, Fernando Lopez Alves' uh, affiliation is to the University of California at Santa Barbara, but he's actually visiting us from Argentina, 
uh, and he has uh, for very many years now uh, been the Professor of Sociology and Global and International Studies at Santa Barbara. Um, he's actually um, going to talk to us hopefully about the whole issue of national identity and how it plays into uh, the um, peacemaking progress. So, Fernando, uh, you can't see me, but the floor is yours. Uh, and you're quite right. I can't pass any of these nasty little notices to you that you only have two minutes. <coughs> Are we in contact? No, we're not. Hello. I'm here. Okay, you've got the floor. Can you hear? All right, I hear you. Um, yes, I hear the. Um, yeah, hopefully everybody can hear. Um, well, I'm here. I go. Um, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for doing this on Skype. Thank God for Skype and for high tech. Um, thank you, uh, Jeannie, uh, for this wonderful conference. Thank you, Kelly, for having been patient with me, trying to set me up from here. Um, my work and what I'm going to present today, I'm going to try to be brief and take my eight minutes. I, I was told that I have eight minutes, so I will try to use them as wisely as I can. Um, what I've been working on is the impact of conflict on national identity in Latin America. Uh, one of my cases is Colombia, and uh, the good thing is I have other cases so that we can compare uh, Colombia with other Latin American uh, countries. Um, I am in one of those countries that the prior panel praised for being one of the countries that have taken the peace process seriously. I am in Argentina, and I'm finishing this up. Oh, hopefully, I'm finishing this up. I need more money uh, to finish this up. So if somebody wants to send me a check, or make some donation or contributions, they're all welcome. Uh, it will be for a good cause. Uh, the Institute, of course, uh, I'm sure is very interested <laughs> in his research. Um, so uh, we know that, um, what we know is that uh, national identity is an integrating force. So we know that in cases in which there is not such an integrating force, the national identity is fragmented. Uh, civil conflict will be more likely to occur than in cases in which national identity has been more of a cohesive uh, force, uh, convincing people that they share something in common with one another. That's the idea of national identity, which is different from nationalism in the nation, but that's why institutions, especially state institutions, usually trying to encourage a sense of unity in order to avoid domestic conflict. We know that ethno-nationalism today, for instance, is higher than prior to World War I. We know that fragmented uh, national identities in different countries produce uh, invariable some kind of conflict. And we always look at Latin America as some region in the world in which this national identity question has never been settled, but nonetheless uh, never provoke any major, any major conflict. Um, uh, what I was trying to do, I will try to do with this, is to measure actually the impact of conflict, domestic conflict in this case, civil conflict, like the case of Colombia, such a protracted civil conflict for so many years, to measure that impact on the idea of the cohesiveness of the national identity in Colombia. Um, I'm looking at Bogota only. Uh, this is a project about urban uh, national identity. And definitely, I don't have time for that today, but definitely if you look at the case of Bogota and you look at the case of other Latin American cities, you will see a huge difference from the findings that I get in Bogota and the findings that I get in other, uh, in other Latin American cities, which means that uh, Colombian national identity looks more fragmented in Bogota than in any other Latin American city that I explore. I explore so far Lima, I explore, I'm exploring right now as we speak uh, Buenos Aires, and I explore uh, Colombia last year. These uh, surveys that I will show right now are done in 2012. So uh, Kelly, if you are there and you can hear me, if you can put up uh, the first chart on the PowerPoint, um, uh, which is 
the number one uh, pie chart that I send you, it would be it would be great. So we can go over that quickly. Uh, tell me what it is on because I don't know. I can't see it. It's on. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the first question that I was asking in 2012 in Bogota was um, uh, what the word nation means to you. And this is was a survey done to a thousand a thousand cases. Uh, that's the sample, a random sample of a thousand people. Um, I ran a 700 uh, case uh, sample prior to this in the city of Bogota. It doesn't mean that I got it right. I may have some errors here. The margin of error usually is not very high after a thousand cases, but the margin of error here may be higher. Um, Bogota, as you will know, has uh, been the uh, recipient of a number of immigrants from the interior of Colombia. So this also may capture part of what other uh, inhabitants of Colombia, not only Bogotanos, uh, may know or think they know about their own nation. Um, also, uh, we need to uh, be aware that I'm not going to show you today a breakdown on gender or breakdowns on income or uh, level of education. I don't have the time to do that, but I don't have that data if you're interested. So if you look at that chart, number one chart, in dos o tres palabras, díganos que quiere decir para usted la palabra nación, right? Um, as you know, it's uh, shocking that 40.4 uh, of the uh, uh, of the people that were asked the question said that they didn't know. They didn't know and they had no answer for that. Uh, then there are others in the category others that are grouped in there. There are very dissimilar uh, answers to that question. None of them is hitting uh, the um, the idea of a definition of the nation, right? Uh, look at institutions, which is supposed to be a very important thing for us because trust in institutions has to do with the idea that people think that institutions represent the interests of their communities. Uh, if that trust is broken, usually people don't think that institutions represent their interests, nor that they represent the interests of this community. Of course, it is national identity, no group identity, no ethnic identity, but nonetheless, the, the lower um, uh, number of institutions is shocking. Six uh, percent believe only that institutions represented national identity or something like that. Uh, geography and territory uh, got uh, a 27.9%, but gente cultura, meaning community, because the nation is about not territory, but it's about people, usually in the classic definitions, got only 10.6%. Patrio Bar, 4.7%. So if I look at this chart, obviously, I can argue, we can argue, that there is not very much sense of what the nation means in Bogota uh, today. Of course, this is a hard question, and I know what you're thinking. Maybe you're not thinking that, but maybe you are. And you're thinking, this is a hard question. How many times in our daily lives uh, we are asked to define our nation. If I were to uh, ask that to you today, uh, what does it mean to be whatever, Colombian, American, or whatever, maybe the, the, the answers are, are also very different because this is not something that we are asked every day. So if you can put the second chart, Kelly, I'll be, I'll be grateful. Uh, thank you. Um, in the second chart, then I narrowed down the question down to uh, what does it mean to you ser colombiano, right? Que uh, significa para usted ser colombiano? The gender uh, difference here is a little bit uh, more significant than in the, in the first question. And we can't talk about that in the question and answer period. But uh, as you can see, also shockingly to me, if you compare the figures that I get in Lima and the figures that I'm getting in Buenos Aires right now, uh, 30 uh, percent uh, no that doesn't know doesn't know what ser colombiano today means costumbre um, una cultura look at that that's very low too it's a 6.9 percent of these a thousand cases of Colombians that I asked the question it's really not very hard at all nacer vivir aquí which has to do with territory etc 12 percent look at the 3.2 percent that says una vergüenza or nada, right? A shame or nothing. That's what it means uh, ser colombiano today. Um, ser parte de la nación, respetar las leyes, uh, respect the laws, being part of the nation. Only 
0.6% thought that being Colombian meant, you know, means to uh, respect the law and being part of a larger notion of a nation, which means that uh, I can see discontent here, I can see uh, not a lot of credibility, and I can see a really very low percentages in terms of costumbre, la cultura, modo de ser. Those numbers in the case of Argentina and in the case of Lima and also in the case of Montevideo, which I have a, a kind of a tentative survey down there, are much, much higher. The numbers in Uruguay are the highest of all, which will tell us something about institutions and the way they handle, I think, conflict. Um, the, regarding the panel today, the prior panel that I saw on, online, um, evidently a lot of people were uh, making the point about the conditions of, um, well, uh, of the victims of this conflict and, and how that has not been really resolved. And I think part of these results connect to, to, that, to that bigger question that the prior panel addressed. So if you can go to the third uh, uh, slide, uh, uh, Kelly, um, uh, I guess you have it there now. Um, and so I wanted to be even more concrete. Now, you know, what's the nation is abstract. What is to be Colombiano is a little less abstract, but abstract uh, uh, enough anyway. So what icon, what popular icon would represent to you uh, more faithfully, you know, being Colombiano, what is the identification that you feel with a particular character, a particular icon that you that you know? I thought that you know, uh, leader, uh, sport people would rank really high, uh, but they didn't. In fact, you know, uh, famoso del deporte is 0 0.5. So you know, they don't. There's not very much of a fun <laughs> um, a crowd in Colombia. Um, Presidentes y procesos of the past. Uh, here's where you see, the, of course, the influence of the state, the school systems, etc., that connect us to our founding fathers, to our uh, proceres, right, to those who founded the nation. Uh, but nonetheless, 37.5. And the important thing about this, and curious, that I was, I was thinking, you know, Bolivar was going to rank higher. Uh, and it didn't. And I thought that Santander probably was going to rank lowest, and it ranked higher than I thought. And then other leaders uh, or typical icons of Colombian history, uh, uh, it, were, it was kind of even. When, for example, in Argentina, the same question put San Martin on top. And there is no, no question about San Martin being on top. But here, nobody is on top of anybody else. Uh, maybe it's more democratic that way. But also it tells me that there is no leading figure that Colombians really identify in the past as a founder of their, of their nation. A uh, todos el pueblo is 8%, as you can see that again, the sense of community in that we are all Colombians is kind of broken down because people don't see other people as part of the same kind of identity as they feel they are. Uh, ninguno, 8.3, I mean, there's no icon that represents of being Colombian. Is and leaders actuales, meaning the government, the actual government, 11.8%, which is not really very bad uh, comparing to for example, uh, Argentina, which ranked lower on that account, uh, Argentina ranked lower, uh, but it's not really very high compared to, for example, Uruguay, who ranked much higher on that account. So here is um, also a very fragmented version of what to be Colombia means or what the nation is. If, if you uh, go me to the next chart and have only more charts, two more charts to show and I'm done, and don't uh, not make you suffer anymore. Um, and if all the inhabitants of Colombia went around in the world and went to live to other places, they would be still Colombians. Of course, what I wanted to measure here is whether or not those who left Colombia are considered traitors or not because they didn't go through basically uh, the horrors and the conflict and the peace process, and there are some specific answers to this question that gives me the idea that people believe that those who left are not really as Colombians as those who remain. Um, uh, no, 37.2% said no, that those who abandoned the territory and those who left to other countries or seek, you know, sought refuge in other places are no longer no longer Colombians. Of course, puede ser, no sabe, no contesta, 7.2. And yes, there are Colombians, 54.8. Although, 
you know, it's a very close split here among the, the Colombians that think that those who abandon the country are no longer Colombians and those who think that, yeah, those who are outside the Colombian territory still are nationals, right? If we go to the other and the last uh, slide, please, Kelly, um, maybe you have it already there. In this one is a harder question because I wanted to know if the sense of community still remains a Colombian national community. What that meant is that, for example, the same question meant that, that I asked in Uruguay uh, told me that if all the Uruguayans were going to move outside Uruguay, the new land definitely would be Uruguay. So Uruguayanness or whatever characteristic of that you know, nation that Uruguay means uh, is in the people, not in the territory. It's definitely in the people, not in the territory. In Colombia, as you can see, if all the inhabitants of Colombia uh, went together to another land, will that land be Colombia? Uh, will that land will qualify as Colombia if all the Colombians live there? As you can see, there's a split here. Um, I, I, I see a lot of a lot of attachment to territory and a lot of ideas that tell me that, I mean, I can't reproduce the answers to you, but a lot of the answers give me the idea that really the community, national community, the Colombian national community feels ravaged from inside, broken from inside, and they don't think that they all together exist as such, and therefore they don't think that all together going to a different place could actually take over with them the characteristic of being Colombian. So to close, because I said I have eight minutes and I'm taking 10 uh, for what I can see in my watch here. Um, what we conclude is that in comparison to other Latin American cities, again, I'm looking at cities, not at the larger territory. If I were to look at the larger territory, I'm sure that I'm going to find differences, but I don't have the money to do that. So I'm just doing the cities that I do have the money to do. Um, so um, in this uh, view of cities as um, indicators of whether or not uh, national identity, cohesiveness, social fiber has been broken, uh, whether or not people think of their um, communities as a larger community, uh, meaning the national community, that does not only um, include the little neighborhood, the little village, or the little uh, place in the cities that they live, but includes a larger unit. In that, in that question, Colombia ranked the lowest of all all my cases. I think that it is a cause for reflection as to the consequence of conflict in Colombia. Uh, so far, uh, we thought of the Conservative Party in Colombia and the Liberal Party in Colombia of two versions of this. I mean, different version, different subcultures, but. Both of them coincided that, you know, they were part of the same nation. Maybe we are going back to a 19th century idea in Colombia, which is a divided Colombia that is still is searching to actually consolidate its, its uh, national identity. Uh, but I think the most likely answer to all this is that the conflict and the kind of slow peace process that Colombia has gone through explain this fragmented idea of, of national identity. Thank you very much, and thank you for bearing with me on Skype. Uh, thanks, Fernando. Uh, we'll probably be taking a collection for you at the end. Um, our last speaker um, is Andres Odenthal. Um, about 10 years ago, people started to talk about and write about infrastructures for peace. Now, Andres has actually lived the whole gamut of constructing infrastructures for peace in a variety of countries. He's worked in Uganda, in Acholiland. Uh, he's worked in Nepal. Uh, he's set up local peace committees in a number of countries. But his main, um, his main interest, I think, still remains in his own native South Africa. And he was... Uh, very involved, of course, in the whole business of translating the um, initial agreement uh, with the release of the ANC leaders and Nelson Mandela, and the period which went from there until 1994, I think, uh, before the final agreement about the future of non-apartheid South Africa. So Andres has an enormous amount of um, 
experience, practical experience of local peace building uh, in a variety of countries. So, Andres, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you also to Lily and, and Jenny for really, uh, I mean, all the other people had reason to thank you. I think I have double reason to thank you because you brought me double as far as, as, as other people to be here. I, I appreciate this. Uh, I have to say that uh, I know absolutely nothing about Colombia. I've never been there and uh, I've never in my life known as much as Colombia as now after this, this, this conference. So please don't look at me as a, an expert on Colombia. I'm not. I'm ignorant about Colombia. Um, but I was asked to talk to you a little bit about experiences elsewhere in um, post-agreement contexts, and particularly experiences with local peace building in, in uh, post-agreement contexts. I think you are all very well aware that, that um, peace agreements have about a 50% chance to succeed. So if Colombia is to sign the peace agreement, uh, there is going to be at least, or more or less, 50% possibility that this peace agreement may not succeed and may return, that there may be a return to violence within the first five years of, after, after the signing. And there are a couple of reasons why this is the case. Uh, one of the problems, and that is the one that I will hone in a little bit, one of the, the issues is that uh, peace agreements by their very, very nature are elite agreements, elite pacts between, uh, you know, old men with gray hair sitting in rooms and, and do all sorts of mischievous things. Uh, a peace can only, uh, a sustainable peace, a living peace can only happen when it is owned by the people in, in whose name you have made peace. So when people, it, when that peace is being appropriated by people at the local level, then it, it becomes something that is alive and something that, that, that has a future. And the key question is whether it is possible to, to, to design a peace-building process that will facilitate or support or will help uh, peace hitting the grassroots coming down to the grassroots level. And this is where the whole concept of infrastructures for peace came from. John Paul Lederach was, was using this concept first, and he, he, he talked about this network in societies that, that, that has the capacity to galvanize all the sources that exist within a society and coordinate and galvanize them to, to collaboratively work on, on grounding the peace within, within a community and within a society. Now, uh, having said that, I, I came here to this conference really with an open mind to try and find out whether, uh, try and understand what is happening in Colombia. And, and some of the statements that I picked up, and I'm go only going to repeat a couple of them, uh, confirmed to a large extent what, what I was expecting. Uh, some of the statements that were made here, statements like that there are low levels of trust in the state and in local authorities to provide adequate services. In fact, I think the message that came through is that, is a, and that was confirmed by our, our previous presentation also, very low levels of trust in the state and its institutions. There's resistance to impose solutions from the top and the lack of local, uh, 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 when there is a lack of local consultations. People at the local level seem to behave in Colombia just as they behave in all other places around the world, when they are not consulted, they don't like it, and, and they, they resist that. Um, and then the fact that there are competing interests and needs between various local actors. In other words, it's the local scene is a complex scene, and, and there's variation. There's, there are different needs and interests between peasants, indigenous Afro-Colombians, indigenous people, Afro-Colombians, victims, displayed displaced people, etc., etc., And that these patterns vary from district to district, that there is no one uniform picture of, of 
yes. local conflict. So whereas uh, the master conflict, you know, the master cleavage at, at the top, the master narrative that explains the, the, the uh, conflict at the top, when it hits the ground, we find the fragmentation of that narrative into numerous different narratives that are not unconnected. It, of course, it's connected to the main narrative, but it has its own flavor because of local histories, because of local actors, local interests, local needs, uh, and, and, and local personalities. So it's, it's uh, the, the, the conflicts at the local level, the situation at the local level is not a clone or a copy of what's happening at the national level. It has its own very unique uh, characteristics. I've heard about the, the, the threat of fragmentation of the military forces uh, and, and all that may implement. Uh, and then, and, and let me stop here. I think all of these are, are uh, the type of messages that came through that says to me that the situation in Colombia is pretty close to a, a typology that says that there are three, uh, the post-agreement situation at the local level has got three main characteristics. Um, and, and let me quickly run through these, these three with you. The one thing, the one situation or, or one characteristic of the post agreement situation at the local level is the potential for violence is high. What we find is, is when the armed struggle is, 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 is continuing, we find that armed actors exercise control over their territories that they have under their control. Now you have a peace agreement, and peace agreement means per definition that you give up your exclusive control over that specific territory. And actors will resist this, they will try to resist this, but the fact of a peace agreement means that at least some of your authority over your territory, now you must give up. People in the rural areas live increasingly in a, in a context that is uncertain, where authority is weak, the new uh, uh, patterns of authority have not yet been established, the old is not yet gone, old is not yet gone, the new has not yet come, and, and there is a situation of flux and, and weakness of authority. This, of course, is, a, is an uh, opportunity for violence, and actors will resort to violence for different reasons, opportunistic, or to settle old scores, or to gain, uh, to, to, gain to, to get some gains in the local, struggle, local struggles that, that they have. This will happen. So ex expect a high uh, vulnerability towards violence. Um, secondly, at the local level, we find that violence ruptures the social cohesion of a community. And that it's very often difficult after violence to return to to the same patterns of managing conflict and dealing with differences as existed before. In some ways, violence ruptures uh, the old ways of, of conflict management completely. I mean, in South Africa, after the 76 Soviet, uh, Soweto, uh, Soviet the Soweto uprisings of 1976, after that, the, the whole paradigm of race-based authority has been overturned, and there was no return to that. To this day, there's absolutely no way that we can return to that paradigm anymore. The paradigm has shifted completely. And to a bigger or a lesser extent, that happens also in, in, in most societies that experience violence. The old way of dealing with conflict doesn't work anymore. We need, we need to craft new ways of dealing. We need new rules new procedures for dealing with conflict among ourselves. And, and thirdly, um, conflict or, or violence in, in, in local communities is, is known for its, its devastating effect. Um, there's this famous quote from the, the book by Stover and Weinstein, My Neighbor, My Enemy, where he made the observation, 
or, or this is a quote from uh, one of the respondents, a uh, Croat res uh, respondent, who said, Milosevic, President Milosevic, did not kill anyone here in Vukovar. Our neighbors were killing. Our neighbors were raping and looting and destroying our society. It's not Milosevic who did this. It's the guy who has been with me in school. It's the guy who played soccer with me. He raped my daughter. It's the guy with whom I have worked all along for so many years in the same job. He murdered my wife and burned down my, 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 my house. And, and this is the intimacy of, of civil war violence that, that Status Kalivas wrote about so, so eloquently. Um, it's, the violence has become intimate. And, and, and now suddenly we have a peace accord and the people right there at the top, they shout down and they give instructions. You people at the, in the villages there, now we have made peace. Please forget about everything that happened now. Go and shake hands and uh, be nice from now. Please just continue and don't make any nonsense. Of course it is not happening. It is not going to happen. So when we talk about local peace building and, and the ability to deal with all these tasks that are going to, to be uh, devolved down the line to the local level, we, we, we are talking about the need for a mechanism that can prevent violence, can help a community to prevent violence, further violence. We, need, we have a need for a mechanism that can help a community that has been broken apart by, by violence, help that community to find consensus on new ways to deal with conflict amongst themselves. And we need mechanisms that will help local communities to deal with the high emotional quality of the conflict they have with each other. And, and what sort of mechanism is that? Uh, that is the point. And, and we are talking about communities that, that are normally deprived of all the, the nice resources that people have in, in the cities and, and that will be tasked to, to, to perform, that will have to perform all these tasks. So it's, a, it's an almost impossible uh, challenge. The, um, what, what I've studied and that, what I've worked with over the past couple of years was with what, what is called the, the infrastructure of peace committees. Now, peace committee is a, is, is a name that I don't like, but so don't get focused on that. But what we need is we need an infrastructure that will make it possible for local peace committees to collaborate with others and with the national level in building peace. The idea that we have to make a choice between uh, top-down peace building or bottom-up uh, peace building, that is a false choice. It's a false choice. There is no peace, no peace can be built right from the bottom up without the involvement of the national level and vice versa. We need the interaction, we need the collaboration, the linkage between national level and local level to, to achieve this task. And one way of achieving it is, is to have at the national level a, a, a body, a, a committee, a commission, a council that has its, uh, that's been rooted in the national peace agreement that gets its mandate from the national peace agreement <coughs> and that takes responsibility for the peace building process. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> And then to have this type of structure replicated at the local level with very strong linkages between all, all these bodies. And, and let me conclude this because I suspect my time is running out. What the local peace committees have to do, the main task is, the, is to facilitate dialogue and, and to mediate. Uh, it's important to understand if you have at the local level a body of people who are inclusive, who are representative of the various sections of society, they, they have been brought together in a process, um, 
and they now have the task to build peace. They cannot do that through coercion because they don't have the power to coerce, any, coerce anyone. They can't do that through arbitration because, again, they do not have the, the mandate or the power to arbitrate. The only mechanism, the only methodology they have is the methodology to facilitate dialogue, the capacity to bring people together who have to talk in order to solve the problems that, that, that this community is experiencing. So it is an, it's, a, it's a mechanism that relies almost exclusively on its ability to build consensus, to mediate, to, to facilitate dialogue, and in this way to, to, to create the rudimentary social cohesion within a com community that will make all the other tasks of governing and, and state building and reconstruction that has to happen, that will make it possible. Um, a last point before I, before I conclude. I think one of the best investments that, that we can make in the, in the area of local peace building is an investment in a group of facilitators, experts, uh, that have to be located at the national level under the authority of the National Peace Council or whatever you call it, that have um, really exceptional aptitude and skill in facilitating dialogue and in mediating. And to equip them with the mandate to service the local peace committees. Because you cannot expect a, a group of local people who have been traumatized as they were to pull them up by their own bootlegs and now suddenly begin to deal with all these highly traumatic and difficult issues that they have to, to deal with. They need help. They need professional help. They need expert help. They need the best type of help that they can get. And, and if I were you, if I can give you one little bit of advice, if I were you, I would at this stage begin to do the development and begin to invest in the development of this group of people and begin to lobby for their placement within the peace building system. So that, because this is what is going to make or what is going to help and facilitate uh, real dialogue at the local level, get people at the local level really to talk to each other in a way that they have not yet talked to each other before and help them to begin to bridge uh, the differences that to this uh, they have kept them apart. So it's an idea of, and I'm thinking of, in my own experience, you know, one person, one professional person can cater three to five local peace committees. I don't know how many districts you have in Colombia, but you can make the calculation. One person, one individual for three to five uh, districts, get those people trained, get them equipped, lobby for their, for, for their uh, implementation, because these are the people I believe that will enable local peace building in a way that is, is really, that will be more effective than just have this naive expectation. Uh, there are actually two naive expectations. The one naive expectation is, is the expectation of those people who say that peace will trickle down. Once the elite have made peace, then it will trickle down. You know, it's almost like the, the, the economists who also believe in this mysterious trickling down of of the goodies to the poor. It, it, it happens in some cases that peace does trickle down. In some districts, it's sufficient that the big guys have made peace and they just continue with their work. But communities that have really been traumatized, it's unlikely that peace will just trickle down. And, and the other naivety is that you can think that local communities are these somehow mysterious communities who have these mysterious capability to do things that people at the <coughs> national level can't do. But you know, national people at the national level can't reintegrate people. But let's, let's devolve it to the local level. They will know how to reintegrate these people. How will they know if the people at, at the national, national level don't know? So we have to plan 
about how to do these things, and I think it's, it's uh, yeah, I think I've said enough. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andres. Um, okay, we've um, got about 15 minutes before it's lunchtime, so we'll take questions. Uh, can we? Uh, no, I'm not going to start with you. <laughs> Lassie, Lassie at the back? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, forget it. <laughs> Mary Small with Desert Refugee Service. My question is actually um, about the Global Peace Committees. Um, and so I was wondering if you had any recommendations or thoughts about how to actually form those committees. Um, I was in many ways persuaded by what you were talking about, the work of those committees once they are created. Um, but particularly in the aftermath of the Victims Law, part of the implementation of that is creating local committees to do that implementation at the local level. And those committees have in many cases been very contested. Um, in terms of membership and, in some cases, co-opted. And so any recommendations you have about the actual formation of the local peace committees would, would be helpful. OK, we'll take a couple more while we're about it. Uh, John? Uh, yeah, I, let me thank uh, the panel. This was fascinating. And I, in terms of the concepts and ideas that were tossed out, um, and I have one question, I, I guess, for Fernando. Uh, the, the, the sample of 1,000, okay, that you use for, for, for Bogota, what was the universe from which you drew that sample? Okay, um, hang yeah, on. I Fernando, hang on. Me, I yeah, hang um, on. The, um, uh, I, we hire an uh, agency in Colombia who does uh, surveys. And uh, it was a telephone survey um, done with a thousand cases. They ran a sample first of 700 uh, cases in the city of Bogota. Um, the universe uh, will will be a selected sample uh, by um, phone numbers and regions of the city. Um, they uh, done this uh, before. Um, so uh, the, the margin of error in a thousand cases would be 4.2, 4.3 margin of error on those thousand cases. Um, so yes, the universe uh, done was only the city of Bogota and different uh, regions of the city. And we, um, well, I didn't do the uh, prior study the sample, like hire somebody who did it. But um, they did take into account, of course, you know, differences in income, education, uh, uh, social class, uh, etc. Within the city of Bogota, we never went out of the city of Bogota to leave, to do anything um, extra. Thank you. Um, do you guys want to take up the question about um, starting up local peace committees? Well, the one the one way not to start them up is 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 not to send faxes from some head office and say form a, a local peace committee. And, and I know of a case where that happened. Um, the the formation of a local peace committee is a very important event, and the manner in, in which it is formed is it's actually a mini peacemaking uh, procedure. So. It's another reason why you must have experts available in the system to, to, to help with this. Um, I think it's important um, to have very deep consultations with all the important stakeholders in the local community around this, what is explain the concept to them, respond to their fears, respond to their concerns about this, uh, talk through them, talk them through this whole thing and you do this with each one of the various constituencies until you have a sense that there is a measure of willingness to experiment with this. And then you can bring them together and they must come together to the table with a fairly strong mandate from their constituencies saying that yes, we are willing to, to, to collaborate with this. Uh, and, and then you have a fairly strong mandate from that specific community that yes, we want a local peace committee, but even then, you can never take it for granted that that mandate is now cast in stone because it, it will be a fluid mandate that can change from moment to moment and from day to day. 
it helps if this mandate, this legitimacy that you have is also um, supported by a mandate from the top level. So this is the type of thing that I have investigated and that I've myself worked in is, is, is a situation where at the, when the peace agreement was signed, it was stated in the peace agreement that we legitimize or we're going to mandate local bodies to implement certain peace building tasks. So when you have that legitimacy from the top and you have local buy-in into that process, then you have a fairly strong mandate for the local peace committee. <coughs> Uh, but it is very important to do your groundwork very well. And if you don't do that, you're going to end up very soon with, uh, with egg on your face and possibly some other stuff also. Um, let me just add one thing to what Andrew said because your question sort of jogged my memory about ways in which in the late 90s and the early 2000s, uh, local peace communities started up in, in Colombia successfully. And they often, I think, learned from other places as models. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, uh, the municipality in Mogotes, which actually provided a kind of a template for a lot of other local communities to say, hey, you know, if, if these guys can do it, then maybe we can do it as well. And uh, can we get somebody from over there to come and tell us how they did it and what things to avoid? And, and that, you know, that can actually be a, a process to a actually get a structure going. All right, Ginny, I guess it's your turn next. <laughs> how many questions have you got this time? <laughs> Testing, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to monopolize the questions. It's just I've brought all these people here, and I have so many questions that I've wanted to ask them, and this seems to provide a forum for doing so. Um, again, thank you to the panelists. It's been to all of you, and from uh, Fernando, I hope you're feeling better. I appreciate your being here, despite physical difficulties as well. Um, a couple of questions. I think the first one, Fernando, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the gender dimension of your investigation into national identity. What, where were the er areas where you saw differences emerge about how women or men felt about being Colombian? Um, and how do they compare to other, other places? Um, a cautionary word, I guess, on this last question of how do, you, how do you design and create local peace committees? Colombia is highly organized. It has a wonderful, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a peace movement because it's not necessarily coherent as a peace movement, but within many communities where there's been a lot of violence, there have been local responses of community organizing. And it's really important in this next phase not to overlook those and try to recreate something um, from nothing. There's lots to work with in Colombia, and it's really important to build on what's already there. Um, and Andres, Andres, I'd love to hear you tell us a little bit. I've read some of your, your stories of how you got engaged in the local peace committee in your own situation, because I think it really sheds light on the kinds of difficulties and challenges that Colombians will face at the local level um, and, and the, the kind of unexpected uh, benefits of having these um, communities come together to think about how to prevent the violence that they know is likely to be unleashed in the aftermath of an accord. And then finally, a question for Casey also, the gender dimensions of your own research, which, I mean, everybody has done something on gender and nobody's bringing it to the table, so I want to hear it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, can we take one, one more question while we mull over those gentlemen down there? I guess I'm getting my turn to uh, Tom Bama, Catholic Relief Services. I just wanted to ask, uh, Casey, in, in your study site, it seems like it may be a real outlier in many respects in Colombia. It seems there was a huge amount of displacement, and also it sounds like there's a fairly high rate of return. Uh, and I'm wondering how you uh, attribute those. Um, how, how do you attribute well, not so much the huge amount of displacement, but the level of return seems fairly high. And what, what uh, do we take to account for that level of return? Okay, so I'll start with um, the gender question. Um, so 
One of the things I'm looking at is the historical dimensions of the conflict in a disaggregated way. So not just looking at levels and types of violence, but also who the victims were. But not just victimization, because I think it's really easy to essentialize gender and make women the victims, especially because a lot of what we think about, as I said previously, about war is a situation in which there's male combatants and women stay behind in, behind the front lines in the rear guard. In the situation of Colombia, women face an array of choices that, well, this is my perspective on how human behavior works. So that's an assumption of behavior that I'm putting out there. But I believe that women have choices despite the fact that they're in a, con a conflict context. And that can include displacement. It can include joining combat. It can include resistance or support of different armed groups. And that can happen in an informal way within the sphere of their own home. For example, they can refuse to get, give information to a particular armed group, or they can choose to give information to a particular armed group. They can house and shelter combatants. They can choose not to do so. These are all forms of agency that are not indicative of simply being victims. And the implication for that in the post-conflict context is that we can't, whether we're thinking about demobilization programs or simply women who are civilians <coughs> caught in the conflict, we have to understand that they have agency and they're not simply victims who need to be treated as recipients of state or elite assistance. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done on demobilization that shows that women are often framed as needing to return to normalcy, to the, to the state of an innocent victim, um, and that they are in bush marriages or forced into collaboration. And I think that undermines female agency. And that's not a normative statement that I think they should be combatants. What I'm saying is that there needs to be recognition that women have choices. In the, in the conflict context and the post-conflict context. So this is something that I'm looking at in what I see as a relationship between the conflict dynamics and the post-conflict peace process from the bottom up. Um, the second question from the man from the Red Cross, is that right? No, Catholic really? <laughs> Had I, R, C. Um, so, you are absolutely right. This is an outlier um, within the context of Colombia. And it's an outlier both in the sense that it had a unique conflict experience, the Oriente, and it also has a unique post-conflict trajectory. Um, so your question was, why do I think people are returning to this area? Right? So. I don't think that this is some miracle of peace building that's going to spread to the rest of Colombia. I think it's a unique situation in which the three paramilitary blocs were demobilized, which means they went to the cities and probably became another type of combatant. Sorry, that's cynical, but empirical evidence shows that's true. Um, and then the ELN and the FARC moved. So they weren't beat by the Colombian government necessarily. They moved to a different area and the area was abandoned and it was pretty safe. So people started coming back and starting to rebuild. So the reason I'm looking at it is because it's a unique opportunity in the context of an ongoing conflict to understand how people might initially in the absence of the state and then in interaction with the state rebuild without having necessarily a mandate from above. So that's, did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah, so that's a huge issue for all the land repatriation, the victim's law implementation. A lot of it has not been done and can't be done because of security. So it's a unique situation. Fernando, uh, comments, uh, responses? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, to the question about gender, um, I had, well, I mean, the, the, the prior question I didn't answer very well because I couldn't figure out what the question really was. And I think it was the universe, and the universe were people older than 18 years old 
residents of the city of Bogota. I thought, you know, the question was about the composition of the sample, but the universe, that was the universe. Um, uh, regarding the gender question, this is something we need to think about. It's, it's very interesting to me. I, not in a position of drawing conclusions that are definite at this point, but I think it will trigger your imagination to, to, to hear this. Um, in the first question, if you remember what the word nation means to you, that was the first question. Uh, there, people broke even. The gender uh, difference didn't seem to make much difference in the answer. And those who say no, I don't know, and those who say yes and gave some kind of answer, uh, both of those groups were uh, the breaking the break between women and men were was even. But now, in the question, what is for you to be a Colombian, 65% of women had a answer to give, uh, while the same was not true for men. Men hesitated more about what to be a Colombian me meant, while women gave uh, more of an assertive answer, 65% of them said that they knew what to be Colombian uh, meant. Uh, in terms of the icons that were, uh, and this is another interesting thing, in terms of the icons that people pick to represent what uh, some of them meant in terms of being Colombian, uh, the two genders broke even again. So uh, I was thinking about probably a uh, more of a preference among men for sport figures or things like this. I couldn't find that. They, they broke pretty much even. But now, uh, listen to this, and this is very important. Um, if Colombians were to leave Colombia, uh, the, the territory of Colombia, and were those people that left still be Colombians, uh, a majority of women uh, uh, answered no to that question. The majority of women answered no to that question. The breakdown was about 68% against, you know, uh, the rest of it in that universe. So I don't know whether that means that women are feeling more the idea that those who left are not going through the same process they go through. Speculation on my part at this point, but I think it's an interesting difference. And in the other one, uh, if all the inhabitants of Colombia were going to go to another land, would that land be Colombia? Meaning, will they carry on with them the Colombianness uh, of which they are a part? In that one, uh, again, women were a majority saying, yes, those who left Colombia uh, will be still Colombian. So it's kind of contradictory between chart number three and number four. Uh, there are things here that I still don't understand about the answers, uh, but definitely there are differences between men and women regarding a number of questions. And I think we need to think about that and we need to think comparatively and look at the other surveys that I've done in other cities and looking, for example, the survey of Buenos Aires, which I have right here, and I just finished doing that survey right here. And there's a huge difference between men and women in the city of Buenos Aires as to the same questions, differences that don't coincide with the differences in gender that I see in, in Bogota. But as I said, you know, up to this point, uh, it's all speculation on my part, but there are, there are interesting, interesting differences. Thanks. Andres? <clears throat> well, I see we are in injury time now, so if I really start telling you my life story, you will have to postpone lunch. <laughs> 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 just just one short, very short comment. <clears throat> the one thing that I really experienced is that, and I think this is the magic of, this is part of the magic of these local peace structures or whatever you, you call them, is that the moment when you, um, the moment you are, are, are allocated the responsibility for peace, for peace building in your community, it, it, it brings a completely new dimension. I mean, I was the type of guy, when I come across a fight, you know, I just pass it by and then, you know, I, I like my peace. And suddenly now I have the responsibility for peace building. So when I see smoke coming up out of a, of a building, I can't just drive past. It's my responsibility to go there and find out what's happening here. And how can we how can we defuse this thing that is building up here? Who should be brought to this place? Who should be called to come and help? What that is my responsibility. 
And I think that is the, 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 the magic of, of an infrastructure for peace where you formally um, de-escalate, and that's not the right word, when you formally um, go to the local level and you really make local people, an inclusive body of local people, responsible, collectively responsible for this peace building. There's, there's a lot of, of uh, I think, magic in that. Bon appétit. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I'm sorry, for those of you who actually want to learn a little bit more about Andres and his life story and his thinking, come join us tomorrow morning because we're actually having a book launch of his latest work published by USIP Press, which is called, as a subtitle, Local Peace Committees and National Peace Building. Uh, so thank you to all of our panelists very much. Uh, and uh, as Andres says, bon appétit. Good afternoon. Um, apologies that we're running late, but on the other hand, the conversations, public and private, are so wonderful that <clears throat> in some ways, um, it would, well, in many ways, it really would have been a shame to disrupt them. So we're going to get back to our final panel now and then a final discussion. I just wanted to take a minute to um, give a shout out to uh, Ginny Bouvier the um, presiding spirit here and in our um, Latin American and Columbia work at USIP. And while I really doubt she needs an introduction um, to most of you, I did just want to uh, give a few points because she's going to be the moderator for the panel. As she has been here at USIP since 2003 and has this um, split or double personality. I'm very proud she's worked. Um, sh a lot of the, you know, many, many of the successes of the fellows program were due to the fact that Ginny was one of um, the program officers um, together with me for, um, for many years before she was finally allowed to focus full time on Latin America. Um, she has experience at many other institutions, WOLA being one of them, um, University of Maryland, and she's been um, uh, a uh, consultant for many other organizations from the World Bank to um, Levi Strauss uh, company. And <clears throat> she is also the author of a USIP book, uh, Columbia Building Peace in a Time of War. She's the editor of what I think is a very important collection. And it's, going, it's, it's on sale today, so I, I hope you all will, uh, will consider buying it. It's a wonderful, um, for me, it was a wonderful introduction and mapping um, to a very deep and complex uh, conflict. So we're, we're all very proud of, of the production of that book. And she's also a blogger. Her blog is Columbia Calls, for those of you, you who don't know. And she's uh, written many other pieces over the years uh, for inside the institute publications as well as outside. So uh, I just wanted to take a few seconds to say, to say that introduction and also to thank Ginny for an enormous amount of, of work and all her wisdom and, and connections in this field and putting together this event and hand over the panel to her. Thank you. I think I'll, I'll speak from the table since my role is really uh, to moderate and also to introduce. First, I want to thank Lily for her partnership in putting this together and also Kelly McCone, who is in the back over there. Um, it's been a great experience to collaborate with you and it's also been wonderful to renew contact with so many of the USIP family members who are kind of stretched throughout the hemisphere right now and across other parts of the world as well. Um, I wanted to say a couple of words. This next panel will be looking at um, kind of looking to the future in Colombia beyond the peace accords and what some of the issues might be that are emerging from the peace accords. Um, George Lopez, who has just joined us at USIP this past week as the new vice president for our Academy of International Peace Building, International Conflict Management and Peace Building, um, has tremendous experience around the issue of delisting. You know, what do you do with foreign terrorist organizations who have been, or organizations that have been labeled as foreign terrorist organizations? How do they get named to that category? And how do they get out of that category? And of course, if you have, a, have peace talks, this question becomes very important, and it's one that I think hasn't been dealt with in Washington at least, um, maybe behind closed doors in some scenarios they're talking about it, but I don't think it's been uh, really put into the public debate yet in DC, and perhaps not, certainly not in Colombia. 
Um, and Ryan Burgess will be speaking. Ryan is a former peace, peace fellow, peace scholar, but he was actually one of the few and one of the first peace scholars to have residence at USIP, so we enjoyed his company for quite a while. Um, and he has looked at questions of education, and I think this is one of the missing pieces that hasn't been touched in this conference, and that I think in many post-conflict or post-accord environments is really one of the last to be dealt with, but one of the most important in some ways. Um, how do you teach about the conflict within the school structures and the school systems? Mm -hmm. Often ministries of education become heavily involved in, you know, what do you do about the textbooks that kind of perpetuate um, st stigmatized images of different sectors of the population? How do you kind of go through those and create new public um, teaching tools and, and curriculums that can help to contribute to a spirit of reconciliation in the aftermath of a conflict or once there's a peace accord sign, signed. And Brett Troyan is going to talk to us about the experience in Kauka and what can be learned from indigenous organizing. This is something we haven't talked about yet in the last two days, um, but indigenous <laughs> organizing has much to teach us um, about techniques and tools that can be used in the future to create a more inclusive environment and to create reconciliation. She's going to be talking about a particularly conflicted area of Colombia, Cauca. Um, so I think I will, rather than make a lot of, I do have some prepared remarks, but I think that given the, the time frame that we have, I'd prefer to just go directly to the panelists and then maybe save my remarks for afterwards or for the, uh, the concluding session. So why don't we start with George Lopez? Oh, I should say, you have, you have their formal bios. I've given you kind of a generic um, who they are. Haven't really properly introduced, but George is, just to say that he comes from USI, to USIP after 27 years at the Kroc Institute of Notre Dame, uh, where he was the Reverend Theodore Hesburgh Chair in Peace Studies. Um, his research has been focused primarily on problems of state violence, economic sanctions, violations of human rights. Um, he is a renowned author and editor, and I think has, I heard of George Lopez long before I ever met him, mainly from his students. He's been a, an incredible mentor, and many of the people around town, if you scratch the surface just a little bit, you'll find that they're students of George Lopez, and we're delighted to have him here. So maybe we'll start with his introduction, then I'll introduce the others as they come up. Thanks, Jenny, and uh, thank you all for being part of these marvelous two days. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here this morning or, or yesterday, but I'm delighted to be on this panel. Um, much of my practical scholarship and government interaction over the last two decades has been in the area of economic sanctions. First, trying to work on the dynamic in which this tool can remain essentially nonviolent, even though it's economically coercive that it might remain humane and not affect innocence. So I worked a lot in the humanitarian sector of the Iraqi sanctions and then became engulfed in a variety of other, particularly United Nations sanctions regimes. Also then became involved in how do you take sanctions off? What are the intended and unintended consequences of that process? And uh, have had some considerable interactions over the years with the good people across the street, including now the new division of sanctions at the State Department, but especially with the U.S. Treasury Department, which has, in the U.S. context, the greatest power, authorization, and reach for extending and imposing sanctions on various targeted individuals and companies. One of the hallmarks of change in sanctions regimes and which gave rise to what we call the listing process occurred in the mid to late 90s where in the wake of imposing sanctions on governments like the government of Milosevic in Yugoslavia, the government of Iraq under Saddam Hussein and the like, the United States, the UN and then later the EU moved to a system in which you were engaged in the so-called smart sanctions which was an attempt to target individuals that were seen as most responsible for the abhorrent actions, whether they be violations of human rights, engagement in criminal activity, fomenting unrest within a country, diamond smuggling, trafficking, any number of dynamics like that. This targeting of individuals and entities 
rather than whole nations, was seen as one of the more humane and, and more intelligent ways to do the sanctions business. In some respects, in closing out the ability of the Charles Taylor regime to continue to run two wars at, simultaneously in Liberia and Sierra Leone and be adventuresome in some other areas, these things proved quite fruitful. But when push comes to shove, as it invariably does, one of the questions that gets emerging in peace discussions is, under what conditions do you end sanctions on targeted individuals and companies, especially in light of the development of a peace process? This takes on added difficulty and dimension in the U.S. context with a country like Colombia, where in a post 9-11-2001 world, many of the designees on these lists are seen under the foreign terrorist organizational list, or more extensively under what's called the Kingpin Act, which is the treasury designation for those who are in foreign narcotics kingpin designation, that is traffickers and those associated with traffickers. In many respects, if you're in the law and order realm of activity in Colombia and bent on restoring rule of law and worried that we've had low success in bringing full civil peace to countries that are dominated by, by drug syndicates, an act like the Kingpin Act is, is, is very, very useful. It finds ways to isolate that sector, deny it access to banking and other commercial activities. It's also the case that it became increasingly controversial over the last decade because it was not only those who were engaged in the primary activity who became the target of designation, but increasingly entities and individuals and companies who dealt with those who dealt with the kingpins. So you might be an unwitting local bank, finding yourself beset with some laundering that you didn't know about and be designated on a treasury list. There'd be certain ways to get off that list, but you couldn't lose the reputational dynamic of having been once listed on the list. More importantly for many of us, the peace building sector, which was trying to have the local dialogues across groups, which was trying to engage at the larger regional and national level, was constrained in coming out of states like the United States where we couldn't put at the table members of the FARC, AUC, ELN, because they were on the list. The dilemma was brought to a legal pinnacle here in the United States with a Supreme Court case filed by the um, international humanitarian community, and in particular, a humanitarian agency that engaged in lots of good human rights training for folks who were on the list. And they were told that under the US Patriot Act, you, in fact, could be held liable for cooperation, collaboration with a, a terrorist organization. So that was a period that was quite difficult for many of us in 2009, 2010. The question it poses going forward in Colombia, it seems to me, is that while there's been a dramatic increase in the number of exceptions that have been granted under Treasury, those are not by way of a standard rule of law designation process. They're done on an ad hoc petitioning process where you try to get your organization the space it needs to deal with certain actors. Or you can present evidentiary basis the way a very prominent collie based uh, football soccer club did in April to Treasury and say, look, none of our funds for this club any longer go through any entities that had anything to do with the park under any conditions. Please let us travel and go play soccer. And you can get off the list. But one of the most difficult things in a time in which the larger community is coming to peace, the larger community recognizes the boundaries of who are the bad guys and who are not, and the larger community longs for the prospects of economic development, all of that is tied up and constrained often by the dynamic of how do we get entities that have been on the sanctions list as designees of collaborators with the original designees off the list. And it's a very complex, very difficult, and sometimes not 
admiringly due process kind of enterprise. So I see as one of the great obstacles to peace being, in the Colombian case, what you do with people of reasonably goodwill who do not have criminal ties or have renounced criminal ties in the past and who are trying to run rather legitimate businesses, how do they take advantage of the protection zones that are now permitted by a peace process where you're not under fear and intimidation of criminal organizations and therefore not cooperating or not, not cowed into cooperation? How do you widen that space for viable actors and get them off the lists? The lessons are few and far between. The United States and Russia created a deal uh, two years ago whereby they would separate the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban list under the uh, very large, far-reaching UN sanctions and created a rubric where if you were Taliban who could show that you had not engaged in the last two years in active hostilities against NATO or US forces on the ground, and if you were willing to come to negotiations with regional or national government to talk about peace, you could, your, your, your membership on the list could be suspended. And then after your behavior was monitored, then you ultimately could be taken off the list. That's one of the most successful process delistings. In Liberia, what the United Nations did was it essentially handed the new duly elected government of Liberia a list of folks who had been still retained on the list as gun runners and uh, engaged in uh, in particular, increased activity towards violent conspiracy against the new government. And if they came in and renounced those particular activities, if they were part of a DDR process, and after six to nine months of monitoring showed that they were in fact no longer a threat to the democratic government, they could get off the list. So what the Columbia situation begs for, really in the nitty gritty of the relationship between the United States and the government of Columbia, is what organizations and individuals who evidence shows are still engaged in narcotics and criminal activity need to stay on the list, but what other substantial number of people need to be able to be certified to get off the list and become part of the peace process, be part of the reconstruction of civil society, be part of the opening of space, particularly for economic and other kinds of development. So I think that's a challenge. There's no schematic formula before. There's analogs to Afghanistan and to Liberia. But I think this is something that's going to be invented as it goes along. External organizations, aid organizations, groups in the United States can facilitate this process greatly by dialogue with the Treasury Department, by dealing with partners in Colombia who find themselves in this situation and helping to certify their activities over the last couple of years, and by showing that their engagement with legitimate banking, financial, and other structures that don't at all collaborate with the criminal networks that Treasury and the U.S. government is quite and legitimately concerned about. Thank you. Thank you, George. I think you've, you've touched on a number of the themes that came up in yesterday's panel on the, on the drug trafficking and criminal network activity, and I think the question of how you deal with people who have been engaged in these kinds of activities um, and its relationship to how you deal with human rights violations is a very interesting one that mm -hmm. I think has kind of permeated many of the, the presentations in the last couple of last two days. Um, let's turn now to Ryan Burgess. Um, Ryan is a former USIP peace scholar um, and is currently at the Inter-American Development Bank where he's a specialist in the education division, uh, currently working in the country office of Trinidad and Tobago. He's worked as an education program manager, consultant, and researcher with UNICEF and the NGOs in Latin America, the Caribbean, Eastern Europe, Middle East, Africa, and the Caucasus. Um, he has a master's and doctorate in international education development from Teachers College in Columbia University. And while he was here, his project was looking at uh, kind of options and curriculum and educational opportunities for young people, particularly displaced youth and youth who are in conflict zones. I think that's an area that has had very little attention, and I'm looking forward to hearing what kinds of ideas you have for Columbia today. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, first, I do want to thank, thank Jenny, Lily, Kelly as well and for inviting me here and to be able to participate in this forum. Um, for me, it is a great opportunity. I enjoy being back here and to also hear the different perspectives related to what's going on in Colombia. And my focus is going to be more on 
the effects of conflict and violence on children and youth. And that's the area that is, has always been an interest for me in terms of how do you work with children and youth in these difficult circumstances? What are the effects of violence and conflict on children and youth? And what needs to happen to continue to support them along the way? And <clears throat> I know that discussions here are focusing on what happens after a peace accord may be signed or after a post-conflict Colombia. When we talk about uh, education, that's a topic that, that does not start when peace arrives, but rather something that's ongoing during and is also considered during a conflict situation in terms of offering children and youth of a space a space for normalcy, a safe, a safe space within a conflict. So it, there are differences as to what happens when a conflict ends, but it is something the, that is considered during when a conflict is also taking place. Just to share with you a couple of numbers of what's happening in Colombia in relation to children and youth. Uh, we've heard the, that, that about five million people have been displaced in, the, in, the, in Colombia. Of those, 40 or 50% are children. You also have approximately 14 and 17,000 children that have been involved in the, in the different armed groups in Colombia. And, uh, and we also know that a large, number, a, a, large, a large number of young people, or a large number of those who are in the armed groups joined at a very young age. So we heard the number yesterday from Jim, jo Jim Jones about 66% uh, joined between 10 and 19 years of age. Those are all and the last point I want to refer to what Michael Weintraub mentioned today about the different kinds of victimization because that also, all of that does have an effect as to what happens within an education um, response. The education, the important, the reason why I, in, in, why I chose to, to focus on education is because to me that's one space where you can work with children and youth in, that are facing different adversities. And when we look at what happens when a child is affected by violence, what happens when you live under a chronic stress or a chronic crisis situation, that's a pr that takes place over, over several decades. And this is a, a table that comes out of an, an AC, the ACE study was also included in the U.S. government's document on the action plan for children in, ad in adversity, where if we go back to what taught to children's experiences, when they grow up in adverse circumstances and it's, cr uh, and it's chronic, over time things just keep getting worse. And you can go back to, if you have a 17-year-old who's not doing well and you go back to what, how they've been living those 17 years, you can see the accumulation of these risks uh, piling up. And this is one of the, what has been seen as some of the effects of living difficult uh, childhood experiences. And the more exposure that you have to violence, the higher, it, the likelihood that you yourself will also be, become more aggressive. The, another important point in terms of a chronic crisis or conflict over decades is that it tends to, it tends to cross different levels. When you have violence taking place at a broader community, it tends to, you, the levels of violence and aggression within families tends to increase, the levels of aggression within schools tends to go up as well. In a couple of years ago, Enrique Shoves, who does a lot of work in Colombia, did a survey in schools regarding aggression. And in his survey, 38% of the students reported being the victim of verbal abuse the week prior to, to the survey. 33% a victim of physical aggression during the last month, 56% a victim of robbery during the school year, and one out of four, 25% had known other students bringing uh, different types of arms to school, and one out of 10 were afraid to go to different parts of the school. So the fear permeate, permeates the different levels within, within the society, within the different environments of the children. When we add on to that, um, the what's happening in terms of their cognitive development um, and where they are in the school system. In an international exam in Colombia, only half of the students exhibited the level, an adequate level in, in language, writing, and mathematics that would be appropriate, that is required for a productive living. 
when we say if more than if if more than half of the uh, half of those in the armed groups enter between 10 and 19 years of age, that also tells us that many of those may not have finished primary school, many may not have even started primary school. Others may have been in primary school, maybe maybe started secondary school or dropped out. So that. So there, there are factors to consider as well in terms of where they are, as was mentioned yesterday, in their life cycle. And the, I mentioned a few of the, the factors that are affecting the students. One has, and these are a number of areas that affect students in terms of increasing the likelihood of either joining an armed group, dropping out of school, getting into drugs, different factors. The more factors, risk factors that you encounter, the higher the likelihood of, 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 of increasing aggression. At the same time, when we look at the protective factors, and this will get into what the response may be through education, having role models, community programs, strong social network, family support, and your own and the, own, and the resilience of the children makes a big difference in terms of the response. And it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. If you, ha you can have a strong role model that could have that could help decrease the, the negative impact of multiple risk factors. But again, that depends on the individual as to how and the strength of the protection that the child or youth is receiving. The, the other point about the education is this, this graph here related to the level of, the, of what they're reaching. The solid line represents the five departments in Colombia that house higher indigenous population. The dotted line is, are those that have a lower indigenous population and, and Afro-Colombian population. The, when you look at the solid line right here, basically what we're seeing that in first grade there's a very high repetition rate. So for those that can, can get up to fifth or sixth grade, by the time they get up to fifth grade, they're gonna be, they're gonna be two or three years older than what they should be at that age. And the other important piece here is that if there's a major drop as you, they go through the system. By the time you get to sixth grade, you have 80% uh, in school, then it keeps going down. And basically, there's a high dropout rate. And there's also a gap in terms of having access to education. So when you get into the marginalized areas, there's less access and an opportunity for participation for being involved in, in schooling. Over the last 10 years, the Ministry of Education um, has taken steps in, to address, to try and increase the, the support through education in terms of uh, addressing conflict resolution strategies and decreasing, uh, decreasing violence in schools. So they passed a law which was actually just officially approved last week. Uh, or it finished the entire approval process last week, and that's regarding convivencia escolar, or living together or coexistence within schooling, with the idea that they would implement a number of different models that would focus on, on this area and help strengthen conflict, the social-emotional learning, uh, conflict resolution, manage, how to manage difficult situations. So in terms of policy, that's been in place for about 10 years now. Um, and they've developed a number of different approaches related to that, to, to what is now the policy. They had a number of programs already in place, and which I would call flexible education models. And that's, for me, that's what gets into a couple of what, what could be the focus when, when we think about what comes next in Colombia. One is the flexible education models, and the second has to do with using a resilience framework within education. The flexible ed and the idea behind both of those is to focus on social emotional learning, to build community trust. Because when we get into the resilience model, it's about working with the communities. We know that conflict uh, tends to tear at the, f at the fabric of trust within communities, and that would need to be re rebuilt. Um, and a focus on the required skills and competencies. We've seen in other countries that when young people get out of the armed groups and try and reintegrate into society, what they're looking for are an ability to sustain their lives. They need jobs. They also need the proper skills uh, for, those, for the employment. And so part of the flexible education models has to do with ensuring that young people can get the right skills that they need so that they can get into the labor market. 
in one study that we did, and this is exhibited in other countries as well, but at least in Argentina, Brazil, and Chile, when we talked to employers in 2010 and about what they look for in young people for employment, their focus was not necessarily on the content, but rather on the language, the ability to communicate well, complex and critical thinking, having res being responsible, committed, and a positive attitude. All the technical pieces were less important since they felt they could, they could teach that, but they can't teach a positive attitude. So that was one of the critical areas that came out in, within, within this study, and we've seen it in other, in other studies. Uh, when you look at the, there's a citizen competencies and, and civics education study that the last one came out in 2009 that also says similar things in terms of what, what is actually in demand in the labor market. So when we talk about the flexible education models, these are the areas that, or, or some of the areas that would be addressed. The flexible models <coughs> are, in Colombia there are many, and, and these models are also found throughout Central America, and they tend to target young people who dropped out of school. They, they tended to maybe reach towards the end of primary, then they dropped out for different reasons. Here, in, not here, but in Colombia, uh, you have the Escuela Nueva model with, that also fits within what would be considered a flexible model. Escuela, Escuela Nueva also started the Círculos de Aprendizaje program around 2003, 2003, 2004, which targeted displaced children and youth. And, 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 with, and those that entered that program tended to be going, going to school for the first time at age 10 or 11. So there are different, there are multiple models here in Colombia. Over the last six years, they've reached out to 115,000 children and youth in the country. Unfortunately, I don't have an evaluation that tells me how effective these models have been. Um, all I know is that they've developed a number of materials. They've worked with 115,000 students, young people, they have them there. And it's flexible that caters to, it, it, it caters to their, their schedules. They're able to go in and out as needed, and, and it's also relevant. My, note, my notes are going nuts. Uh, <laughs> um, they also make it relevant for, for the student. So that's one, ensuring that you have flexible approaches that are relevant and adequate for the child. The other piece is related to the resilience framework. When we look at the definition of what resilience means, a lot of the definitions that come out tend to focus on the ability to recover or do well under difficult circumstances, or the ability to do well when facing uh, challenges, adversities. And the idea behind the resilience framework in general is to understand what's happening with, with the, the group that's being targeted within the framework, because the resilience tended to come out of the the violence and conflict areas, it, it was, it's been used in child protection. Now it's moved in, it's, it's been used a lot more now in education and entering different sectors as well. When I talk about it with the education, the idea is to understand um, what's, what's happening locally. <coughs> so if, I, if we have, um, let's say if a peace accord is signed, a peace agreement is signed, Yesterday, we also heard that there are differences in terms of what's happening in different regions of Colombia. You have different experiences. Having a national model for reintegration may not be very effective considering the variances across the country. Through a resilience approach, the idea is to go to the communities, talk with the population through, you have a qualitative approach initially to better understand what, what are the experiences within those communities to learn as Jenny mentioned earlier, do, have they had an experience of creating peace communities or not? What's going on in the community and what are their needs? And then, on, and based on that understanding, we're, be able, we're be able, able to, to develop locally appropriate and contextualized initiatives. Through the, and it, the focus that I, I use, I've been using this more now this year um, through schools, focusing on the school community. And it's also important from that perspective to think about what can be done through schools, 
there are limitations in terms of what can be done through schools in terms of protecting uh, youth, children and youth. And starting from developing that support and then tying it to a national level policies is also critical. So when we go through this process of better understanding what's, what the needs are locally, what we come out with is information that supports the community and the school community and then a broader document that, that, that allows us to have the policy level dialogue regarding the effects of certain policies at the local school level. So the, the strength of the perspective for me is the local understanding. Uh, this particular chart comes from the World Bank, Correa's work. So I've been collaborating, and I have been collaborating a bit more on, on this area to better understand how to apply it within um, conflict countries. My focus is more on Central America, and we also brought in Colombia in terms of this approach, where we have found out that in some communities you may not, that we're not expected to find young people interested in joining gangs. But now that knowing that, you're better able to, to respond to it. So for me, the important piece is in terms of how education can be used it has to do with understanding what the needs are, providing the support at different levels within the school in terms of the participation of the school community. The families uh, are a critical element, the, the teachers and the students in strengthening the relationships and also providing the flexible, flexible approaches in education that allows the students to better, to have their needs met. Because you have to have the support services there not as well that can be done through the schools. And whatever cannot be done through the schools has, would be referraled out. But the, so those are the two elements that I'll leave you with, are having a resilience model and also thinking about the flexible approaches within education to support children and youth affected by the violence, not only those that are in armed groups, but also those that have been displaced or have been victimized through different, through different ways. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Ryan. I think um, you've elevated the poignancy of the way that the conflict is affecting a whole generation of people um, to, I think, the, the need for a policy discussion about what, what the implications of that are, and I think that's a really important contribution, so thank you. Um, Brett Troyan will be our next speaker. Um, she is a, has a PhD in Latin American history from Cornell University um, and is an associate professor of history at Cortland College, um, State University of New York. She's published in numerous peer-reviewed journal, journals, journals and has written much on the Colombian indigenous movement. Um, she's just finished a book manuscript on state formation and ethnic politics in southwestern Colombia in the 20th century. And looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, so thank, first of all, I wanted to thank Ginny and Lily and Kelly and everyone for um, inviting me to, to and making this conference possible. Um, I'm deeply indebted to the U.S. Institute of Peace since they financed uh, the writing stage of the dissertation about 12 years ago. Um, so the dissertation wouldn't be done without USIP funding, so thank you. Um, my presentation will consist of three parts. So the first part will examine the emergence of a peace and rehabilitation policy in 1958 that mirrors a lot of the current initiatives of the peace process. The second part of the talk will draw out the similarities and differences between these two different peace processes the 1958 one and the 2013 one. The third part of my talk will draw up on my research, uh, specifically on the indigenous movement in southwestern Colombia, and I'm hoping it'll hope gives you some sort of thoughts that I have about what it could tell us about the challenges and limitations of a regional peace process. Um, so I'm gonna begin the part one. So historians of Colombia debate about when the period of civil war known as La Violencia fought, fought around partisan affiliation, liberal versus conservatives, began. Some place uh, the beginning in 1946, whereas others determined that La Violencia began in 1948 with the assassination of Jorge Elicer Caetan, which unleashed riots in Bogotá known as the Bogotazo. 
The ending date that I gave you of 1958 is also controversial since it coincides with the first government of the National Front, but not with the end of hostilities and conflict. Some historians argue that the period of La Violencia only ends in 1966, and others argue that La Violencia in Colombia has never ended, and that we are still deal dealing with the conflict that erupted in the mid-1940s. Overall, um, the estimate of casualties at about 200,000 people died from, from 1948 to 1966. Of particular interest to us today, is the Comisión Nacional Investigadora de las Causas y Situaciones Presentes de Violencia en el Territorio Nacional, National Investigatory Commission on the Causes and Current Situations of Violence in the National Territory. What a mouthful. Okay, um, which was created, so this commission was created in 1958 by the liberal government of Carlos Guerra Restrepo. This commission, which later produced a later well-known book, La Violencia in Colombia, went around the country interviewing all the parties involved in the conflict and also negotiated peace agreements with some guerrilla groups. The intent of the commission was to find out what had happened and what were the causes contributing to La Violencia. This commission's findings led to the formation of tribunals of reconciliación and equidad, reconciliation and equity. So what I'm trying to get at here is basically that there's a, there's a huge historical precedent to many of the initiatives that are happening right now today. I mean, Mark Chernick gave a wonderful overview of all the uh, DDRs and gave you a wonderful historical overview. So I'm just kind of focusing on one specific moment um, that I think really mirrors a lot of what's going on today. Um, so these tribunals were sent to the departments that were most affected by La Violencia, that were, you know, with data. Uh, so they deemed that Caldas, Cauca, Huila, Tolima, and Valle del Cauca were the five departments at, the, at, at that time in 1958, 1960, were considered the most affected, and they were all under a state of siege. So by this stage, the partisan warfare around liberals and conservatives had um, sort of evolved into a more class-based conflict which led to the emergence of both guerrilla armies, sometimes known as bandoleros, and to the self-defense units known then as pajaros, now known as paramilitaries, or bakri. Um, these tribunals were composed, the tribunals that were supposed to resolve land issues, I'll come back to that. Uh, they were composed of two magistrates, uh, two secretaries, and two citadores, who were basically people responsible for summoning people. To ensure impartiality, since what they were worried about was partisan warfare, uh, each magistrate had to represent a party. So you had one liberal magistrate, one conservative magistrate. Same thing for the secretary, same thing for the people doing the summons. Okay, so this is the important part in terms of the tribunals. Um, they were not given a broad mandate at all. Their specific mandate was just to tackle the land issues and any issue, um, any violence that was unrelated to land issues was not part of their mandate. They could only look at questions of land dispossession or loss of, let's say you had stayed on a piece of land and had done a lot of improvements and you had been forced to leave the land, you were supposed to get some kind of compensation through this tribunal. Okay, and there was a specific decree, uh, 002 of 1960. Okay, so um, an overview of the cases revealed the tremendous difficulties that these tribunals face when trying to tackle these land issues. In the case of Calca, the, ca the department that I'm most familiar with, 140 cases were brought to the tribunal um, in a period of about a year and a half. So for sake of brevity, because I know I'm the last one, um, <laughs> I will outline the most common problems that arose with these tribunals. So first you have the issue of all these plaintiffs coming to the tribunals and asking for some kind of uh, redress, some kind of prosecution of crimes that were unrelated to land issues. So one issue, of course, is uh, miscommunication. The second issue is land boundary issues. So the absence of titles or the vagueness of the description of the boundaries of the land made it very difficult for the magistrate and then the surveyor to establish, reestablish the rightful boundaries of the land. The third common issue 
was that ongoing violence in the areas where claims were placed meant that even if the claimants had the temerity to push forward a claim, the surveyor or the magistrate felt unsafe to go and inspect. And in some cases, the affair never seemed to be resolved due to, uh, due to an ongoing lack of security. Fourth, uh, departmental politics led to the change in location of where the tribunal had its main offices. So first this tribunal in Cauca had its main offices in Santander del Quilichao, which is located in the sub-region of Cauca where a lot of the violence had occurred. And then they transferred it to Popayan, to the capital of the department where there had been little conflict. So there I examined correspondence and the magistrates were trying to complain and say, why have you taken this tribunal all the way from Santander? to Popayan, this means that a lot of people won't come to us, it's too expensive for these peasants, et cetera. Um, the fifth problem that was very common were the budgetary constraints of the national government that led to the delayed payment um, for the magistrates and other employees. So this led to the very uncomfortable position for many magistrates to have to borrow money from the very people that they might have to investigate at a later date. Okay, so now I'm gonna to come to the second part of my talk, which are what are some of the similarities and differences between the initiatives of peace carried out during the last phase of La Violencia and the actual peace uh, initiatives. Um, number one, one of the, sim the similarities I can see is that the same difficulties that existed in terms of land boundaries and titling are still present today. So um, I watched actually the webcast of the U.S. Institute piece on land issue, and there was uh, Dr. Sabugal who said, um, you know, they still had, um, you know, the same issues of boundary and titling, even though that Google Maps was helping out a little bit. Um, however, even if you can figure out where the land plot is, you have the issue of du duplication of titling. So several people have the same title and um, you have numerous claimants to the same piece of land. So this, this is an issue that's really unresolved. That was a big problem in 1960, and I think is still gonna be a huge problem. And I think when the whole process starts just trying to resolve this, it's sure to spark further conflict if it's not handled with the utmost care. Um, number two, the other sort of similarity that I can see is Trying to resolve land conflict where conflict is still ongoing is also an impossibility today. So um, the national state today consults with the Department of Defense to ascertain whether or not the selected area is safe enough for surveyors and um, the claimants to return to the land. So the same issue, insecurity, you cannot, if there's complacency, you cannot go and start the whole process. Okay, what are the three main differences, however, I do see between 1960 and 2013? Um, number one is the growth of the central state. So the central state in 1960 was much weaker, and of course, the institutional uh, capacity and framework was much more limited. So there's been a huge progress in that sense. Um, the other major difference that I can see is the acknowledgement of the importance of historical memory, which was completely, um, you know, not acknowledged as Mark Trinick, you know, alluded to with the Borrón y Cuenta Nueva. Um, now that's completely changed. You have the importance of historical memory with the founding of the Centro Nacional of uh, Memoria Histórica. <clears throat> and number three, and perhaps most importantly, um, civil society organizations today are playing a much more important role and a much more visible role than they ever were in 1960. And that has to do, of course, with the whole um, process of growth of grassroots organizations. Okay, so that brings me to the third part of my talk, um, with this third difference. So I'm gonna focus on a specific uh, civil society organization, which is really my, more my area of expertise, which is on the Consejo Regional Indígena del Cauca. So getting back to Cauca, the Department of Cauca, um, the Tribunal of, Re of Reconciliation and Equity in the Department of the Cauca completely failed its mission of achieving peace and equity and resolving land issues in the early, in the early 1960s. So the tribunals were dissolved after about two years. Um, however, some measure of peace and an end to many conflicts around land issues was achieved through the work of the grassroots organization Consejo Regional del Cauca. It was founded in 1970. And this organization, along with AICO, Autoridades Indígenas de Colombia, 
was able to pressure and demand that the national state recognize its rights and was able to carry out a mini agrarian reform in the Department of Calca. So in this department, indigenous communities were covered an impressive amount of land, 74,228 hectares from 1970 to 1996. So, you know, very impressive. Um, a key component to the successful nature of this mini agrarian reform is that land claims based on indigenous identity and rooted in colonial Spanish documents trumped all other claims. Thus, the process of deciding who the land belonged to was much easier to resolve in this case because as soon as you could prove that this was an indigenous territory, it trumped all the other ones. You're not gonna be able to do that so easily with the other um, land claims. The other no less key component is that indigenous communities themselves carried out many of the first stages of this bottom up land reform by doing sit-ins and protests such as blocking the main Panamericana highway the national state throughout the 1970s and 1980s adopted a, a discursive policy of support to the indigenous community. So there was a, a, a discourse um, that was favorable to the formation of ethnic identity. But certain branches of the state, the DAS, uh, which is sort of the equivalent of FBI, and the army actively repressed some of the leaders of the Creek and accused them of subversive activities. However, the central states, for reasons that I don't have time to go into today, ultimately supported the indigenous movement with very favorable legislation. Um, and so then you have the demobilization of an indigenous guerrilla army known as the Movimiento Armado de Quintinlame, which happened in 1990, um, was successful. They brought all their arms and they melted it all down. Um, and it was successful, it didn't never reassemble, and it never reorganized itself as, a, as an armed movement. Um, the other thing that happened between 1970 and 1990 was that local ind indigenous institutions that had been weakened and were left in disarray in 1960, back to the time of the tribunal, managed to reconstitute themselves and to play an important role in the mobilization of indigenous communities from the 1970s to now. Okay, so now does this mean all I've told you that peace was achieved in Cauca? So if we understand peace to mean absence of conflict and the state having a monopoly of force, then the process of peace in Cauca has been a failure. Um, both paramilitaries and guerrillas remain active and have attacked the indigenous leadership in certain sub-regions of Cauca, despite the many clear statements and pleas made by indigenous communities to be left alone. Indigenous communities patrol their territory with their people uh, guards who carry indigenous sticks called bastons. They, they represent their indigenous identity. They can only do so much. So sort of in conclusion, the case of the Calca shows the power of a civil society, grassroots organization, to push and to achieve a certain agenda in terms of agrarian reform and ethnic rights. However, peace cannot be achieved without demobilization of all the armed fact actors, sorry, of all the armed actors that remain active in the region. So in the earlier presentation that you have, we were talking about you need to have a convergence of the top and the bottom. And I think the Calca shows this very clearly, that you do need to have local solution, you need to have grassroots involvement in the peace of process, but you also definitely also need full cooperation from the national state and going beyond just you know legislation and discursive um, tactics. Um, so in conclusion, peace in Colombia, in my view, must be constructed locally and with solutions coming from the people who have lived through the violence and, as was alluded to earlier, may have to live side by side with the very people that harm them. And, but they cannot do it alone. In other words, it's not enough for the national state to have the best legislation on the books and to discursively support grassroots movements. Although that's great progress compared to the repression that we saw under Uribe's government. So again, my, guess, my overall conclusion is from the bottom, very important, and also from the top. So thank you.
Thank you very much, Brett. I think this panel has really given us a sense of how uh, peace building efforts in Colombia have been quite fragmented um, at the local level, at the regional level, at the national level, and even at the international level, if we think about George's discussion about sanctions and, um, and delisting and how that impacts the local level of peace building actors as well as national policies that are being, um, being shaped. Um, it's also interesting, I think, as, as I've listened for these last couple of days, to think about the, the different regional and local experiences, both of violence and of peace building, and the importance of really integrating those experiences into whatever comes out of Havana. Um, or the opposite also, integrating whatever comes out of Havana into a real, um, I think, deeply textured understanding of what's happening at the local and muni or municipal and departmental um, levels. Um, we'll go ahead and open up for questions and look forward to hearing what you all have to say. Donnie? Uh, okay. Uh, the first one is for for Brett Royan. Uh, I just want to make a, a, a short comment on uh, your historical comparison. Um, I, I myself researched the Tribunales de Equidad y Conciliación in, in other departments. And I think one of the, just an additional comment, I think one of the uh, important differences is, uh, well, uh, acknowledging the, the, the ones you mentioned, but there is a, a very important difference in the, uh, the scope of, um, of the tribunals. If you compare them with, with the, uh, the, the current uh, law on, on victims and land restitution, um, in the 60s, in the beginning of the 60s, the tribunals had no uh, uh, power for sanctioning. Yeah, they were just equity and reconciliation and nothing else. So uh, there was no equity and there was no reconciliation because these were, were tribunals between people of very different power levels. Those that, um, that appropriated the land, uh, those that grabbed the land and, and uh, mostly the women, the widows that were trying to, uh, to stay at the land or to, to gain back their land, yeah? to regain their land. Um, the other comment is um, on the, 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 the topic of education. Um, um, I was thinking, I was comparing uh, your presentation, Ryan, on, on, on education and on the resilience framework, which with what was said at, uh, yesterday about um, the process of, of individual, the, the root of individual um, demobilization. <coughs> and, and I think that um, this resilience framework has a very important uh, possibility, uh, potential to to be to to apply to the um, demobilization process or well the 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 um, desvincular. I don't know how you say it in English for the for the use. D link. Hmm? The delinking them also yes okay um, for the delinking process of the of of the used people uh, recognizing their past giving their recognizing their uh, their identities and maybe also their informal acquired skills even the skills acquired during their the period of uh, being. Uh, during their recruitment period, being in the in in the guerrilla or in the the other the paramilitary groups, and this is what what no, is not happening, because one of the difficulties of this individual route process is that there is a kind of um, treatment of non-citizen of non-identity. You have been a bad person. Now you will be. Uh, you have to be re-educated and be don't. Um, we don't look at all those possibly also positive factors of the experience those people and those youngsters have had uh, during their recruitment period. Well, these were my two comments. 
Do you want to add anything to the comparison? No, I'm, I'm very glad you pointed that out. Um, definitely. I totally agree with what you're pointing. I'm glad you put that. Um, my only excuse is I only had 10 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for your comment. I do, I do agree that, that the resilience framework does have, can have some added value to the process in getting up to reintegration. And one, one of the key elements of that framework, which is, uh, has to do with the expectations that they have of the youth. In the past, it, it came from a deficits approach, which sounds like what that's, based on what you're saying, it sounds like that's what's happening now, meaning that these these young people have problems. They need they need psychological counseling. They're they're going to have they're not going to be able to over basically saying that they're not going to have be able to overcome what they their experiences. The resilience perspective is very different. Where we start off from the positive side, where we have high expectations, where we do expect them to be able to do well and overcome the adversities, where we do look for those skills that you mentioned. That yes, they had a bad experience, but in that process, they may have developed leadership skills, organizational skills, collaboration skills. There are different things that you can pull out of that experience. Um, they're not, it's not a lost generation. Um, there are things that can be learned. And the other part is tying that into the community because in the end, the entire community is affected by, by what's going on. And if you have new people entering the community or maybe they've already been a young group and have lived there, the idea is to form those ties together, learn about what the community, what are the needs within that community, and then pull out the resources. Because the main elements of the framework have to do with identifying what the risks are, identifying what the protective factors are, what the local resources are, and also identifying what those opportunities are to do to do well and improve. And I've used it within education, but also within the child protection lens, where it is where you do use it within the community context. So, thank you. Okay. Yes, Maria Clemencia. I was wondering about the Escuela Nueva uh, model. I was wondering about the Escuela Nueva model uh, for kids between uh, 10 to 11 years old, and uh, I was wondering if that um, model is in the rural areas or in the urban areas, and how, how do you have seen, because I, ha I know that the Escuela Nueva works in the rural areas, mostly, and I don't know um, precisely a lot of the ex-combatants or, or kids that have been in distress are in the rural areas, so I don't know if there's difference uh, of uh, take to get education, and, and education in the rural areas is really very difficult, so I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. The, the Escuela Nueva model, um, just to familiarize everyone on what it is, it, but it started back in the 60s, and it, the idea was to provide quality education in rural areas. And it's a flexible approach. It's a, it has to do with self-learning. And because of the students, the, young, the children in rural areas often had to leave to work on, on the La Cosecha, on the agriculture. Um, they couldn't go to school every day, so it was so it allowed them to be flexible. And within in the, within the school settings, they they also set up different groups so that the stu the children also have responsibilities that they need to take care of. In around 2003, the La Fundación Escuela Nueva organized the Los Círculos de Aprendizaje or the Learning Circles, which t was focusing predominantly on displaced populations. And, it's, and they started off in more ur urban, marginalized urban areas. Um, initially in Suacha and, and Los Altos de Casuca. So they had a few in that area. They also had some around uh, in Las Comunas de Medellin. And I think it was in one other area in, in the beginning um, with the idea of trying to offer a flexible approach to those that have been displaced. When we, t when we talk about young people or children and youth that have not been in school and are going back or affected by conflict and violence and are, and have a lot and are dealing with a lot of these other adversities, because you're also talking about broken families or different types of compositions of families um, where they have 
usually large households, uh, siblings from different uh, fathers. So, and that also creates additional adversities for the, for the children. So the model and, and it, the ideal is to provide the flexibility within the classroom to allow them to, to help them get through some of these difficulties to provide a little bit of psychosocial support. At that time, the psychosocial part was not as strong um, uh, that they had talked about strengthening it. Uh, but because the youth need to have the space to get used to being what to be to get used to being in a classroom setting and with other students, so there is this flexibility. Um, but it was originally in the urban areas, and then they reached an agreement with the Ministry of Education, so it, it's been institutionalized, and they have since expanded. I don't know exactly which in which communities they are now, um, but when when I talk about what I didn't mention about the flexible education models is that the ones that I to which I'm referring are those that have been institutionalized. They already, they already made a connection with the Ministry of Education, so it's something that it, it's, it's not something that comes and goes, but rather something that's really been established. And with, in Colombia, they have a number of, of models, and they are in urban and rural areas, from the Escuela, model, Escuela Nueva model to accelerated, accelerated learning uh, model, which came out of Brazil. And there's a list about Five, between five and ten different models, and it targets the different populations, including those affected by the violence. So. I have a couple of questions I'm going to throw in. Um, I guess the, the first one has to do with um, the protective factors that you were talking about, Ryan. And I'm wondering if you've seen any, any literature about the role of after-school programs, and specifically cultural programs for youth, as decreasing uh, the likelihood that they will be recruited. I remember I had a conversation with some people from the mayor's office in Medellin, and one of the things that most shocked me was that they said when they had after school music or art or dance programs, the levels of violence went down dramatically, and that that was the single most important factor they could point to in terms of variation of violence. Um, and I think about you know all the budget cuts throughout the world and the fact that cultural programs and you know after school activities tend to be one of the first things that's cut as being not important to the curriculum. So I'm wondering if you've seen anything beyond Medellin that would support that that notion. Um, a second question I have has to do with peer mediators, uh, and this has to do with kind of a vision of youth not just as victims of the conflict but as agents of change. Um, I know that when I was in Cincelejo, I talked to some young students who were involved in a peer mediation program where they were being trained to intervene with people who were being recruited or recruiters or try to try to negotiate things at a very young age. Um, and I'm wondering if that kind of model is something that you find you know, throughout the educational system, formal or in informal. Um, and I think the third, third comment question I had has to do with Cauca and the role of youth there. Um, when I visited Calca at one point, I remember the indigenous parents saying um, that a crisis was created because their young people were voluntarily going off to join the guerrillas, um, and the parents went after them and tried to bring them home forcibly, and the kids said, you need to have a dialogue with us. We need jobs. If you don't provide jobs for us, we will not come back. And so there was kind of a dialogue that was opened up and negotiated, um, but the youth were very much agents of that change that was able to, to kind of go forward. And finally, George, just to bring you into the conversation, I know that while you were at, at Notre Dame, you did a lot of work with conflict resolution educators uh, in Colombia, and I wonder if you might want to share anything about your experience working with educators um, to shed light on the role of education and the role of educators um, in this next period that's going to be coming up in Colombia. So I'll start to go in order of the questions, I guess. <laughs> Related to the after-school programs and as a protective factor, I do agree that, that those types of initiatives are definitely very positive in helping, um, in helping decrease the other risks that youth encounter, including joining armed groups and getting involved in crime and violence. What we have seen there's some literature related to the use of idle time where, um, and that's just very general. If you can 
keep them busy doing something, mm -hmm. then then that could dec then that would have a positive effect. Um, so there, there was some information uh, about that. When we start getting into some of the cultural activities, like extracurricular activities, you do you have some evidence coming out. Um, there's some from Brazil. The few, not a few, but now a number of years ago, uh, they in through UNESCO they started the Open Spaces Project, and in Braz in Brazil. There, there is some information about having a positive effect. And the open spaces model is where, when you keep the school open from early in the morning until night. And, and the, the Brazil example also has it open on weekends. The, ideally, you can keep it op open on, on holidays it's, and offer the young people opportunities for different activities, whether it's music, dance, art, uh, drama, as and and sometimes, and then in some cases, that in some more academic, academic pieces. But the idea is to keep them engaged, keep them connected. Which the other, there's another side of literature related to the what's called the connectedness, connectedness of youth of young people, when they're connected to a school or to a program that also has positive effects, decreases their the likelihood of them getting engaged in crime, violence, drug use, and and other factors. And the connectedness also relates to the relationship between the young people and the staff in the school, the teacher, the director, the, the cleaning crew, what, anybody that's there, as long as you have some type of positive relationship. And oftentimes, the young people, especially marginalized young people affected by violence, don't necessarily have support at home. And what they find at school tends to be the primary support having someone that they can talk to and confide in makes a big difference in terms of being connected and them showing up to school. Um, showing up in knowing that if they don't show up, they will be missed also makes a difference. It's about having, it's about having that connection. In other examples, in, also in Brazil, um, actually in Colombia too, there are a few examples of using art and music to get young people out of gangs um, and drugs. The one big program in Brazil is Afro Reggae, the, which basically playing music, the, student, the young people volunteer, they'll go walking down the favela, they'll hear some music playing, ask what's going on. One young person specifically liked music. He was also running drugs and for the local, for the gang in control of the favela. So he decided to do both. So he got in, started playing, learning how to play music, got in, and became a part of the band. As part of the music, they also offered different discussions about alternatives to the violence, alternatives to, to, the, to the drug lifestyle. And eventually, he actually le he left the gang and became a full-time band, band member. Ended up joining the main, gang, the main band and, and a few years ago played at Carnegie Hall. So, the, so they, there are lots of these examples of using music and the arts for you for, with young people it also it allows them a, a way of expressing themselves mm -hmm. that they might not otherwise have it's, it would be easier for them to tell you what they're experiencing through poetry through music through drawing come then to just tell you about it it's more comfortable to go through different modes of expression so there are many of examples of using the arts also as a healing tool and also the using the extracurricular activities and spaces as a way to to keep young people engaged in positive in positive activities mm -hmm. and being engaged in particular in music also has positive effects on their learning abilities in, uh, in math and language that there there have been studies that show a connection that if you're if you play an instrument or if you're learning music you can have better outcomes in in your math and language skills. Mm -hmm. So Thank the, you. the second one about peer mediators, there are, there are some programs, and I think it's also included in Scroll and where within the school, whenever there's an argument or a fight or, or a dispute within the school, the first, the first step is to, go, is to go to the peer, the conflict resolution team or the peer mediators within the classroom. They, so they set up tables, and each table has a different responsibility. 
and if there's a dispute that week, you go to these two students and figure and work it out. Um, so there are those steps that are in place in some schools. I haven't seen it to the level that you mentioned, uh, which I think would be great. I mean, over the last year or two, there's been a lot of information, especially from the UN, regarding the importance of, of young, young people's engagement in all decision-making processes. And it does make a difference from program design to implementation, as well as to, to problem solving, and also it, it, that would also get into peer mediation. Um, so I think it's definitely a very positive step. That's also a life skill that's, that's important for the young people. But I don't have a lot of examples regarding where else it's been used. Um, so, I mean, yeah, de development's definitely a key um, problem in, in Kauka. So a lot of the young people are, are definitely attracted to, I guess, alternative careers is a sort of way of putting it. Um, I mean, what you should know about the Kauka is that it's overwhelmingly rural. So unlike the rest of <coughs> Colombia that's mostly urban, Kauka is definitely very rural. and. Um, Basically, the sort of running joke that I have with the people who would uh, I would interview, um, they would say, "Well, there are only really two main things here that you can live off in Cauca: agriculture and clientelismo." So that the um, two party machines uh, were, you know, gave jobs and and basically agriculture. And then when I interviewed um, Lorenzo Muelas, who um, became a senator um, in the Colombian Congress. He said something very interesting to me. He said that he felt like the younger generation, um, he would now be, I think, in his 60s. Um, he said he saw a real problem with the younger generation not being interested in uh, agriculture and the traditional um, you know, methods of earning uh, a living. So I think there definitely is a generational, and I'm, you know, that, that was just one comment from one person, so you can't really generalize from everyone. Um, but still, I think it shows that there, there is definitely, if there is to be peace in Kalka and in other rural areas, young people will have to be given um, other options and there needs to be alternative development. Um, and one project that they were working with, the Consejo Regional Indígena del Cauca, was tourism and trying to set up hotels with hot thermal baths. And, uh, but of course, with the political situation and the public order situation in Cauca, that was a kind of complicated, the whole tourism thing. Thank you. George? Yeah, thank you for that question, Jenny, because uh, it's quite gratifying to have so many young people come from a conflict zone and, and want to be involved in the conflict resolution area and peace building, obviously, in, in their own country. And um, I think uh, you know, we, we see now for those frequent Colombia, uh, you know, it's a very thriving program at Los Andes, another at Haryana. We, we've worked also with uh, folks in Median and elsewhere. And I think there's a couple of distinguishing characteristics that are challenges to the normal US-based model of conflict resolution and, and, and peacemaking. Uh, one is that the presence of crime and corruption as a structural dynamic means that the basis in which we would go into, let's say, even a standard mediation course, which is, well, our biggest problem is how do you get all the relevant people who might want to have an interest in peace around the table? And then how do you convince them that they might have shared interests and in engage in their grievances in a way that isn't solved from the barrel of the gun, but through something else? When in certain sectors of Colombia, as we know, it's not the grievance phenomenon as much as the greed. And that undermines dramatically the basic understanding of how and why parties might come to the table or whether they bother to come at all, or whether they come with good intentions and a reason to be forthright and honest, and they don't. So we're challenged to present new models and, and, and those models about how you build both rule of law and peace hand in hand are much more pronounced in the Colombian situation. The second is, uh, which plays very much into the work of our good colleague John Paul Lederick and others, and that is when you're dealing with a, a violent conflict that began in 1948, 
you're looking at a period of time over 55 years. What makes us think after 55 years of violent conflict, even understanding it was different geographically and its intensity varied, how can you have a 55-year violent conflict and assume that a peace can come in two or three? There's a way in which stable peace can only come after more than a few decades. But what you need, and this has been the challenge to us in working with institutions there, is you need just not basic training and conflict resolution. You need the full-blown model of what we call strategic peace building. And that is an understanding of how you engage sectors that have different experiences of violence and peace. So our friend Nadrius with the peace communities and the local dynamic and, and how you created space for peace and how and why. The, the work of insiders and outsiders being brought together to deal with internally displaced, the dynamic of rule of law and tensions associated with crime and corruption, working alongside some traditional mediation, but most importantly, a strategic plan that is long term, that understands that in the short term, the cynics, the cheats, and the criminals may win, but in the longer term, you have to be engaged in this because you have a vision of, of what lies ahead. And that's been certainly very gratifying to those of us who had the privilege of working with Colombians on this, to see the long view and their willingness to dig in and to apply methods that are not taught traditionally even in some of our courses here in USIP when we do mediation and facilitation. Thank you, George. I don't know if there are any, question, any further questions. We'll give Jim, and then I think we'll have a coffee break and move into just a concluding uh, panel, and I'm going to, before Jim starts, I'm just going to throw out to you um, that for the conclusions, I'm going to ask us to do a kind of collective conclusions. So I'd like you each to think about one thing that has either surprised you or kind of changed your thinking in the course of these last two days. Everybody may not have something, but I'm hoping that that will give us some substance with which to uh, generate a discussion and kind of close the, the session. So with that, Jim? Uh, I have a question for uh, for George. I have an interest in the the possible role of the U.S. in supporting the peace process in uh, in Colombia, and the FARC, as you know, is on the list of terrorist organizations. And I just, <clears throat> in, in a very general way, what do you think, um, or or how does what what sorts of limits do, would that impose upon the U.S. as far as playing a a role in that peace process? Can you? Is that's a very general question. I don't know if you can answer it either uh, in general terms or specifically. Uh, thank you. Colombian process, but I just yesterday the president said that they needed to hurry because there are elections that they had to finish the process. So I would like to know who who is thinking in a long. Yeah, good. Let me handle your the, the second one first. Um, I think there's a difference between setting some clear markers and saying. Uh, however short along the process, we've got to accomplish certain goals by a certain time. And that's the way I read the statement that there's, there's got to be certain agreements by the combatant parties that we have now turned from uh, the politics of the gun to the politics of a process. But that makes the strategic peace building enterprise even more important because there have to be rewards and participatory benefits from that process, from the moment when you decide you're committed to the nonviolent struggle rather than the violent one. And that's where the role of insiders and outsiders become most critical, it seems to me, to be able to sustain that, uh, even when things are not going politically the way for a particular group or a particular region. Okay? Um, the delisting dynamic is, I, I, I actually tried this morning to pull up the full list of Colombian individuals and entities that are on the Treasury list effective uh, September 1. And, and I decided uh, not to get it printed because it's 38 pages and in small print. The FARC as an organization is designated. A large number of individuals and entities associated with it are. So the first dynamic that might unfold, and some of this is actually ongoing, I know, in Treasury, 
is that for those who are most enthusiastic within the FARC for a legitimate process that can reach conclusion and bring this to an end, and who themselves have cleaned up their act in terms of their association with uh, designated narcotics groups and traffickers, they can and should petition with, let's say, the endorsement of various groups that have worked with them for getting cleared from the list. That's the first issue that the U.S. and partners can engage in. The second is for various peace groups, actors, facilitators to spend some time flying under the radar. <laughs> so your own associations with groups that you're trying to convince within the FARC or the ELN, ELN context to be more part of the process and renounce ties to uh, criminal organizations, that you can be persuasive in that without the Treasury Department knowing it. I'm not asking people to countervail U.S. law because I'm clearly aware now that I'm carrying a badge that says I'm a member of the U.S. government. But uh, w w what is clear to me is, is that there's a, a good deal of persuasion and facilitation that needs to occur here for those groups that have been on the ground a very long time working with these groups. And the third thing that has to be is uh, uh, policy statements from the organizational leadership itself that the alliance for purposes of earning money to sustain a functioning organization, to carry on, let's say, a revolutionary war, if you want to adopt that phraseology, the need for that as the bank has come to an end. And we welcome a way in which we can shed ourselves of that affiliation as part of the process. And I think that's the biggest structural dynamic among many of the actors within the FARC itself. The U.S. has to be open on its end to a quick examination and facilitation of those who truly renounce that and can demonstrate that to be off the list. Now we have other processes in the past, let's say with the PLO and various other groups, where we've shown adaptability and agility with yesterday's terrorists becoming today's partners and tomorrow's uh, uh, prospects for new political leadership. Okay, with that, I want to thank our panel for their insights and their thoughtfulness. I want to thank you all for your patience, and uh, I hope that you will stay through the coffee break and come back for the concluding session. Uh, we'll break for coffee and be back here at quarter to four. We're going to try to get back on, back on schedule to finish up at, on time at 4.30. Thank you. Before we broke for the, um, for the coffee break, I asked you to think about something something that kind of struck you in the last two days of conversations um, that either surprised you or kind of changed the way that you think about things. Um, so I'm going to do a round of those. And then I was, I was thinking that there are actually quite a number of areas that we didn't touch on here as well. And maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to bring those out and perhaps suggest areas where uh, there's a need for further research. Um, and other ideas that you might have about, anybody might have maybe in a third stage, other ideas that you might have about how to, <clears throat> how to support the peace process in the long-term vision um, of change for justice and, and peace in Colombia. So why don't we start out, and anybody that wants to kind of speak out in terms of something that they, they've learned or that surprised them about the last couple of days, Michael. Hello. There we go. Um, just the historical institutional um, legacies or antecedents to some of the, the contemporary conflict resolution mechanisms over land. Um, I knew nothing about these processes in Calca, um, and it's exciting to see that even though they may not have been fully successful, uh, there may be lessons to be learned for the current process. Mm -hmm. Others? Yes. Alex? This particular idea of using the infrastructure that's in place through the Defensoria del Pueblo, as you know, there's been a lot of talk about, well, you know, if we're going to do this bottom up 
piece stuff, if we're going to regionalize, localize, what does that actually look like? And just from my limited experiences with the Defensoria de Pueblo, I, I think that's a very interesting idea in trying to work around that as, as a local infrastructure. I, I would add a question to that also about the personeros. You know, what is the role of the defensores versus the personeros? Because in fact, the land, law, land restitution and victims uh, law give, charges the personeros with the implementation. And they are not, they're not in a, a capacity or resourced to do that kind of thing. So I'm not sure where the defensores, kind of what the mandate of the defensores is in relation to implementation of a peace process. But thinking about kind of local infrastructures, and I think um, you know, Andres gave us a, a very broad vision of this, this need to have some sort of infrastructure, whether it's peace committees or local, locally administered committees, but how, how do you actually operationalize peace when it comes right down to it? I and mean, we're not talking about sending in the UN blue helmets, we're talking about you know, kind of a ground up that meets a top down. And I think the challenge of doing that is huge. Uh, but I think the Colombians have lots of ideas and tremendous capacity to pull it off. So I'm, I'm excited to see what they will do and how they will do it, because I think they will teach the world uh, many things from their process. Um, other? Um, I'm picking up on something you said, Ginny, about uh, Colombia having lots and lots of local and regional institutions in place. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about a lot of the peace communities that I looked at 10, 12 years ago and wondering what's left of them and what could might be built upon the continued existence of places like San Jose or, or the ruins of some of the others. Um, the one thing I will say, though, about building on them is it's always been terribly difficult to coordinate at the regional and national level in, in Colombia, as you know. Um, you know, we, we had some tries at putting together networks, and they, they all collapsed. Now, that may have been our ineptness, or it, you know, maybe there is a genuine problem there. But, you know, what's left that, that, that could be built on? Yeah, I, I would just kind of comment to that also that um, the national environment has changed so much, I think, since the experiences that you were studying existed. Um, and they were very vulnerable and they were very hit by violence. And I think a lot of them collapsed because of that. Um, and it, it makes me kind of question whether in a different kind of national environment where peace communities were encouraged there might be some protective kind of effort and protective mechanisms set up that could actually help to sustain them over time. Um, I think in the absence of that, you know, they fell apart. There was no political will from the top. There was political opposition from the communities in many cases or from armed actors or from government authorities. Um, and I, I wonder to what extent changing that variable might change the prospects. I also, you know, it occurs to me that the whole historical memory project um, may help to build some sort of capacity for organizing at the local level. And that would be an interesting kind of thing to explore. I mean, I think the victims are organizing themselves. That's a major change in Colombia in the last five years or so. Um, and I think they have a lot to say and they are contributing to shaping the peace process and I'm sure they will help shape the implementation of whatever accord is reached. So I think those infrastructures also would be something that could be called on. Jim. The, the panel uh, presentations and discussion on local organization is something that uh, interested me because I'm, I'm convinced that, as I, as I say, that any, well, any process is, is going to have to be bottom up, but you can't exclude the top. And I think this is the point that, uh, that uh, Andres uh, pointed out. And it is certainly true that Colombia historically has, has been challenged by, by institutional coordination, okay, that is both vertical up and down as well as 
is horizontal. Uh, during the eight years of Uribe, a lot of the organizations, I think, human rights and others that might have been uh, participants in, in helping this process out, uh, helping the bottom to meet the top or the top to meet the bottom, they were demonized. Um, you know, the, the discourse very often was that they were sympathetic to the insurgents, uh, they were uh, terrorists, and that sort of thing. So, uh, to the extent that that macro environment has changed, uh, and it has changed, I, I don't think it's yet changed as much as some of us would like to see, but it has changed. And so it may be possible now to do some things that it might that might have been much more difficult to do uh, back when you were you were in, uh, back in ancient times, <laughs> the days of the Punic Wars, right? <laughs> right. So that's uh, my my comments. Thank you. And it's been very useful to me. To, it, it stimulated my my thinking a little bit on some of these issues. Yes. Um, let's see. Yeah. I am, a, I am a little bit positive about the power of networks coming from the grassroots level and supporting by different like uh, international organizations and focusing a non-formal non -formal education as a way to uh, like go through all these problems uh, in Colombia. And I think that there are a lot of things going on, going right now in Colombia. They, they are very powerful and they are using a lot of different new methodologies and I am very hopeful that one day we will have from like up to up from the up to the down a different perspective of changing Colombia. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I prefer to speak Spanish. Would you help me please try, try to express my ideas in English? Eh, quisiera solamente decir tres conclusiones de estos dos días eh, y lo digo desde el punto de vista de alguien que ve el conflicto colombiano desde el país, no fuera eh, y es, eh, es desde un punto de vista muy crítico pero constructivo a la vez y es que los colombianos eh, hemos puerto, puesto los muertos las víctimas, los secuestrados pero la sociedad internacional nos exige que cumplamos una serie de compromisos internacionales que en este orden de ideas nos hace casi imposible suscribir tratados de paz. Eh, y en segundo lugar, eh, muchas veces eh, me queda la impresión de que las FARC están tratando como terroristas, pero si el gobierno reconoció estado de beligerancia según el derecho internacional, no es una organización terrorista, es una organización que no reconoce la soberanía del Estado, luego se aplican las normas de derecho internacional, luego quedo, quedo con esa sensación de, eh, de hasta qué punto es un acto soberano de los colombianos decidir qué tipo de, de proceso de paz vamos a, a suscribir o si vamos a estar atados, porque hoy mismo aquí en Nueva York está el presidente intentando hablar con la fiscal de la Corte Penal Internacional, en este tema que es tan delicado para el país. Y en tercer lugar, una conclusión desde el punto de vista eh, metodológico, y es que si las FARC, como los movimientos guerrilleros, eh, no reconocen al Estado, pues no reconocen los tratados internacionales. A las FARC no se le pueden exigir que apliquen tratados internacionales porque son eh, grupos guerrilleros alzados en armas. Eh, luego, las decisiones, de la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, que si mal no estoy, se, se suscribe en el 68, si mal no recuerdo, eh, son después de que exhibe el conflicto colombiano. Luego esa, esa serie de incógnitas me quedan eh, sin resolver, creo que durante mucho tiempo. Gracias. Okay, I'll try to do justice to that, and I'd ask you to please correct me and, and tweak it if I don't get it quite right. Um, the gentleman has three conclusions that he'd like to offer in a way of constructive criticism. They may seem critical, but he hopes that they are constructive. Um, this is from having lived within Colombia the many years of conflict. 
Um, and given the fact that Colombia is the one that has suffered the deaths um, and the kidnappings and the victims within this war, um, it seems that the demands of the international community um, are sometimes at odds with the desire for peace from within Colombia. Um, a second component is that he has the impression that the FARC has been described as a terrorist organization, but it's actually a belligerent um, under international law. And as a belligerent, it doesn't recognize the sovereignty of the state. Um, so that there is a sensation that the, um, the sovereignty, that the, let me see if I get this right, that the fact that they are sovereign and that Colombia is sovereign means that they should have the chance to say what kind of peace accord they want. Um, so today Santos is in New York at the UN uh, meeting with the International uh, Criminal Court prosecutor. Um, but that there's kind of a disjuncture here that seems maybe unfair. I'm, I'm adding a little bit to, to what you say, but I'm sensing that there's a, a certain unfairness perceived between internationals be, being able to dictate the terms of a, of a peace, peace accord. Um, and finally, in terms of methodology, if the FARC guerrillas don't rec recognize the state, um, then they don't recognize international laws either. Um, and so the decision of the ICC, which was established in 1998, um, was established after the conflict began. So it seems um, kind of without, it seems unreasonable perhaps that the ICC then gets to, to weigh in on this decision because it's after, after the fact, after the conflict began. Um, so these are just a few concerns that he doesn't really have a solution to, but he wants to put them on the table. Thank you. I, I would like to, uh, one of the things that I was thinking about is the ethnic um, recognition of what this morning they were talking about, the, the, the idea that uh, ethnicity becomes like a central issue in, in, the, in, the, in the peace talks and that they haven't been taken into account and, it, and I was thinking about the process that, we, that Colombia has been living of recognizing in 1991 they, uh, the, the Constitution recognized the multiculturality of our country and then it, it, the indigenous groups received a lot of recognition of rights and uh, they have a position in the Senate and then the, the, the Afro-Americans, just to do like a little bit of history, the Afro-Americans, uh, the, the Afro-Colombians, excuse me, the Afro-Colombians were able to get a this, tran this uh, transitorio in the Constitution that became the, the, the law, the La Ley 70, that they were talking about, that gave them also a lot of rights and, and recognitions. And then we have the peasants uh, and the settlers, for example, in Amazonia that haven't been, uh, that, that feel also abandoned and discriminated, no? And that are also asking for collective territories, just the, as the collective territories that the, the communities in the Pacific Coast were able to be, be given. So that the peasant reserve zones, the, the zones, uh, for, uh, what they call uh, La Zona de Reserva Campesina, that they were they were asking they were uh, the FARC was asking for the pe for to be given to the to peasants in this marginal area. So I was just uh, a little bit concerned of how to reach. Not I am feeling like uh, we're beginning to there are a lot of divisions on who who deserves what and who, who is not deserving because and women are not present and the, like the. And I think it's very important to recognize the different uh, groups and sectors in the country, but also to get to a point where we, that doesn't become another source of conflict and that we can reach, uh, like we, we were talking about the, the local peace co uh, committees, mm -hmm. they, that, that have to, to, to get into, everybody has demands and everybody wants to be recognized in this process. And it's been very interesting to see how that, that the acknowledgement of the, 
of the different communities and their, their demands. But uh, my concern is that, that that could become another source of conflict if it's not uh, well uh, tackled in the, in the local level. Mm -hmm. So that was something that the conference let me thinking about. Um, well, there were many things to think about, Jeannie, and again, I just want to thank you. This was fantastic, and Lily, I think it was a great uh, event. I was thinking that one of the issues that keeps like going around my mind is um, I read the uh, International Crisis Group report a while ago, and the proposal that they are putting forth for reconciliating uh, peace and, and injustice and peace and truth. and. Um, this discussion on whether there is a trade-off or rather there, 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 there is not possible to have a trade-off anymore because of the international commitments. And when I read the ICG report, I found that so the proposal is basically, you know, kind of go through the most difficult cases first and then uh, find alternative justice measures for the other cases. But the point that um, Diego also made this morning, it's very important. And, and is uh, how do we know what are the most difficult offenses or how we go about it. So I think what ca keeps popping up in my mind is we know that there is a broader range of justice measures, not only going actually through courts, and I think that that's something that will open up possibilities in Colombia. But at the same time, I think that there, there still will be a tension in the fact that probably if we follow the proposal of the International Crisis Group, the, the people that are engaged in the most serious crimes are also the ones that are more likely to want to be out of them because they are the negotiators. And in a hierarchical group like the FARC, those that are probably engaged in the most serious crimes and have the most responsibility are also the ones that are crucial in the negotiation. So the tension is still there. And, um, and I think that's probably going to be the, the other aspect that, um, that probably we will need to think about. And I definitely like the proposal of the, of the crisis group of like, we can think about this in a different way. The trade-off is not going to courts or no justice at all, but still there is a tension in terms of who, who is, who is in, the in the negotiation, who's going to be key in the negotiation, and what are the crimes that they have been engaged with. And I think that's probably where the most difficult tension will be. I think one of the uh, big lessons of these uh, two days of discussions is like the, to my perspective, overwhelming this uh, overwhelming variety or plurality and complexity of the problem. We have a, one single table, peace talks, and there are like so many actors involved as participants of violence, coexisting, overlapping interests, a variety of victims observed unobserved, neglected, proactive. Uh, as, and, and, and to add for variety, one of the key elements of the discussion has been that uh, the most effective uh, solutions have to come from the local level. Uh, so how do you put all those things together to really analyze, OK, across the different actors, the different victims, the different situations, the different regions and contexts, and, and the different solutions at the local level. So what are the key elements that should be driving get the guidelines to provide some effective solutions out of this? Uh, I don't know if that has to come top down as maybe one of these recommendations or something that eventually is going to emerge bottom up after the application of some successful or failed efforts of uh, peace building at the very local level with local actors, both as perpetrators, and victims. So I think that's going to be one of the big lessons uh, in the Mexican case to learn of what happens in Colombia and eventually try to export some of these uh, uh, events. Okay. Other comments? Santiago? Um, I, I think I'll be sort of, I'm not sure if I'm, I'll be giving a conclusion or jumping into your next uh, provocation, <laughs> I could kind of in between there. Because I'm thinking of um, what was kind of in all the, present in all the conference, what, but what wasn't really uh, up, uh, addressed directly, and I, I don't know if it has been ever addressed, is wh what is the connection between this um, incredibly resilient 
uh, political culture of delfinismo in Colombia, um, in which you have sort of, um, it doesn't matter of, it, 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 I'm not talking here about the families, but I'm talking about, you know, it's, it's pre probably pretty likely that the sons of Uribe and the sons of Gaviria and the so will be the next presidents and so forth and so forth. And it's a, an incredibly resilient um, culture, political culture. And I'm wondering, what is the connection between the resiliency of that political culture with the fact of the country being unable at, at, the, at, at this high political levels of truly addressing the roots of conflict? Because I'm, I'm sure there is a lot of uh, weed to cut there. Uh, yeah, of course, it's, uh, it's all about the inclusion and all that, but w what does this have to do with not addressing the, roots ca the root causes of, of conflict? What does this have to do with truly not allowing um, authentic actors of change to access very high political office? Um, and th this, I think, could be, could be very interesting to to explore, um, yeah. I'm gonna throw out just a couple of ideas. Um, in one of the things that really struck me uh, is that so much of the press, we, and we haven't, it's another area we haven't talked about the press, but one of the things that strikes me is that so much of the coverage of the peace talks has to do with the timing. Are we going to be able to come up with an accord by November before the presidential candidacy needs to be announced, or aren't we? When are we going to get the next agreement? And I, I have sat here listening to the, the wide variety of perspectives on each of these issues, and we've only looked at three of the ones that are on the agenda. There are six issues on the agenda. And I think any one of them we could have spent weeks talking about. They're very complicated. They, they vary from place to place. There are many perspectives depending on who's doing the analysis. Um, and there's a need to really grapple with the, the very complex realities implicit in each one of those topics. And add to that the fact that you have people at the table who represent the elites who have excluded and have contributed to the exclusionary nature of Col Colombian politics, not individually, I'm not casting aspersions on any, any one of the people at the table, but the way that politics works is you try to pick the people who have the power to be at the table. And the people who have the power are the people who have been, um, in, I mean, they, they're the people who have power. And so the people who don't have power are not represented at the table. And so it reflects the nature of the problem that started, and I think that's why you don't have women, you don't have indigenous, you don't have victims, you don't have Afros, you don't have peasants, you don't have youth. I mean, you have so many sectors of the society that are not represented at the table. Um, and I would, I would add that it's not just within government and at the table, but in civil society itself. I mean, those same exclusions are found within civil society organizations. So civil society organizations that are trying to be heard, well, the women's voices are often excluded from those. The, the same groups that have been marginalized all along are also excluded in civil society forums. Um, so you have a very deep problem of pra cultural practice, I think, um, that has to be disrupted. And then add to that the question of timing. And I think, you know, I, I hear on the Afro-Colombian front that, well, you know, there are many different perspectives within the Afro-Colombian movements that exist in Colombia. And they need to have time and space to develop their own analysis and their own proposals. Uh, within the women's movement, you have the same thing. And they're doing it. And I think the peace process actually has been a wonderful catalyst for civil society to get itself together and try to think about what they think about these things. And I think there hasn't been the political space to do that for a very long time. And in fact, I think that talking about peace was criminalized for a very long time so that people really suffered the consequence of being accused of being a guerrilla sympathizer or um, you know, the stigmatization that comes with advocating for a negotiated settlement when the tide of national sentiment was in favor of a military victory. I mean, that I think what we've seen is the shift 
that allows people to begin to think about a negotiated settlement. Um, and this is a fairly new, <laughs> new moment, and it takes time for people to grapple with that. I think Colombians still have not fully grappled with Caguan. Um, Caguan was an experience of negotiating that left many people frustrated. And I think that the government has learned many, less learned many lessons from that that kind of set the tone for the new, the new talks um, that are going on now. But I think civil society has not really grappled with what that means. And I think there's a distrust. There's a distrust of what's happening behind closed doors in Havana. There's a disconnect between what's happening in Havana and the realities of war that people continue to live, the reality of threats that have heightened, I mean, the, the numbers of calls that I'm getting about friends of mine and people that I know and people that USIP is supporting who are under threat, under death threat, has skyrocketed. <laughs> I mean, it's really, you know, it's kind of this disconnect. You, you hope the peace process will go ahead. You do everything you can to support that process. But you're also aware of this kind of, um, you know, this need to somehow link what's happening in Havana to what's what people's lived experiences are. And I think we, we don't really see that. Um, so I guess the, the takeaway for me is kind of that exclusions permeate all institutions. Change has to be long term. And it will take a long time for that change to happen. So you have to be patient and keep chipping away with it, chipping away at it. Um, I think another thing that really struck me is just uh, the continuity and the persistence of the efforts of the Colombians to find new models. Um, to develop models for how to deal with conflict prevention, conflict, um, conflict analysis, conflict management, trying to resolve the conflict, whether it's through peace communities and um, zones of peace uh, or educational models of new, new ways of thinking about citizenship um, or indigenous communities coming together and trying to um, define conflict resolution models for land disputes. I mean, there's just so many, many ways that the Colombians have tried to take the hand that they're given and make things better. And there's so much that we, we are learning from them. Um, maybe we'll move, those are just a couple of my observations, but maybe we'll move now to thinking about, okay, well, what, what did we miss? In, I mean, it's just a day and a half. You can't touch everything. And there were a lot of things we couldn't touch. And many people who I wish had been here that weren't here that could have addressed uh, other issues. I think two of the ones that, uh, actually there are four, four that I, I come up with, but I'll, I'll let you all start. So, um, yes, uh, Michael. One of the agenda items on the, on the peace agenda in Havana, we was basically excluded from the discussion, which is political participation at the FARC. What is that going to look like? Uh, who's going to guarantee their security? And what kinds of political positions will they occupy? What kinds of um, political positions will they take on, on key issues of economic development in the country? I mean, there, there's no end to the conversations we could have about um, what that is likely to look like. Part, partly, we, didn't, <clears throat> we did a conference on, on land, agrarian, the agrarian agenda. Um, and we didn't know, you know, it's been five, five rounds on political participation and the timing of this, we kind of thought that political participation might have been finished by now. That was a maybe too optimistic assessment. Um, but I think it was also that we didn't really feel we had the people who had studied that issue that we could draw on. So that's, you know, it's an, a gap of, of an area where we hadn't been really investing in research. Um, although I think your research might uh, have lots to lots to add to that theme. So, other yes, Angelica. Well, I don't know to what extent we really miss it, and I. But one thing, one topic that I think came up tangentially, not a lot, but is how the broader. So I think we all acknowledge that President Santos has has meant and has made a difference in terms of. Um, how the, the, the fact that this peace process is happening by changing some of the discourses that were recurrent in the previous administration. But I think one question, especially that came out today as we were talking about victims and the issue that Diana put out about the broader development projects uh, the country has right now. And I think the broader, the broader development, development projects. Um, and I think that's a question that I think we need to think about a little bit more and is to what extent some of the issues that are being discussed within the peace process are 
probably at odds with some of the broader development uh, projects that the government has. Uh, some of the big, the mining projects, the agricultural projects, and I mean, to identify possible areas of tension in terms of uh, broader policies and the peace process. Like, to what extent the peace process is going along with other areas of policy making in the country, because in the long run that's going to make a difference. And I think that's something that we have to. I mean, is the peace process is taking place on one side, and it can be isolated of the other policies and the other issues that the government is pushing. And I think, I'm, I'm thinking mostly about the development projects and the large agricultural and mining projects and how those those can be related with the land issues and how, how can those affect uh, the process of restitution of land, the process of victims. Mm -hmm. Alex? A, a quick follow-up to this point. I mean. I understand the precondition for previous negotiations was like el modelo económico, as if you know that entire topic could be treated in negotiation. I think that's torpedoed past negotiations, and while it might have made the current negotiation a little bit more agile and, and feasible, um, I think the FARC, one way or the other, wants to drink, drag el modelo económico back into the negotiations. So I think that's a real structural problem in the negotiations, and, and I think the government only realized that in the moment of the, the rolling paros. Um, and I think that's going to continue to play out. But I, I wanted to pick up on, on one of the things you said, Jenny, about the media. A, a, and it's something I, I think a lot about. I, I didn't talk about it here. It tends to be an issue that's kind of conceived to be on the sidelines of the ne negotiations, though it was included as a sub-point on in partic um, political participation. And the way I think about it generally is, you know, if we take Clausewitz's dictum that war is politics through other means, and we think about politics in the contemporary age as, you know, utterly infused with media. You know, you, you can't think about politics without thinking about how you deal with the media. And you, you have to think about creating uh, political, you know, spaces for the FARC or people aligned with the FARC to have uh, a greater media reach. I think that that's kind of a logical thing to assume. And I think what you saw in the M19 negotiations was like they had a noticiero for a half, a half an hour. Right? There was some model about opening up media space. And I think that's a conversation that really needs to happen. As you, I mean, when you look at the ratings of RSN and Caracol, you're looking at, I mean, in one 2008 survey, you, respondents were saying 97 and 98% of the population had seen RSN or Caracol once in the last month. So I mean, you have really intense media concentration in the country and, and opening up kind of a more democratic space for media, I think is going to be very crucial. Ryan? Yeah, there are just a couple of things that, I kept, that have been on my mind as well in this process. And one is related to if a peace accord is signed, um, at least what keeps going through my mind is the possible effects of an increase in violence and at, at the community levels. So if you take away if we look at what happened previously, where the a lot of the top layer were the ones that demobilized initially, and then that led to what's now called the Bakrim, or all these other fractured groups start to develop, and which leads to disorganized violence, and which is what I had seen in in Swacha, where there was one group turned into ten within a matter of just a few months. So, what are the protective mechanisms that could be? Uh, discussed now in, in thinking about what may be the possible effects, including violence, of reaching a court, especially initially, which ties into the DDR process. What we didn't really get into in, the, in that process are the how it affects the children or, or under 18-year-olds, because they, they, they go through the Bienestar Familiar, the Children and Family Services, has one process established, however, at least previously, only about 30% of the children actually went through that process. And then the families of the actual combatants or the children 
the that process didn't go very well last time in terms of what do you do with a five-year-old seven-year-old that's the son or daughter of the combatants during this ddr process Um, not so much about uh, missing things as well about what uh, I'm, some topics I think they're uh, important to look at in the future. And that's all uh, that uh, work that has been done on um, participation, civil society organizations that participate, women's organizations, agrarian organizations. And there's a lot of work done. We don't know the results. They are still going uh, straight to the, the, the conversation table. Uh, but I think in the future it's very important to look at them and to look at them in as a way of um, how to connect um, the peace process to um, what may be a kind of shopping list of so of all the social issues involved and uh, um, experienced by by uh, the people who were in this uh, in these different uh, uh, forums participating and um, i'm using the word of, of shopping list because this is probably what is uh, the first outcome but then the, of course there will be uh, a need for structuring all these um, demands and all these claims that will come out and i think this is a, an important um, area of um, linking not only broad, broad development questions but also just the, 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 the living experiences and demands that live amongst the population at the local level okay i'll throw mine out then um you know, I, I was actually very surprised that I don't think we heard one word about the role of the church in any of the discussion about reconciliation in particular, which I think is the area where the church has actually the capacity, or churches, I should say, because not just the Catholic church, but the Protestant, evangelical Protestant churches have been very active in shaping uh, the debates around reconciliation, the debates around uh, a just peace. I think, I think the, the notion of, of justice being part of the peace package um, is, um, is, is part of the kind of the, the theological um, imperative of peace being the fruit of justice. And so not to have it mentioned at all appeared to me somewhat of an oversight. Maybe it's the eight minutes that we gave you, and I'm sorry for that. Um, but I do, I do think it's something to keep in mind that when you talk about local infrastructure, probably the one institution in Colombia that has that local infrastructure would be the church and maybe the schools. Um, but, but that's a very important resource to keep present uh, when we're thinking about what the resources are for peace building. Um, we heard very little about the private sector and particularly in relation to DDR. I think that's a set of institutions um, and capacities that need to be brought to the table and that, that needs to be factored in as well. The question of the press. I mean, the press not only as uh, having the capacity to give political space to um, demobilizing ex-combatants and kind of progressive sectors, but the press's role, I think, in fanning some of the skepticism about the peace process and its role during the, uh, during the conflict in creating stigmatized images of who is a terrorist and what does it mean to be a terrorist. Um, and I think also the kind of, um, you know, the, the nature, of the institutional constraints of the media, which really requires finding things that happen. So, so the whole search for, for action, for agreements, for something that can be reported on at the peace table, I think often supersedes the, the uh, kind of deep thinking about what are the real issues that are at stake here and why is, it, why is it taking so long? I mean, what is at stake? There are reasons that it's not easy to come to a peace agreement. Um, but I don't think that the press has really 
had the liberty maybe within their institutional constraints to focus on these deeper issues because they're concerned about, you know, okay, what round is it? I mean, I do the same thing in my blog, you know, it's round 14 and what's been accomplished and try to, try to assess where have we come in the last 10 days. Um, but these are very short time frames to come up with results and I think that we kind of get into a bit of a trap when you try to write about it. Um, because you want to see some change and you, you need to see some change. I think psychologically everybody needs to see something happening. Um, so I think the role of the press in all of these. The question of extractive industries we haven't really talked about, but if we're thinking about, I mean, it's been alluded to, I think, in a number of the, a number of the, um, the presentations, but I think if we're talking about uh, a lasting peace, we have a peace table that has agreed upon an agenda that's a manageable agenda, and I think that's important. I think that's one of the one of the reasons that I have a lot of hope is that be, that they have defined it in such a way that they can come to some sort of agreement. I believe, um, but that means putting aside a number of issues that are still going to be issues of conflict, um, and so trying to kind of anticipate and prepare for those issues at the same time I think is important. The question that Andres raised about the need, and I think others have raised it as well, um, Brett most recently, about the need to create structures for conflict resolution at the local level I think is very important. Uh, one of the projects that USIP has been um, supporting, and I have a whole a whole spiel on all the things that we're supporting in Colombia that are that are some really interesting work, but I'll just mention briefly this one. Uh, we've been supporting uh, in, intra and intersectorial dialogues with the um, the mining energy sector, um, and these are dialogues that are taking place within the empresas, the mining energy, in, and all in Arauca. Uh, within the mining energy kind of business sector, uh, within communities and within local government authorities. There's a, a kind of three-track process going on to get each of them to think about the kind of convergence of peace, reconciliation, and development models. Um, and then the idea is to create these kind of mechanisms for discussion among each of those sectors and then bring them all together at the end to talk to each other. Um, it's a long-term process. It's not a fast process. It's in its early stages, but it is something that we're hoping we can um, see if there's some sort of model that might be usable in other communities because if you look at the map of Latin America, conflict over resources is skyrocketing and it's likely to be with us for a while. So trying to figure out what these dialogue processes are about and how to engage in facilitated dialogues that allow people to come to the table and to try to understand the other's perspective, um, with the, come to the table with the idea that the purpose is to understand the other's perspective and then see where you get with that. I think it's a, it's a very, it's an interesting process and we'll see where it leads, um, but it's, it's one of the things going on. Um, I think the last thing, we haven't really focused specifically on U.S. policy, although certainly there are policy implications in every panel that we heard, um, and I think we don't really have time to, to delve into it. Um, I think the issue of the delisting is a really key issue that has, is just beginning to come up onto the, onto the agenda in Washington. Maybe it hasn't come to the agenda in Washington, but we'll, we'll try to create a space for it because I think there's, with all of these things, there's really a need to create a public that understands and supports the need to move forward in the peace process and toward reconciliation. Um, so these conversations hopefully can contribute to socializando el ambiente, you know, creating this kind of context where people um, can dialogue about issues that they might disagree with um, or might have differences over. Um, and I would just, you know, finally, I think, close, <laughs> because it's been a long two days, but I would just close saying it really is very gratifying um, to look around and, and see the really deep commitment of the people that we have invested in. Um, it gives me great hope and I'm delighted that you're here, and I hope that we can somehow contribute to creating a network of people who can support each other in this kind of path forward to a peaceful Colombia. And I thank you all very much for your work and for coming.
if if I may make one one, I, I'm always accustomed to having the last word. Okay, so I I would like to thank uh, uh, Jenny and and Lily, and uh, and Kelly. Okay, for the enormous efforts that you made to uh, make this what I think is an outstanding success. I think all of us uh, uh, feel that way, and. Um, and also out to USIP. Uh, and these are uh, economically hard times. Uh, and I know that uh, USIP probably has not really focused on Latin America very much to the extent that it has. It's probably been mostly Colombia. Mm, maybe that's not true, but uh, Colombia has been a, uh, a major focus. And I think, uh, Jenny, you're responsible for that. And I would hope that somebody at USIP, and I, the bodies who might be able to um, move this are not here, I'm sure, but uh, um, that they might give some thought to using USIP, which is a government semi-autonomous, uh, I'm not sure what that means, but 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 there is some there, there's some relationship with the government from what I understand, okay, <laughs> and, uh, that might use the institute uh, to do some some really good things that would be I think in the long term interests of uh, of of this country. So thanks again to everybody, and it's been a pleasure meeting a lot of new people. Uh, for me, uh, some people I haven't seen in years. Um, and um, so let's hope that we can repeat it uh, sometime not too far off. Okay? Thanks.